Okay, on the record, can I start in two minutes? Okay, so let me put my slides in the chat. My slides. Oh, hi, Ines. Loved your hi. paper. Oh, hi. Hi. Glad to meet you guys. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you have written me an email today about some 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 talk. Yes, I, I didn't understood. No, it's it's a couple of um, colleagues um, that wanted to join. They may be joining uh, sure, sure. at some point. So if they had the time, they would discuss some uh, a paper that they that it's been just uh, released in Senodo. It's called the origin of mass and. Oh, nice. It talks about the backing fluctuations and how they could be organized in a certain way to have uh, the yeah, emergence yeah, yeah, of mass. Yeah. But maybe for yeah. another opportunity, for another meeting, we could uh, have. So I think I, I, should, I should start start now. Uh, so to, as 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 written, yes. So okay. Um, uh, can you can you see my my slides? Uh, yeah, so so you can see the first slide. Okay, let me try the full screen. Okay, so it, it, you you see everything uh, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let me start. Okay, hello, welcome to, to to our conference. So it's very nice that, that there is so many so many people interested in this topic. So which which looks controversial. So one side there is there is exper experimental confirmation by Guarane, there is experimental confirmation by by um, uh, simulation of the Dirac equation. It is required by by relativistic quantum mechanics like uh, Dirac, but also Klein Gordon. So let's let's um, so I I will start with m m my view. So so here is the model I'm I'm developing for like fifteen years, two thousand starting two thousand nine. So it it based on on a, the Faber's oh. approach. Uh, so uh, so so the, the the first the first step is that uh, it's repairing of electromagnetic. So we start with classic electromagnetic. So before the second quantization, uh, the, 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 we would like to to repair two problems of of of. Um, of uh, of uh, electromagnetic, so one is that uh, that the Gauss law in electromagnetics can give a, a real, real charge. What nature should be should be integer, yes, the charge quantization. And the problem, the second problem is that the Gauss law uh, leads to infinite energy of, of the electric field. So so we need to re regularize this problem, yes. So so here is here is a simple simple way to to repair repair both uh, as in uh, Matthew Faber Faber's way. So 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 we we look at the Gauss law. And and there is the topological version of this Gauss law. It's called Gauss Bonnet theorem. That that integrating curvature of of some deeper field, let's say of field of unitary vectors n, for example, popular in liquid crystals. I I will focus on. Uh, then then we get we get also ch charge, but topological charge, which has to be quantized. So it, it's kind of winding number of the sphere over sphere. So, so, so we'd like to interpret this topological Gauss, Gauss law as the real Gauss law. So for this purpose, we need to uh, interpret this curvature of this deeper field as our electric field. This way, we get built-in charge quantization inside the Gauss law. So, so, so here is the simplest um, topological charge plus one. Uh, it, it, we can see that, that there is also repaired the second problem, that, that it's infinite energy. So the, using only the field of unitary vectors, we would have infinite, ener infinite energy in, in the center. But what we can see that the, that the, the field the deforms to, to make uh, zero vectors in the centers. So, so, so um, effects of that, we can avoid this infinite, infinite, infinite energy singularity by having this Higgs-like potential that, that the field prefers unitary vectors. However, it can allow to deform these, these, these vectors to, let's say, to zero vectors uh, to avoid this, this singularity, to, to, fi to finally to, to integrate to finite uh, energy to be 511 kF for, for, for electron. Uh, and, and so here is plus one uh, topological charge, and here is uh, minus, minus one half. So topological charge is that going around, you calculate how many times the field rotates. So here it rotates plus one time, here rotates minus one half time. So, so we can also get the uh, one half charge uh, here because of using field that this and this is the same. 
rotating this ellipse, ellipse bar by pi, you get the same ellipse. Yeah. So, so using symmetric field, you can get also one half, one half equal spin. And this is well known for for topological uh, for topological charges in liquid crystals. So 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 here this way we get the, to the simple model of, of of electron as this three dimensional uh, Hedgehog. Uh, this is plus one charge it can be minus one charge. So so the next step um, I perform. Okay, so this is this is kind of model of of Matthew Faber uh, this way. Uh, the next next step I do the question is how to get the the, the, the quantum phase how to get the three leptons. And the, the, the trick is to, to say that this is not just field of entire vectors, but field of three three uh, orthogonal um, axes. Yes, yeah? so, so we have three axes now of this ellipse ellipsoid. So, so this long axis and two, two uh, second axis and the third axis. So we have three different axes in, in every, posi every position. And now, uh, so now we can, for example, have the Hedgehog, the topological charge, electric charge in three ways. So, so asymptotically it's the same electric charge, but different realizations of different mass. So this is kind of three, three leptons because of living in the three dimensional space. And also uh, we can see that, that, that per looking at this Hedgehog, looking at the second axis, we cannot uh, continuously align it on, on the sphere because of this, uh, this Hayley Bohr theorem. So there is additional um, magnetic dipole like, like uh, singularity here. So there is no, there are no naked charges. They need to have also magnetic dipole moment here because of this, this conflict. Uh, also the, the twist uh, is interpreted as, as quantum phase. And it will have lower energy contributions, as as in as in the QQD equation. Yeah. So there, there is also there is both electromagnetic here, and there is also low energy contribution of the to, to energy of of phase. So so it also has it is low energy uh, degree of freedom of vacuum the the, the the quantum phase. So so this twist literally acts as the quantum phase, and this way it. We get unification of both electromagnetics and the quantum phase into into one 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 um, uh, theory. Then going to to four dimensions, uh, we can we can imagine that it's also fourth axis in in, in zero 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 axis at the time. Yes, yeah? so so uh, you can you can choose the parameters that it has the strongest tendency to align in one direction. Th this way, it's tiny perturbations. Now it should be boost if you're using SO13 uh, the group. It's tiny, tiny perturbations. We lead to second set of Maxwell equations, exactly uh, as in gravity of magnetic approximation of, of general relati relativity, and it did gets nice, nice um, uh, integration with the unification electromagnetics, quantum mechanics, and, and gravity by just interpreting this uh, vacuum as as uh, as uh, tilts as as lead to electromagnetics, twist leads leads to uh, quantum quantum phase, lower low energy, and the and the boost of the longest axis to to the gravity, unifying them using this kind of uh, Hamiltonian. And um, I, I thought I, in the moment I will tell more, more about it. Okay, so let's let's go to, to 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 our main hero of today. Yes, the the the, the electron. So. Why people naively think about it as a perfect point charge, it is much more. Yeah, so so being perfect point charge, it, it has electric field uh, singular, ideally singular electric field, but we have we can regularize it and we do it here. Uh, this regularization will lead to running capping uh, deformation of uh, Coulomb interaction in very very low distances. But it's more. It is also a tiny magnet. It is magnetic magnetic dipole moment, and it is also a tiny gy gyroscope. It, it has this angular momentum. And more, and, and our um, uh, the, the boy clock we will focus on. The question is how to combine uh, all these properties into one one uh, object, one configuration of field. Yes, that, that, that's the big question of uh, we have and we would like to, to discuss today. So so here is here is a way. So so we have the Hedgehog as the topological charge, uh, selective charge. It will lead to Coulomb interaction indeed. But this Hedgehog is has also this also this phase, and this phase should should uh, con continuously rotate. 10 to 21st hertz as 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 the break clock. I will, I will mention the mechanism why I believe it comes from. So 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 this way the electron is is this kind of Hedgehog, which it doesn't rotate itself, but but only its field continuously rotate 10 to 21st hertz as as required. Um, I mentioned about so so this way having this rotation it will both leads to angular momentum. This rotation from the the break clock angular momentum and it also is required to get the magnetic dipole moment. So, so the angular momentum and the magnetic dipole moment. So this way we, we can unify all the proper necessary properties of, of electron into one 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 object, topological object. 
OK, so it's a, a, bit, a bit of mathematics. So, so, so here is the Lagrange that I'm, I'm using. Uh, the main, I, I, I believe so. I, I hope, hope it is sufficient, but uh, I'm working on it for a few months now. So, so we can see that standard electromagnetic is Lagrangian, but, but a bit larger. So, so, um, the, 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 so, so the trick is to, to interpret this, um, to get Gauss law as, as the topological Gauss bonnet theorem, we interpret uh, curvature as, as electromagnetic field. Yes, so so uh, so um, you have F mini. So this, this is the curvature, but the curvature weighted with the shape shape of the of our our ellipsoids. And this shape contains uh, the h bar, the Planck's constant for the for the low energy twist, and the g g constant for the gravity. So so this is curvature, but but also integrating um, integrating uh, unifying all, all the electromagnetic quantum mechanics and, and gravity in, into one one curvature. This way we extend electromagnetics adding adding to adding to quantum mechanics and gravity into, into one into one electromagnetic like Lagrangian. Um, and and we also need this heat flux potential which prefers some shape of our, our ellipse, ellipsoids. It it will be only um, activated uh, close to singularities in the centers of, of, of church, for example. So here is here is this, this unification. So so we, we use electromagnetic field usually, but we assume that uh, that there is a deeper A field. And here we say that there is even deeper field. And and and, and so so here is here is this deeper field. So here is this uh, long axis, and its tilts uh, of the long axis le leads to the, the electromagnetics and its twist. Leads to leads to at the quantum phase, and and this way we we interpreting behavior dynamics of this field as electromagnetic field. We get this this unification. So here is this F mini calcul calculated uh, for 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 this this kind of uh, shape with this G, and and we, we can see that so so having electromagnetics only, we would have only this. This 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 curvature. So here is this main curvature for the for this this Hedgehog. But here we have also other contributions. So we have also this tiny tiny contribution corresponding to the quantum quantum phase, this H bar related, but also then to, to the gravity. So so this way we unify all the three. And there are also so what is interesting that, that using this this Lagrangian uh, as F mini is full, full, full curvatures. So some standard Lagrangian of electromagnetic field has two, two, two indexes. Here we have four because the full curvature has four indexes. Yeah. So so going from this Lagrangian to Hamiltonian, there's on that 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 there, there usually the electromagnetic will have only positive positive contributions. An F square uh, electric field square plus 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 B square. Yes, E square plus plus B square. Here you have also some subtle negative contributions with this full four index uh, curvature, and so so these are the, the negative um, terms. It's very difficult to activate them. So usually when you activate them, you also have larger positive contrib energy contributions. But 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 sometimes uh, the most crucial is, are these terms. So so gamma gamma nu one is exactly this twisting. Is this speed of this twisting we require for the for the Zierbewegung for for clock and and till that means that it's corresponding to to, to gravitational field. That means that in gravitational field, for example, caused by by the by the particle itself, there is some preference of, of this twisting. So so I don't have the details yet, but but this is this is promising to have the propulsion mechanism that 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 so so once again so the, the full Lagrangian for electromagnetics we built in charge quantization. Uh, uses curvature inside and full curvature has first indexes and going to Hamiltonian to energy density, there remain some negative energy terms and these negative energy terms make it preferred to, close to the gravity in gravitational field to have this constant twist. So, so that's the hope to, to get the, 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 the proportional mechanism for the clock. So in, in, the, in the time crystals that they are looking for a process which in the lowest energy state have periodic process, periodic oscillations but you, so you have a, a pendulum in the lowest energy st state it, it, it doesn't have the periodic yes it stops so the question is how to make that electron doesn't stop in the lowest lowest energy case and i don't and they search for it but they uh, they fail and this is a, this is a, a way i to get it that there are some subtle contributions in the hamiltonian which can make it energetically preferable to continue the, the twisting in the lowest energy state Okay, so uh, so the the, uh, the closest in the experimental side are, are the liquid crystals for which they, they indeed so uh, get a lot of long range interaction. So they they build this uh, they have these particles which have which is this unitary vector field 
uh, and 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 uh, they can form this plus one topological charge minus one topological charge. They they can look look at this their position versus time, and they get some 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 interaction. And then they look at this is like Coulomb Planck interaction and so on. So so they experimentally get long range interactions for quantized topological charges. Yes, yeah? so, so so a lot of particle physics uh, here. Also in in hydrodynamics, you probably well know there is this mathematical similarity, especially using superfluid with no viscosity. But mathematically, it's nearly the same. So, so so indeed we should be able to, to find a lot of a lot of uh, electromagnetic fundamental physics in in hydrodynamics like uh, analogs. Uh, we, we we well know from from uh, Don Bush and, and others uh, experiments from Kuder Kuder approach. Okay, so so about uh, short interaction introduction for the topological charges. So so in, in two dim two dimension uh, topological char charges, this winding number. We take a look at a loop around and look how many times the, the field rotates during uh, going along this this loop. Yeah. So here is plus one. This is minus one. This is also plus one. The difference is the change of phase. So so the gauge invariance. We can rotate all the fields by the same the same angle. Here is plus two, but you have also mentioned also plus one half and minus one half. But going around, we get only only half rotation, going back to the same field because this ellipsoid and this ellipsoid is the same ellipsoid. And in liquid field science, they they observe this kind of configurations because of, of using symmetric symmetric molecules. The, this part, this molecule, and this molecule is practically the same. Yes, so we can get one half. So so why this two dimensional spin charge corresponds to the to the spin? So one is because we get one half easily, and it's very natural observing liquid crystals. Another is that there is this quantum rotation operator saying that spin s particle rotates rotated by theta angle. Then the phase rotates by theta times spin. And this uh, this definition is exactly what we see here. That rotating the the, the entire uh, the entire um, diagram by by some angle, the the phase rotates by this theta times the, the spin of this diagram. So so indeed these two dimensional uh, topological defects agree well with 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 spin what what we use. And I have some remark about the g factor because the g factor is quite quite complicated. It, it relates to three three three. Three properties. So one is one is spin. Uh, second is angular momentum. Third is magnetic dipole moment. So so one. So the G factor tries to relate all of them. So so here uh, it's only the structural structural spin. Here is also only the structural one half here. Like, yes, and and uh, on this structural there is also dynamics that, that the field could, should continuously rotate, like in the the plot plot, plot uh, at the bottom that, that the field continuously rotate. And, and from this rotation co comes both angular momentum and magnetic dipole moment. So 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 uh, so we, we should have they should be closely magnetic dipole moment and angular momentum should be closely related. But using wanting to use the spin, which is one half, it's only structural. It doesn't doesn't contribute to this 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 dependence between the uh, rotations in magnetic dipole moments and angular momentum. So so it should be g times one half should be approx approximately one. So 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 it's quite very natural that for leptons uh, we should have approximately to uh, G, G, G factor. So here are two dimensional topological defects and for the for three dimensional we, we need we need now now we have this electric charge uh, like like defects like, like the Hedgehog in three dimensions. So then we get this Coulomb like interaction, long interactions. And then we, we have clock as the evolution of the of the phase that that the that the absolute that the that the, we can could rotate all the phases by this by the same angle and we get the, the same the same charges still, yes. So, so we have this this evolution, it's allowed and it should be somehow proper. The question is how it's proper, yes. Okay, so so here, here is the here is then the Coulomb interaction. So we have the, the curvature, so here is electromagnetics, the, the Gauss bonnet, bonnet theorem very similar, and interpreting the, the curvature. So here is the, the, the Christopher, the connection, here is the curvature, here is the Lagrangian, instead of F mini using R curvature with two indexes, the full should use four indexes. Uh, so here, here Mahdi Faber it creates electromagnetics, and, and I used four indexes to also unify with quantum mechanics and, and, and gravity. Okay, so th there are very similar, not related uh, screen models, popular, uh, more main, main, uh, mainstream. But they, there are some differences. They use uh, trivial vacuum, so they have only shortage interaction. I, we get sh longer interaction, li li like Coulomb, but maybe let me skip it. So here, here are some, uh, like, what they use in, in, in uh, liquid crystals, the Austin-Frank model, 
the land of the Jean. So, so Mantis Faber is kind of is only Frank, and I'm, go I'm going to this land of the Jean to use this field of three three different axes as as the molecules of having three different axes without full symmetry. But I need to modify uh, the, the kinetic term to this electromagnetic like this F mini F mini finally full four indexes. Okay, so here is the, the derivation of Coulomb interaction. Uh, so, so we, we we take a configuration of two topological charges. Here is here are opposite charges. Here are the same charges in in various distance. So, so it, it, to make it right, it should be should be some optimization of the configuration. But here I use the, the ansatz Faber ansatz, and and then I, I integrate the energy density, the Hamiltonian. Uh, the, the curvature square, so how curvature square Hamiltonian, and then by this integration I get the Coulomb Coulomb effective potential. So, so in, trying to approximate these two particles with as as two uh, as um, so that configuration as that just positions and distance, then then effectively I need to use Coulomb 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 uh, potential. So I, effectively it leads to approximate Coulomb interaction between between these particles with quantized charges. However, um, so in the centers I mentioned, uh, there is there is this problem. In the centers that we have infinite energy, so we need to use uh, up what is not included. Here is half cut off. Finally, it should be added to the heat light potential. So Matthew Faber has done it right and turned out that here is the the, the, the Coulomb interaction. Uh, the Coulomb potential is the blue line, and and the red points are the are the numerical values he get in, in this article. Uh, it should be here, I think. Uh, so, so there is some slight, very slight um, deformation of Coulomb interaction in very low, low, low distances. And it turns out in, in, in this paper, um, uh, he convinces that that this tiny de deformation corresponds to the running coupling deformations. That, that for very high, very high energy, like um, very, very high energy uh, scattering, uh, the, the, there is the deformed alpha is a bit slightly larger. So the Coulomb interaction is slightly, slightly stronger for very, very high energy, very short distances. And indeed, we get it from from this um, regularization, from deformation of the field to finite energy, to, to not not to exceed um, five eleven mass of electron with the energy of the electric field alone. Okay, so so here are some some experiments of the point part point electron. So so very 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 brief. So so why people believe that that electron is perfect point? Uh, mainly because quantum field theory cannot we don't have quantum field theory for for the not point yes yeah? so, so that the main the smart mathematical problem with using not points but there are some arguments experimental arguments so there, there is an original Dermot argument that used the g factor but it's completely nonsense he, he, he has drawn two points and try to try to uh, draw a line through two points and got get negative uh, radius for electron so he then he get extrapolated with parabola from two points so if you look at this this argument, it's complete complete nonsense. Maybe better uh, argument is looking at the at the um, uh, electron positron scattering. So if you're looking for very high energy, so these gaps, so very high energy, we, we see that there is some, there is some nearly linear behavior in local lo plot plus some resonances. But we are interested in the size of the uh, resting electron. So if if extrapolating this this line to to two mass of electron plus positron, then we get approximately two femtometers. This is the radius we need to deform not to exceed 511 keV with electric field alone. So, so everything agrees that that it's not perfect point, not, not perfect point charge, but but it's deformed in, in femtometer distance not to exceed mass of electron with, with energy of electric field alone. So now we have we have the the Kuder, uh, the, the Don Bush experiments uh, with high dynamics recreating half of uh, quantum mechanics. So we see, we see more more today. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so so now now this electron. So so we cannot having this Hedgehog. We cannot we cannot align uh, align. Uh, so we need this additional um, magnetic dipole like like uh, defects. So so there are no naked charges. We need also they also need magnetic dipole moment. Uh, maybe let me let me very briefly talk about some further uh, particles. Uh, so, so for neutrinos, there are three times uh, as as the simplest uh, this fraxon that that in in the cross section we have we have this this topological charge. So we get three types of them. They are very stable, very light. Uh, we can, they can oscillate, rotate between between uh, continuously rotate between the structures. Uh, <clears throat> so so there, there are oscillations allowed. 
the much more interesting are, are the barriers that, that having these these uh, these uh, vortices vortex like structures we can just have the, the simplest knot and if you're looking at this knot this cross section you can see that the central knot and the, the knot around the knot not around um, the the vortex around uh, deforms the the feed structure of the central knot it, it enforces it to hedge like yes the, the external vortex enforces hedge like behavior in the center and hedge is positive charge so this way we can see that baryon itself uh, enforces some electric charge, positive electric charge here. And so proton can just enclose this Hedgehog, this electric charge, and neutron has to compensate it. So here is some pro plus, minus, minus. So, so for neutron, we get we get positive core, negative shell. And this is well known from experiment that, 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 that looking at charge distribution, what is the, the safest experimental um, the information about, about uh, pro baryons, it's that neutron has positive core and negative shell. This is exactly what is predicted by the model, that the dispo this positive core is, is enforced by the structure, by this, this loop around, and negative shell you know, has to, to compensate it to, 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 to zero, zero charge. So, so there is also confinement. Uh, so, so finally, we have this gas, gas law. It cannot be far, far apart, but, but in low distances, we can deform it into, into some, some smaller, smaller charges, only to, to some into integer, number, in, in, integer charge. Yes, so so it, it it can explain why neutron is heavier because this compensation is costly. We need to deform in, in this range, uh, and in, in proton can close. So the, we can explain why proton is heavier. We can also we can also get uh, the binding binding for for detail because two two baryons would like to share one charge instead of having two charges, and it, it has plus minus plus this electric quadrupole moment, and it is well known that deuteron has electric quadrupole moment. It's plus minus plus. Also, uh, and it's how to get plus minus plus with proton and neutron. You cannot do it, but but if you think about this charge distribution, indeed, it, it automatically predicts this like quadrupole moment for 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 that term. Okay, so so maybe after, let me skip it. Um, okay, so maybe okay, let me let me let me go to the the end. So some calculations which are quite complicated, and and what what per, 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 so so let me go back to this uh, this Lagrangian I have mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so. <clears throat> So here is the Lagrangian, and now now I'm going to the, to the Hamiltonian. Yes, yeah, so 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 in electromagnetism you have just F mini F mini going to from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian you get B square plus E square. It's positive always. Yes, but having four indexes, I, I need for having so F is for me is, is curvature. So so simplified curvature are two indexes, but the full curvature are four indexes. But going from a full full for for full. full uh, for index for index Lagrangian to uh, to Hamiltonian, it gets also negative contributions. So so most are positive, like 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 previously, but there are also some 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 very subtle negative. Uh, I've mentioned that that these are literally these 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 uh, these these three these three terms from interaction between electromagnetic and gravity. So so literally this has uh, negative energy contribution. So so increasing this value. You, you usually always uh, also increase the, the the positive contribution, but but in some subtle situation you can only reduce the energy by increasing the, the rotation. So so that, that's the hope for the propulsion mechanism for 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 the electron clock. Uh, but but the details are yet to be found, which are quite complicated, as you can think. So I'm I'm open if if it's there is. Yeah, and it's, that's the final. So I, I, that's that. That's I hope that the, the sufficient Lagrangian to to reduce this huge uh, standard model Lagrangian. So I hope the, that the effective description of this uh, this Lagrangian will have will, will be something like Taylor expansion it should be close to this 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 full full standard, standard model Lagrangian, also including gravity as the gravitational electromagnetic <laughs> approximation. Okay, so so thank you. So the three minutes. Has, so let me let me let me end now. Are there any short questions, comments? We have three, three minutes. So please unmute and 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 ask if you have. Yeah, right. Sure. Uh, Hi. Yes. Uh, does your model predict the mass for the for the neutrino? Or massless neutrino. Ma ma massive, 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 and not 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 Majorana. Neutrino and neutrino are slightly different. And massive, the mass is the uh, integration of the Hamiltonian over the configuration. So so the, 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 they have some small mass, but that is too far for me to, to calculate it in now. So, so so you don't have any prediction for the neutrino mass. 
So no, no. So it's, it's very difficult to, to get to get the details now. But but um, so there is the problem with the oscillation. So so how can we get the oscillation between the three neutrinos? So 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 here here is here you have different um, mass density per, per length. So so the three have the different mass per density per length. So so they can oscillate between these these different uh, shapes, but by but changing the, the the length of the of the of the loop. This way they can maintain the, the mass. Uh, so, so I couldn't understand how you can oscillate between different types of neutrinos having different mass. And here you can do it because because it is not not fixed mass. It, it depends on the length of of, of the of the of this loop. And uh, during the oscillation, you can increase or, or decrease the, the length of the loop. So, so here the it's not not well defined the mass of the neutrino. I think it, it maybe it is initial difficulty why you cannot find the mass of the neutrino because maybe it's not not fixed. Maybe it, there is some some variation depending on the length of length of this loop. Okay, thank you. Uh, very short question, or I'm stopping. Okay, so let me stop, and the next person can share. And the next person is uh, Alvaro. Is there Alvaro? Uh, Alvaro, I don't see Alvaro. Uh, so I don't see Alvaro. So maybe the next person could uh, could could start, and I I can try to contact Alvaro. Maybe he has forgotten, but, or he has yesterday he asked me about the, the the time. So the next person would be uh, Mark. Uh, could you could you start earlier, Mark? Oh, thanks. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So I, I, you are muted. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, you can stop. And you can see my screen, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> after the very fancy mathematical presentation, I'm going to focus on very trivial um, three-year-old models of really what the atom of Bohr uh, could be. And uh, when I asked the AI to represent a charge spinning around a mass, spinning around a core, I got, you know, as above, so below the sun and the earth and the moon. And so as four-year-old, I try to put that on computers and see what the computers can say. Um, the problem we have in simulation is that the characteristic time of the Zeta Bewegung is 10 to the minus 21 seconds, as you all know. And so the simulation sh should run at 10 to the minus 25. Um, that is much, much faster than anything that really algorithms out there are meant to handle. Some of the most advanced uh, symplectic uh, algorithms actually are meant to simulate um, the solar system, as in this picture, over long periods of time. And so you can imagine that something zittering at 10 to the minus 25 accumulates errors very, very fast. It, it is really challenging for computer simulation to say anything realistic about these kind of systems. So I'll preface uh, my presentation by saying I absolutely have jack shit to speak French in terms of result. Uh, and yet very interesting um, you know, thoughts and developments and things I think about are interesting to me and I hope, hope to you and, and I'll go uh, through that, but I like to call this uh, back to Bohr uh, after actually Emmanuel Faure, who used to work with Couder, who did some work on these models at the Langevin in Paris. Uh, just as a quick detour, how, how I got into it, because you know I think a lot of people get to the zitter through various uh, uh, channels, and this looks like a, uh, a complicated slide, but there's just two points. Really, I started with Bell inequality violations. I did a experimental work on Bell inequality violations during COVID um, and published uh, in 2021, basically two weeks before the, the Bell uh, Nobel Prize. I studied at the French Polytechnique under Alain Aspect. And so Bell stayed with me. And my conclusion once I got strict isolation was that standing waves could explain what was going on. Uh, a couple of people actually helped me review the paper. One of them was John. Uh, John Bush here, here on the call. 
And he was the first one that mentioned almost in jest that I should look into the Zitter Bewegung. And I remember him joking about how we would all start pr pronouncing Zitter Bewegung. Um, and so this, I like to call it the Zeta electron, because Zeta Bewegung sounds a little, you know, Reich. Um, then Hermann Batlan at the University of Nebraska uh, reached out and actually asked about the equipment. And uh, in discussing the standing wave hypothesis, which he did not believe, by the way, he thought I was wrong in my logic. I stand by my result, but it was an interesting discussion with Hermann. Uh, Hermann pointed out the experiment of, of Guanet. And, uh, and he asked me to look into it. Um, and uh, so I did. Uh, I spent really about a year deep diving through the models and, and the publications. I'll talk briefly. We were very honored to have uh, Joseph and, and Denis here uh, since uh, Michel Guaner passed away a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I won't bash the paper too much, but you know I'll discuss it uh, uh, quickly. So that put me on the trail of the Zitten models. We visited Frascati, the uh, Rome accelerator to uh, discuss a redo of the experiment, but it was way above our pay grade. Um, and uh, what we realized is that there were problems with the actual magnets that they actually had tried to redo the experiment at Frascati, uh, but had failed due to uh, the poor resolution of the magnets that are, uh, are, that are bending uh, the electron path so that they could not have the proper resolution on the energy scan that this experiment really is about. Um, I am a, 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 an ex-entrepreneur and an independent when I published this. Since then, Herman was kind enough to put me on the roster at UNL, where I am the oldest uh, adjunct uh, 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 professor. Uh, uh, but anyway, it is a .edu address, so it's easier for me to publish in the future, because publishing these results was absolutely a uh, 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 hell. As, so the original Guanet, um, uh, and I'm going to focus on the model. The results, you may all know, the idea is very simple, and it's here in the bottom. You have an atomic row. Uh, I think it was uh, silicon. And you send deeply relativistic uh, 100 mega electron volt, 80, 80 mega electron volt uh, uh, electrons. And this slows down the zitter clock so that it could enter a resonance, like a cycloid resonance. Uh, with the atomic row. That's the idea. And the default uh, uh, the diffra um, diffraction is this rosette uh, pattern that is characteristic of channeling in these experiments. And they did a very simple model. Actually, I mean, all, even though the model is part of my French bullshit, I mean, all that they arrived at a result because they did that on 2000 compute 2000 you know, uh, 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 year 2000 computers and, and arrived actually at, at a result that qualitatively and almost quantitatively replicated the experimental results. I am, uh, oh, hello, Martin, glad you could re uh, join us. Uh, I am light years from, uh, uh, from, from, from a result because my simulations just break down because the integration time is so small that my integrators spit out garbage. But so what they did, these are the ingredients they put in. They put in a non-relativistic equation for the transverse motion, which is justifiable to some extent. Um, and then the very complicated internal clock, the zitter kick, uh, they basically said, forget it and just put a delta function. Themselves as you know, a gentleman and, and logical gentleman say, this is not too realistic. Uh, but it's a good approximation because it's modeling this Dirac kick. And I apologize for my scribbling. This is uh, a picture of, of the paper that, that and how I read those papers. But they put a kick to simulate the zitter. And then the potential, uh, which actually, if I understand, comes from, uh, from QCD. Uh, you know, this potential is very weird from a electromagnetic standpoint because it basically scales as the square of the distance not that there is as the inverse of the square of the distance. So basically this goes to infinity uh, as a potential, which of course is not at all a realistic uh, 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 model of, of, of interaction, but these are the ingredients they put in. And what is remarkable is that they arrived at these, you know, at these results and qualitatively close. So the ingredients are, we have an interaction and then we have a kick, okay. 
There are modern models, and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, now. It starts with A.O. Barut, who published a PRL in 1980, uh, modeling a center of charge uh, moving at the speed of light around a mass a center. Uh, Barut made a lot of noise and influenced a lot of people. What's interesting to me from a epistemology point of view or historical physics point of view is that you know, what we know about the electron seems to move very slowly. I mean, these models, these semi-classical models are, are almost a, 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 a you know, uh, esoterica from the point of view of physics. A.O. Barut was, you know, known enough to publish in PRL and, and, and really nail down a first uh, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian model in 1980. Uh, by all accounts, it did influence Hestenes. And in fact, it, it, it's rumored the Guanert team, but maybe you guys can, you know, uh, they do reference Hestenes. Um, Hestenes, <clears throat> I had the very interesting assumption that there is no mass. There's only an electron charge moving in a helicoidal uh, form at the speed of light. And that what we call the mass is basically the mass energy equivalence. It's saying whatever the energy of that helicoidal movement is divided by C2, and that gives you something we might as well call the mass. Uh, so that there is no ontological reality to the mass. It's just a charge that's going in a helix, and the energy associated with this movement gives us an equivalent of a mass, but there is no mass. Martin Rivas, Martin just joined us. Uh, thank you for joining us, Martin. Uh, wrote a very comprehensive uh, book on the kinematics of spinning particles as a mathematician. Um, and he models a center of charge uh, moving at C around a center of mass. I've had many discussions with him about the ontological reality of these two elements. And of course, as a honest scientist, he says there is no ontological reality to any of it. It's just a model of two point particles doing certain things. Um, and, and we model these and, uh, and we see what they do. Uh, more lately, in that vein and historical movement of semi-realism, we have John Bush and his protege, David Darrow, and David will present uh, later on. Uh, uh, this is Revisiting De Bruyne's Double Solution, a full Lagrangian treatment, field theory, uh, with you know, the classical De Bruyne model in the modern field theoretical uh, uh, language. So let's go to the equations. This looks a little bit like a Jarek Duda slide, but I really want, actually, there's very little information in here. And I, uh, I, I want to make sure that we go through it because this is the heart of Martin's uh, 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 model. I call it Martin's model, but he himself uh, insists that this is just the conclusions of the kinematics of spinning particles. Again, we start with the three-year-old picture of a thing that rotates around the thing that rotates above a thing, as above, so below. And uh, on top, these are the non-relativistic, whereas the bottom ones are the relativistic. So for now, forget the bottom ones that look complicated and just focus on the top ones that are actually very simple. In red is what I call the slow dynamics, which is the center of mass movement, the Keplerian orbit, actually the analogy is perfect, almost perfect uh, with, with gravity. It's the Keplerian orbit of an electron. Its position is uh, 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 denoted by Q and uh, it evolves uh, under a electromagnetic field calculated at the position R. So we calculate the movement of the Earth by calculating the force at the moon, if that makes any sense as an analogy here, okay? That's the gist of the model. So the, there is this zitter on the interacting electromagnetic force. The second equation is fast dynamics of what, or what numerical integrated integrators uh, called a stiff model because this is slow and this is very fast. Uh, and this is a harmonic oscillator. This describes in its uh, naive form uh, the, the movement of the charge around uh, the center. This is the relativistic form. And you can see all of these convective velocity dependent terms uh, appear in the equations. Uh, the constraint is that the electron moves at the speed of light around the Earth. This is in natural units, which really expresses the, the beauty of the fine structure uh, constant. This is what the fine structure constant is about. 
the slow dynamics is calculated at R, the position of the electron. This is the fine constant, fine structure constant, and this is the derivative, and this is the form of the fast dynamics. This breaks every naive algorithm I throw at it. I get bullshit results, but they're interesting in and on themselves. Meaning if I constrain the system pretty much like the original team did in their simulations by let's say imposing the form analytically of, uh, of, the, of, of the electron movement, I arrive at some interesting results. Namely, I can reproduce the Guanair uh, 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 Rosette uh, a pattern of diffraction. I can reproduce Mott type uh, 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 scattering, which is a scattering about a gold electron that is dependent on the spin. I'll show that real quick. And also get some things that look like stable chaotic Bohr orbits. Let's go through the results real quickly. The first is that indeed, if we start going at a relativistic speed, the pattern of the charge gets this cycloid form. So you can see a qualitative um, explanation for the Guanair kick, okay? Indeed, the electron is not ununiformly smeared, but you have this very sharp cycloid that appear. Note also that it is spin dependent. If the spin is going the other way, uh, you would have the cycloid going the opposite way. So I know the Guanair did not include spin uh, dependence on the impacting electrons. Uh, but that would be one that could be differentiated. This is the, so the simulations break down, but they do in the, in the, in the low uh, uh, relativistic regime of 1E5 electron volt, which is MOT. We are very far from Guanair. Uh, Guanair breaks down all the computer models I have right now uh, when I do the full simulation, when I do not constrain analytically the, the relativistic zeta. Uh, but I have the proper... A uh, form and the cycloid could explain the Guanair kick indeed. Rutherford bat scattering is basically a proportion of what goes forward, what goes back, nothing really groundbreaking, just proportions. But indeed, some electrons do come back. This is the Keplerian orbits, nothing to see here, except that the simulations do spit that out. Mod spin. This is BS result because this is the wrong model. Here I constrain basically the zitter movement. I do not have a fast dynamic resolution. I do the slow dynamics and, and, and I analytically, uh, uh, I have an explicit formula uh, for the electron position around the core. I do not compute the path of the electrons, which again, breaks every simulation that I have. But what's interesting is that I can qualitatively uh, uh, exp explain the spin dependency of the smart mod scattering. Mod scattering, for those that don't know, and just to refresh for those that do, um, is about 120 keV electrons. So we don't need particle accelerators or electron accelerators. This can be done with an electron gun. And you have a dependency to the left and to the right, and it's due to this uh, cycloid. If you have a cycloid going one way, or the other, you will have a very different dependency on the left or on the right. I do reproduce those results. You can see here what the simulation spits out. Is 120 left eight electrons? Is 120 right 19 electrons out of 6,000? If I invert the spin, it says spin one half, but it's spin minus one, but that's just the sum. More interestingly for me, and Alvaro is a specialist of chaos, too bad he couldn't be here. Um, but <clears throat> what we have, here is the emergence of stable uh, chaotic orbits. Uh, again, uh, my models are wrong. I know it. Uh, the, 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 it's full of approximations. The analytic result is wrong. But let's go back to Bohr uh, for a second. What is very interesting in the Bohr model, and really the beginning of, of quantum, if you recall, is how come the electron doesn't fall into the core? Well, what we've done is basically axiomatically postulate that there is a quantization and only certain levels of energy can be occupied and certain orbits can be occupied. But these are postulates. Uh, basically, the whole foundation of quantum is one of series 
of big postulates, one being we can only occupy discrete energy levels and discrete orbits. Here we have the dynamic emergence, much like we saw in the Couder hydrodynamic walkers of an orbit that is stable. And look how pretty this round orbit is. And we can see that it's chaotic. It wants to find something and eventually it burps out on the left. This is a signature of chaotic dynamics. Now, another signature of chaotic dynamics is that there usually are nonlinear systems with dissipative uh, 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 systems. So you, you, you need dissipation somewhere. My simulation is garbage, which, mean that, which means that the energy is not conserved. And I should stop saying that my simulation is garbage. The reality is integrating anything at 10 to the minus 25 seconds, just like the Keplerian orbits over millennia, uh, uh, is going to diverge just by nature of computation. So you, as you may know, most of, uh, of, of symplectic modern advanced integrators uh, have been developed under Keplerian and atomic, or, uh, at atomic interactions. Uh, here we can see that because my energy is not conserved, I actually have this thing that is stable. And what's interesting if we think about Bohr is if we have this electron that's zipping around, there should be radiation. An electron that is accelerating is radiating. This is the Bremschallung. And so how come that an electron that is radiating around the hydrogen atom and is creating a field about it is not losing energy? Where is that energy coming from, from a classical standpoint? If the electron is continuously zooming around the core of hydrogen and radiating an electromagnetic field, how come, where does that energy come from? Why is it not dissipative? Why, why, why is it not collapsing? So <clears throat> the question of energy conservation is of course extremely important here. And because these are extremely fast dynamics and dynamically solving these equations is hard, you know, this next slide is the highest BS I've had on top of all of my BS, which is the energy is all over the place. Now, bear in mind that I'm integrating on zitter dynamics here. Okay, this is actually a result as I'm integrating the zitter. The zitter is moving and it's constrained. And it's non-conservative, highly non-conservative. Of course, the simulations are going to speed out garbage because we are integrating at such a small time scale and none of the, I mean, I'm doing research on that now. Uh, but before I say anything about energy, I need to make sure that I have the best possible energy uh, 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 conservation out of the simulations itself before I can conclude anything about us forcing the zitter. And as in SCD, this creates a coupling uh, to, the, to the vacuum, a zero point. Why is this thing always going at C? We don't know. Is it conservative? We think so, but we don't know. My simulations don't have anything to say about it because I know they're wrong. Um, I've interacted with a few people about this, including uh, John and David, um, as well <clears throat> as Burak Udanor, with whom I've done a lot of work on chaos, and he's an expert on, on, on symplectic integrators. And that got me really quickly through a rapid hole. Uh, contacted uh, Christelle Chandre in France, who's an expert in this kind of symplectic uh, integrator integration. He pointed me to some of the best, uh, uh, the best of the best uh, integrators on the market, namely Sergio Blanes uh, uh, and Moan, uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, I'm reading right now, as you can tell, I'm not that far in the book, but I'm reading right now the, the book by Blaine's, uh, Sergio, on, on symplectic integrators. It is way, way, way above my pay grade uh, in terms of the mathematics that is employed in there, but there are formulas, there are prescriptions. So I have a path to actually applying uh, some of uh, state-of-the-art uh, integrators to this uh, Zitter problem. Um, the other paths I can have is like I have done, or like the original Gwener team uh, has done, uh, is to actually constrain this kick and just say, hey, my zitter is just going around. And maybe 
allowing for some distortion of the path to get this cycloid, but basically having an analytical uh, formula for the zitter, thereby bypassing the fast dynamic integration, which is an absolute nightmare uh, to do and is extremely sensitive to initial conditions. For example, if I correct uh, the speed of the electron back to exact C instead of 1.00001 in terms of the speed of light, everything blows up. They're, they're extremely sensitive integration. So it may be that the computers, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. So I'm gonna conclude with that uh, and say that I need help. Uh, this is, uh, Martin is here with us today. So I'll actually leave my time so we can ask questions. Um, but it's been, Martin has been extremely helpful uh, uh, in helping me out uh, with uh, what's important in his book and, and, his, and his simulations uh, and, his, and his equations. Uh, everybody on the integration front has been uh, helpful. So I'll dedicate this summer uh, probably put some actual consulting money for if anybody's interested uh, to solve this problem because, like I said, I, I can write code uh, and I can run code on multi-parallel systems and I have access to very fancy, large, high-end uh, computers at UNL, etc. cetera. Uh, Wayne is here also on the call. We did that last time. You know, so we can we can do the implementation, but the, the thinking behind it is, 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 is above my pay grade. And that's it. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. So, so, so we can have five minutes for 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 some discussion uh, comments. So please unmute and 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 ask. Or... I have a question. Hi, Mark. Thanks for your talk. I enjoyed that very much. Um, I wanted to ask you about your your views on on spin, uh, specifically in in Rebus's work. It's sort of imposed by the Compton scale rotational motion. Um, and in, in the hydrodynamics system, it's seen as an emergent property, which comes from basically a high frequency oscillation as, as the experiments that you uh, did were involved in yourself. You see that this sort of angular motion, you have a particle trapped in its own wave field is an emergent property. So um, <clears throat> in, in which case, uh, if you were extrapolate down to yeah, so it's a it's a question of whether it is the the internal. Of course, you can imagine an internal vibration which has a circular component, and that's sort of the picture that Rebus has. Or you can see it as an emergent property from uh, a faster dynamics. What's your feeling? So I very humbly apply uh, the model that Martin has developed, and as you point out, it is not an emergent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, movement. Uh, we hypothesize. Uh, a, a spin uh, at the velocity uh, of, uh, of light around a center of charge. Because we see very similar, so some of those orbital motions you showed, for example, you have the, the orbital motion around a larger orbit in your sort of confinement uh, a la Bohr, because you see very similar things in pilot wave hydrodynamics where you, you basically have the spin state stabilized by say a magnetic field, and then you have the drifting around a larger orbit. Um, so it is, it's fascinating, but it, you know, it's, it's, it is possible that there is an under, a dynamics underlying zitter even, right? Yes, in fact, if you remember with Emmanuel, we published and Samuel, we published on the auto orbits. Exactly, that's what I was speaking of, yeah. yeah. Which, which is exactly this electron, right? That stabilizes through its own wave field and, and Emmanuel, uh, 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 analyze the stability. And I was actually listening to a video. I talked with him. It was just the two of us where he was going back to Bohr and he was showing that uh, this electron magnetism with a retardation, uh, with a Doppler compression and retardation included a beating around the orbit that recreated exactly um, the Bohr uh, 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 condition. Uh, he has not oh, the quantization it. condition. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, and that's very interesting. You you are correct. Here, I'm, I think you know epistemologically, what I'm doing here is saying, are these spinning electron models relevant to what we see experimentally, which is really what Hermann wanted me to look at, right? And what do we know experimentally? Uh, we know scattering. We know mod scattering. We know Guanet. Okay, and increasingly, because I've seen these stable orbits, I want to start modeling much, much lower, 10 EV, 30 EV, and see if they're stable around the core. Could this explain the hydrogen model? Could we see the fine structure 
be dependent on the spin if we include a B thing in this model, right? There's there's quite a few predictions in, in Martin's book um, that we could model before we go to the Guanère, because the Guanère is, is a really complicated experiment, requires particle accelerator, you know, da da da. Denis can speak about that, but you know, it's 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 advanced physics. Uh, but there may be just atomic, simple atomic Compton scale effects here. Very good, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about the energy bleeding. You said your your uh, your simulations do not con conserve energy; you are using energy, and I think that, that that's a standard effect of any particle simulations, like in fluid dynamics. So. How do you counter that? Do you put like a heat bath? How how do you do you solve the problem of the energy bleeding? No, what I, what I really say is two things. One, on the actual result, my simulations are wrong, and so you know, even a symplectic earlier, which supposedly is good at conserving energy, just blows up. I've tried a symplectic Rangekuta, naive, it blows up. So. My what whatever energy is coming out of my simulation is akin to the wrong energies that come out of Keplerian simulations uh, 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 with with you know advanced integrators. This is just a computer problem. We are we are not used to running at t minus twenty five. So the first thing I say is we cannot trust what's coming out of my simulations. Period. I cannot trust what's coming out of my simulations. Period. The second point I make is that we have. We do not know for sure whether this forced movement actually conserves energy when in a electromagnetic field. If not, it is a coupling to the vacuum. And if so, it can help explain this magic of Bohr, which is why do electron orbits not collapse? Right now, we have no answer. It's one of the founding principles of quantum because you can only occupy these energies and that's it. But we have no explanation for it. Right. And so I'm saying before I'd say it's an interesting question for me, which is why I want to get my simulations much, much cleaner before I, 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 I move on to any other conclusion on that. So, Mark, if you want to clean the simulations, I, I have I have put in, in English CAPD. This is a library for you, 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 you expand it to tailor it to 100, 100 other if you want. So, as, as accurate as you want. Uh, this CAPD, uh, take a look at, at, at it. CAPD. It's, it's, I'll take it CAPD, offline yes. uh, with you with pleasure. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, uh, Alvaro, at this point, I'll say very clearly I'm, I'm, I'm able and willing to finance someone to work on this because you know I need to assemble a team I, I can't I, I can't pull it all by myself here it's 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 a, it's a waste of my time and everybody they take a look at the CAPD and I, I'll contact with the authors uh, in my thank department you. sure thank you uh, Alvaro could you share yeah 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 and my apologies because I I confused you cannot start screen while the other participant is sharing oh somebody else oh. has to stop sharing Mark uh, could you stop stop sharing yeah. Okay. All right. So my apologies to Mark because I I missed it for for half an hour. Um. All right. I'm sharing right now. You see it? It is. All right. So, uh, wait, wait a moment. This is getting down. Present slides. So all right. Okay. So I will try to. Relate and convince you that C turbine wagon is a, a particular nonlinear oscillation, which is um, has been called uh, self oscillation. If you want, it's a self sustained oscillation, which is very different from the paradigm that is mostly being used in fundamental physics nowadays, and which is a very old paradigm. Um, Sidney Coleman, which is one of the uh, great contributors to quantum electrodynamics. He was the master of David Griffiths, for example, and he has great lectures on quantum electrodynamics. Uh, he used to say that the career of a young theoretical physicist consists of a treating the harmonic oscillator in ever increasing levels of abstraction. So basically the, the most important equation, so to speak, in, 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 in physics is the harmonic oscillator equation and all the fields are quantized using the Fourier transformation. And you need this linear principle to superpose the, the different modes of the field. 
uh, and this the idea that the, there is no dissipation in the in the oscillations in in nature uh, uh, on the one hand, and they are linear. So this is a paradigm that I, I'm trying to convince you that is not a good starting point for physics because uh, physics is not linear. So uh, I like this picture. This is Robert Hooke. So you can see Robert Hooke here with his book, The Potentia Restitutiva, and he has a spring between his hands. And basically, this is the paradigm we are using. And I like the picture because there is all the nature around him. You can see the, the water waves, the birds, the ship, uh, and, and all the stuff that you see around the clouds are non-linear and they admit, admit uh, as we are going to see, self-oscillations. So this is an, an ironic picture. Um, even, even if you pull a string in physics, we know that the equation, the, the equation of the classical string, is non-linear. We simply linearize it to a small, a small energy or weak, weak energy uh, waves. And we all, all always disrespect dissipation. So I'm going to show how these appear in, in classical e electrodynamics. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I want to recall, uh, or I've already told you about this, but I want to tell you about it once again. And if there is some people that are new, they can get to know these ideas or how I arrived to them. And then I will enter into the self-oscillating aspect and give some examples and, and try to com compare, uh, make a comparison with the, um, with the Newtonian paradigm, which is a, an older paradigm. So the idea is that if you the, the, the problem for me is the point mass, because a point uh, cannot self-interact uh, because it has no uh, structure. And uh, but if, if if particles have a structure, if they are not points, uh, when they emit field perturbations, one part of the particle can, can emit a perturbation and another part of the particle can reabsorb that perturbation. And that means a particle can interact with its past. Uh, we have a, a very important example nowadays with the walking uh, droplets. And as you know, when the when the droplet hits the, the underlying fluid, it creates a wave and this wave can affect it later later on. So the, I, I'm going to show that this happens as, as well in electrodynamics if you have an extended body. And that can give rise to the Hopf, Hopf bifurcation. And I, I, I claim that this nonlinear oscillate, oscillation resulting from the Hopf bifurcation is, is sitter Bewegung. I'm going to obtain the, from purely classical electrodynamics, sitter. So ba basically, um, I'm using Maxwell plane electrodynamics, nothing else. And if you use the, the density Lagrangian of, of, of classical electrodynamics, you have a term for the fields. And then you have a term for the coupling uh, between the matter and the fields. And as you know, the well, this is the Faraday tensor. And this other term is the four potential, which couples to the current density. And you have two terms, one for the charge density, and the other is the current density, which is the charge density times the speed. Uh, and if you can solve these, these equations, and, and you solve it and you get the four potential and you just have to use the green function and the green function uh, allows you to obtain the potentials from the charge density. And what I would like to stress from now on is that you have time retardations in electromagnetism. This occur between even even for point particles, you need to take them into account because that's how you preserve causality. You, you, it, it takes some time for light to travel from some point to the other. So you cannot pretend that you don't need this in, in, in physics as quantum mechanics does. And, uh, and also if you have an extended body, you have this uh, with respect to the particle itself. I mean, the, the particle is self-interacting. So if you use the solutions to these um, equations, you can get for a point particle, you can get the linear beaker potential. So uh, in, in my work, what I did, I, I used a model that was, uh, it's in the last part of the books, the, the book of, on electrodynamics by David Griffiths. I think he got this, this model from, from Parcel, which, which has a, an older book on electrodynamics. And it's just a rigid charge density with two points, which is the simplest particle you can think of. Um, later on, I will show also results with an sphere. You can use a continuous distribution of charge, but here we just have two, two particles at a fixed distance. So this is our, it's called a rigid charge density with two points. You can compute the, the so the idea is that one, one, one of the points affects the other par, uh, part of the particle at a later time. So the, the particle talks to itself, it can affect itself. And this is the, the past, and this is a later time, and, and, and a photon, if you want to say that way, or a, or a field perturbation can travel in space-time and affect it later, the same particle. So you must take into account the, that the speed of light is constant, 
and and you can compute the linear uh, with the linear beaker potentials the the field created by one particle on the other at a later time using the retarded uh, fields so this is the radiation radiation part of the field which depends on acceleration and i want to recall here that there is acceleration here and this is going to create the the self inductive force which we know as as the inertia the force of inertia in newton's uh, in newton's law uh, and this term is the Coulombian part. So you can compute the total force, one particle on the other part and the other particle on the on, on the on the first, and and you obtain the cell force and you can express it. Uh, I'm studying only transversal perturbations in in the first place. So you perturbate this this uh, distribution of charge and see what happens. Uh, so this is the cell force and the, the idea what we have been taught from. From the very beginning of our careers is that we must write the the the, the, the addition of total of, of the total force the sum of forces equal mass times acceleration you can do this as well here but you obtain a very weird thing where where you mix acceleration in the present and acceleration in the past so what i did is to assume that there is no that newton's laws come from electrodynamics i assume that all the mass is electromagnetic and you can get here, you see that there is a, tar, a term which has already the electromagnetic mass. Um, so you do not need to put a, a artificial inertia. I used what it's called uh, the D'Alembert's principle, which is like a covariant equation, like, like the, the geodesic equation. So the, the addition of uh, total forces equals zero. And if you do that, and if you use plain electromagnetic energy defined as um, electrostatic energy, mass is electrostatic energy divided C square. Uh, you can also write mass as proportional to H bar thanks to Arnold Sommerfeld's formula. And in the limit of uh, uh, D divided by C tending to zero, you can obtain the Newton's law directly. So if you put here these results, you, you obtain Newton's law. But if you if you get if you want to use the the correct, complete, exact analytical result without approximation, you have to use delay, delay differential equations. So I want to, to study just the motion of a, a free particle. So I had no external forces. And the solution, uh, what you obtain, is a nonlinear oscillator. So I, I want to draw attention of this type of oscillators today. Uh, you have a, a term of inertia. And also, you have this term, which is Hooke's law. But there is more things. There is this term, which has dissipation and depends on speed. This is the gamma factor. It's related to, the, to one divided gamma square. And this is also uh, another one divided gamma square uh, factor because uh, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. And the amazing thing that I was able to derive in this in this work, and this is all exact analytical results, is that there's the time delay. I, what I did is I, I, I advanced. I advanced the entire equation. This was retarded in the linear bucket potential. This is retarded, 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 and this is present time. So I advanced everything so that you can see the equation better, and it would be an advanced term. This is called an advanced delayed differential equation, and the delay is not constant. It depends on speed, and it depends on acceleration. So it's called a state-dependent time-delayed oscillator. This is impossible to solve analytically. There are no even integrators for the moment. I have, I'm, I'm working now with neutral uh, di di delay differential equations with a state dependent delay. I'm obtaining a lot of results from similar to quantum uh, an an analogs, but um, for the moment, there is not even numerical schemes. And the good thing is that the, the fastest the particle goes, uh, the, the earlier from the past the signals come because uh, it takes time to get from one part of the particle to the other. So what I did is I studied the, the stability of this, of this oscillator. And I obtained that uh, if you put it at rest, you just uh, give it a little perturbation and it starts to jiggle blah, 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 very violently. And you see all the all the eigenvalues have positive real part for transversal perturbations of the particle. And this is the characteristic polynomial. And I computed the frequency. And this is apart from a form factor, the sitter bewegung frequency. So um, basically, sitter wegun is the result of a nonlinear is, is a nonlinear oscillation in this in this simple model of the electron, which is of course too simple. Of course, I admit that, but you can get already the wave particle duality from classical electromagnetism without any assumptions. Um, and um, if you switch to other types of geometry, for example, the spherical particle, all you you see the hop bifurcation because all the all the real parts uh, become ne negative and now sorry the oscillations are damped 
it is nevertheless interesting that even if the particle has no external forces, if it's if it's moving, it can it, it can oscillate even if it's damping. So the, the oscillation stops, but during that time, even without external forces, you have non-linear motion. Non-linear motion. So that means that Newton's laws does not hold. Not the first law even. The, the second law does not even hold because uh, uh, you you have. Uh, to take into account retardations and that puts a lot of if you develop in Taylor series that gives you a lot of um, uh, all the terms with derivatives like third derivative of position fourth and so on so uh, delayed differential equations have infinite dimensions they are infinite dimensional systems so um, well I, I've obtained that the stability depends on the geometry of the particle and in general I think you should have some uh, gradient in the in the fields outside to unleash the the um, the oscillation, but what I would like to to talk about in a few slides is that you don't need to tune frequencies for self oscillation, and this is very important. Well, this is the general scheme of Juan Carré Andronov Andronov uh, Hoff bifurcation, and basically you, here you see I will focus here. This is supercritical and this is subcritical, but the idea is the same I've told you before. And then the eigenvalues have a negative real part, and then they become uh, positive, and this is the the instability basically. So I propose that zero point oscillations appear as a consequence of self-interactions. Um, quite similar to, to, to droplets, uh, uh, walking droplets. Uh, so here you see how the, the, the this is a stable because the spiral goes inwards and then you destabilize. Here you, you see that he's, this is the point of the hop bifurcation and then it starts to spiral toward the limit cycle. So you get into a limit cycle. It was Henri Poincaré in, the, in his celestial mechanics who discovered and studied very uh, deeply uh, for the first time limit cycles. So this is all, it begins with Poincaré in his, the first, it, it's a book that started chaos theory, in fact. So the thing again, and I'm going to go, I, I, because I just want to talk about this kind of oscillators. And I would like to draw attention to two things because all physics is based on the fact that this term does not exist and that this term is linear. But, and that's what all quantum field theory is based on in second quantization and Fox space, basically, which is assuming the mechanical uh, hooks a spring. So it's very old physics, in fact. Uh, and this physics is much more modern. Uh, Lienard systems, I, I have made a deep connection between state-dependent delay differential equations. I will show you the, ci the, the citation now in the next slide. And the thing is that here you have a dissipative term. And through this term, the, the system, is, it becomes alive because you can get energy into the system, a point, uh, it's different from a point uh, in the sense that through this term, you, you can have this positive or negative. If it's positive, you are ejecting uh, energy. And if it's negative, you can draw energy into the system. So you can eat. The, the particle ha is now alive in the sense it has an internal life. It can get energy through some parts of, of the cycle and eject energy through other parts of the cycle. So this is a nonlinear oscillator, and this is not possible in, in, in the harmonic oscillator. And this also introduces the fact that uh, there is memory in physics because there is memory everywhere except in fundamental physics and we should ask also why. So the idea is that time delayed differential equations uh, can explain some of physical phenomena of the atomic world. And I, I propose that this, this time delayed uh, self interactions produce the Sitter Bewegung uh, because of the self affections. And here I have connected state dependent delayed differential equations to linear systems in the low memory limit, which they are related. And here we have we have explained some some quantum behavior in in a walking droplet models. And I'm happy to say that about two two days ago we were able to make a complete Bohr-like model. It's not uh, I mean there are infinite limit cycles. We are working with a concept called mega stability, and you can construct with delayed differential equations systems with inf infinite number of 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 quantized orbits, and you can calculate the spectrum and, and many things. And we are. We are doing that with this kind of nonlinear uh, time delayed oscillators. So this is what I call the Raju Atija hypothesis because um, Atija, Sir Michael Atija, proposed that uh, retardations and functional differential equations beyond uh, the harmonic oscillator can probably explain some of quantum phenomena, at least some of them, if you want. So. This is the first part. The second part, I would like to, to introduce a bit more, uh, emphasize this important concept, because I think this is, I mean, the, the, this concept is more important than, I mean, it's not just fundamental physics. It's going to appear everywhere. So, because in the end, what sustains oscillations in nature, you must be open to the environment and, and, and draw energy and eject energy. You need to eat and, and you need to go to the bathroom. Uh, so I say that particles also go to the bathroom and, and go to the kitchen, so to speak. 
So the self oscillation is the production of a vibrating motion by means of an energy source without tuned frequency, or even without periodicity, if you want. So you do not need, uh, uh, in some others, you, you can use uh, periodic um, energy oscillations from the environment, but you having even a, a constant electric field can put the particle to jiggle. So this is the, the great thing about self oscillation. It is the system with its motion who manages the take of energy, the draw of energy from the environment and the uh, ejection of energy to the release of the energy to the environment. So you don't need to tune frequencies. Um, and the good thing as well is that these systems behave like thermodynamic engines. And I would like to talk about the, the link between self oscillating systems and thermodynamic machines. So the concept of self oscillation, if you want, is I think it can be traced back to Alexander Andronov in his book, The Theory of Oscillations. And this paper is the most important thing I would like to draw attention to today, self oscillation by Alejandro Jenkins. Uh, let me give just three three more examples of, of equations which are similar to the equation that I that I found in classical electrodynamics. One is the, the, the equation for the clarinet drift in the book of Lord Riley, The Theory of Sound. And this equation uh, is is intended to explain the motion of a reed in a in a clarinet, if you want. I used to play the clarinet uh, a long time ago. And the idea is what ha what can happen, the, the, the reason why you can get self-propulsion is that when the when the reed is here in its F down position, and the there comes in and it can go back when it reaches the, the late part, the end part of the instrument. And when it comes back, you can ha have high pressure. When the when the reed goes up, more air, which is coming here from the right, enters, and you can have this feedback, positive feedback, which destabilizes there. And the, the same, the opposite thing, but also contributing in the same sense, uh, happens in the in the in the other stream. So the idea is that you get a limit cycle in the phase, phase and, and the rest of the state. So there is only one. This is a quantized state. There is only one state possible in this equation in 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 Lord Riley. Uh, another beautiful example of the, this. This example, some of them are, can be read in a great paper about the. Uh, the Tacoma bridge, which also the failure of the bridge was due to a self oscillation due to the vortexes created up and down in the in, in the bridge. And this paper is brilliant. It's very, very a beautiful paper by William Munro. Um, so here in this model, uh, well, uh, well, uh, in, in, he, he discusses in this paper the, the, the bottle, uh, how you sound, you, you blow the bottle. And he explains that because of the time delay, it takes the air some time to travel through the neck of the bottle. And even when the, the pressure is high, there is still air coming in. It is admitting because there is a time delay. So you can get this uh, self-propulsion, uh, reinforcement, amplifying, self-amplifying phenomenon as well. It's explained in great detail in this book. I, I won't go in more detail, but uh, in this paper, and I recommend the, the reading of William. This is the guy of the Unruh effect. Perhaps you know him from the Unruh effect, but this paper is really worth reading. It's about self-oscillation. And finally, um, it's also the Hopf bifurcation, which creates the turbulent, the vorticity in, in fluids. Um, so another interesting self oscillation phenomenon is the is the Kevin Hem Hemholtz instability when you have two fluids at different uh, speeds here in the in the sky and you see that uh, when you have a little perturbation this little perturbation self amplifies because uh, well, when this gets shorter uh, you know uh, uh, that it's shorter it means a higher higher speed so this is higher speed Slow speed, slow speed, higher speed, and this by the Bernoulli equation makes this get in get up even more, and then the, the flow makes it rotate. So in then you get a hot bifurcation, and you can display the, this instability. And also in this very very important paper where you can see the the turbulence in in fluids, the for example the von Karman streets, in this great work uh, which I've read several times by David Joel and Floris Stagen, it's also the hot bifurcation. So it's all the hot Okay, theory the point because you have a union engine, self are thermic and they are in from equilibrium. These are to me by Yes? Is it working? 
Yes, 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 it's better. Yes, yes. Is it fine? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So, so you see, thermodynamic cycles are in fact limit cycles in a phase space. This is the phase, uh, the thermodynamic phase space is pressure and volume. And if you look at this uh, self oscillator, this is a self oscillator. Is the steam engine? You always you always uh, have a, a source of energy. The source of energy is non periodic. You heat the fluid. The fluid it makes vapor, and this vapor enters the the, the piston. And the, again, the same self propulsion, of course, because when the piston reaches its upper part, uh, cooling cooling um, air enters or cooling uh, uh, water enters and when it, the, you have the lowest pressure then you get even lower pressure and that allows you to compress the piston uh, accelerating so so again you have a destabilizing phenomenon and what 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 we must think about self oscillation is that they are thermodynamic engines so i like to see theta bebegun as a as nature fundamental clock i call it the heart of time and the idea is that limit cycles are not invariant and, and their time reversal my opinion is that uh, as, as far as I have seen, all the self oscillators, there have they take energy from one side through some part of its structure, and they eject energy through some other part. So they eat like I do. I eat by my mouth and I excrete by my ass. So this there is always an asymmetry, in, and this asymmetry comes from the fact that the 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 way they draw energy and the way they eject it is different. And, and I think this is what uh, unleashes the arrow of time, of course. That, so there would be a symmetry breaking because there are different ways to take and um, uh, eject the energy. Uh, and well, here I've, I've delved in, into the dynamic structure of the Lorentz system, which is a very important system. And also explain, um, if you want, uh, from the thermodynamic point of view, um, the self-oscillation in, in, in Rayleigh-Benard convection. So this is those. Thomas Newcomen, the inventor of the steam engine, and this to to uh, I'm going to conclude uh, five more slides. I think um, the dissipative well a bit more uh, dissipative structures uh, beyond point particles. So this is a, a different paradigm which was uh, called to us by by Ilya Prigogini, and the idea is that you have open systems with a structure and they exchange energy and matter with the environment and they generate entropy. So there is entropy generation of these uh, oscillate oscillators. Um, and the problem is that this system, they cannot be represented by the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulations of, of Newtonian mechanics because you have non-conservative forces. So let me very briefly recall how Newtonian mechanics works because everybody uh, in the end physics has turned back to uh, when at the end of the 19th century, uh, the, the, the fathers of electromagnetism didn't know how to deal with electrodynamics because of background fluctuations, because of a lot of retardations, and it's really hard to, to understand electrodynamics. So what we did is to invent a new theory, which was called quantum mechanics, which is a mechanical theory, and it's based basically on Newton's theory. So we go, it's like Newton resurrected. Uh, we didn't know how to do with the field, so we took the fields out. Bohr, in fact, was the one who said, okay, we don't need fields because in this stationary states of the hydrogen atom, there is no emission of radiation. So let's put out the fields and let's go back to Newton's mechanics. So, but the problem of Newton mechanics is that it's like, um, if you want to construct a quantum theory from Newton's mechanics, you use a point mass, acceleration, and a conservative potential, which is an actual distance potential. So you have to recuperate acting distance. And then you go to Hamilton's formulation by representing it in the cotangent bundle, the fiber bundle. And that's what you obtain. And as long as you use conservative potential, this is very well. But if you have forces of friction, you cannot do this, for example. Uh, in fact, Lagrangian mechanics what was developed to avoid dealing with tensions of strings, for example, in output machines, or uh, to avoid dealing with um, normal forces. So all the, all the constraint forces disappeared from Lagrangian formulation. So the idea is to all the things that involve complicated dissipative, non-conservative forces, you get rid of it. And, and that's how, how you develop a Newtonian theory and symplectic geometry. And you need symplectic geometry to do uh, quantum mechanics because all is based on the existence basically of a symplectic form and the existence of a Poisson structure. It is through this that you guarantee the conservation of, of energy on, on, on the one hand, this is Darboux's theorem, and this is how you define the Poisson structure, which they need to quantize uh, uh, the, the operators. So this is the proposal of Dirac in his principles of quantum mechanics, uh, turn the Poisson structure into a canonical uh, commutation uh, Lee, Lee commutator. So, so you need the, the structure of Newton's conservative mechanics. So you, if you try to do this with dissipative things, uh, you cannot do it. 
But the problem is that I have shown that you can derive Newton's law and even more things from classical electrodynamics. If mechanics is not fundamental, all the kind of we have built, quantum mechanics included, and of course, quantum electrodynamics is also built on quantum fields that are based on uh, on the harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonic oscillator. So you you are relying on Newton again. So the problem is Newton, in my opinion. Um, and the idea is, this idea was already posed in the light, late 19th century very clearly by uh, Vien in a paper called On the Possibility of an Electromagnetic Foundation of Mechanics. So the idea is that ma mass is not fundamental, it's just ele electromagnetic energy. And we must build a field theory in which we do not need to put mass uh, artificially, uh, but as a parameter, uh, as, as it happens in the Dirac equation, but as obtain as a plane energy from a field. So. The idea is that mechanical theories, uh, Newton's laws are emergent laws, good for, for macroscopic, uh, some macroscopic. Uh, and, and, uh, very useful, can be beautiful. I'm saying also gravitational mass, which we know by the principle of equivalence is the same as inertial mass, must be also from electromagnetic energy. Oh, <clears throat> there's a problem with audio, and, and this I, means I, that I, gravity as for total atoms and price force. Which we generate this very weak force, which is gravity. So I must finish. In, um, um, I want to say that the equivalence principle, we must be careful with it because uh, generally, when you are falling in a gra gravitational field, the earth uh, um, okay so so i say that i also want to talk about very briefly the fact that it's other part of the idea new universal even they say that it's a universal it's it's a the gravitational universal uh, universal gravitational law is fundamental in the sense that uh, this always holds and my proposal is that I'm trying to do now something that is to derive Milgram's law. Uh, as you know, the dark matter problem, uh, at least in galaxies, the, the thing is the, the, the rotation curves of the galaxies that you should obtain according to Newton's uh, law, that this falls like one divided by R and it's not the case, but they found experimentally. So they are trying to uh, make up some dark matter hollows invisible around the galaxies. But if this is not fundamental, perhaps, and I'm, I'm also, I have also demonstrated in these papers I showed to you before that this is not the whole story. There are more terms due to retardations um, that the law inertia is not fundamental, then um, perhaps we shouldn't give these laws for granted uh, to conclude that there exists dark matter. So I want to give here some support based on the fact that Newton law is not fundamental. And just to conclude, my firm opinion on what I'm working now is that theta by wave one is a, a, an oscillon, and perhaps that particles are electromagnetic breathing oscillons in in, in general relativity. Um, Space-time curvature can make light rays a uh, curve uh, bend, and you can have make circular motion. So the idea is that these particles are getting energy from the environment and releasing energy, and and this is how you sustain. Uh, a field oscillation, a pure field oscillation. So the energy of this oscillation would be mass. I hope that some way this will be a kind of knot and this uh, will have a topological charge uh, and, and, and the currents will give you, the displacement currents will give you spin. So, well, this is basically it, the idea that uh, this is also a, a self oscillation. It is a, a vortex, a vortex thing. Um, and that's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, some very brief question. If not, maybe uh, Andras could could, uh, could stop sharing and Andras could. I would like to ask, <laughs> your uh, frequency of theta bewegung should depend on the size of the object, isn't it? Mass. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So what would you uh, like in the shape of the electron? The, the shape and, and the... What? 
what would you charge then for the electron? What you, what is your is your estimate? The the, the value of the Citer wagon? Yeah, yeah. Which you get from the size of the electron? Uh, ten to twenty. It's yeah, yeah. I, I got tw ten to twenty one in the paper. More. Yes, and more the, or less. what's then the radius which you need? What's the size then? Of I the, what is the size of the electron then? So you take 10 to the minus 15 or something. Sorry, I don't hear you. You are... I use the classical... Classical electron radius. Okay, thank you. Ten to minus fifteen. Yes, yes. In the paper, it's uh, it's the classical radius. Is yes, it's two ten to minus fifteen. I think. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I use all classical values. It's all classical. What I did. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Okay, so there is a question for five minute break. So, so maybe let, let let us start for five past. So if there are questions you can you can you can ask and, and let us start five five, five, five minutes. Uh, okay. In two minutes, yes. Okay. So. okay, great. In the meantime, I will find my slides. Uh, Alvaro, okay. if you can stop your mm -hmm. sharing, then I will start mine. I think I think I already stopped. I, I'm not sure. Uh you are okay. oh, no, I'm sorry, wait, uh, stop share. All right. Forgive me. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I, I I have sent the, the, the Dennis information from the, the colleague who who, uh, who works in in this synchrotron uh, Solaris uh, to to recreate and I I be there I think in this Monday and I can try to ask about it about details. Mm -hmm. All right. So so we have now uh, two more minutes. Sure. Sure. Okay. Maybe some questions regarding Alvaro's talk. If somebody has some, please. Uh, Ines, could you unmute and ask? Oh, you want you want me to ask the question? Yes, uh, yes. Oh no, I was thinking that the in Alvaro's presentation, the um, environment could be the vacuum fluctuations. That would be the natural yes. thing to to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I don't, I do not know exactly, exactly the the. I mean, I zero point fluctuations in the fields. I, I know there are zero point fluctuations, but I'm not sure the vacuum. I think it's very complicated and turbulent. I, I don't know really how the vacuum is, but yes, yes, probably vacuum. Black, vacuum field fluctuations are the source of energy to sustain the 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 sitter I, I think so. I mean, but you only need uh, even a constant field. Even a constant field is enough. You you don't even need. Uh, like a frequency so, so the, the frequency of the sitter is in the particle is not in the vacuum but there could be I, i'm sure this fluctuation we all know there are quantum fluctuations in the vacuum yeah yeah it could be um, an emergent property of the of the, of the, vacuum, the vacuum um okay i'll contact you in private and send you a, a reference maybe we could discuss that sure 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 great great thank you the, 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 the big question what are the vacuum fluctuations maybe they, they can came from the electron clock maybe they are created by the electrons yeah, and yeah. other particles around here yeah, yeah, yeah the, 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 the assumption, there is feedback the, the assumption that they are they are they are chaotic and not it, it all it all depends on on the way you picture them but they could be a, a regime that's the the paper i'm talking about there could be a, a regime where they are extremely coherent and in this extreme regime of coherency, then you could have very interesting uh, properties that would emerge from that. And maybe, so So that's something that I, I would draw the attention to. And, and, and your, your work, Alvaro, is very close to what this uh, paper is talking about, extremely close, in fact. So, yeah, it's... Um, 
because you need the driving you need uh if if you assume that the particles are emerging from this coherent regime of of vacuum fluctuations then you would have the source and you would have uh the oh, radiation yeah. these particles are radiating but they are absorbing the energy so what you said of eating and and then going to the toilet it would be basically uh, through the vacuum fluctuations um uh process dynamics in in that okay. so so but you have of course you have to prove that these particles are stable and all this formalism got that that comes from vacuum fluctuations can should be you know uh proved and all of that yeah. but uh that's what that's where yeah, I have seen I have seen os oscillons um, uh, em emitting radiation, but I have not seen solitons absorbing uh, radiation. So so far, I don't know if there are any soliton theories about how um, wave waves can be absorbed by by a by a soliton. I have not seen that yet. Yeah. Okay. We we do have soliton motion in some of the walking drop experiments. So if you confine droplets to a ring you get solitary waves and all of, you know, in the mm -hmm. and drop system, all of them, uh, every phenomenon you see, it's driven and dissipative. So you can get a balance between the two and get solitary waves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed that. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, Andras, we can start this. So let's talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, start my presentation. Uh, my presentation is about the zeta waveguide models of the electron and proton, and uh, in very much sense, it's a continuation of uh, Alvaro's uh, presentation, I would say. Uh, but my presentation will be very much uh, rooted in experimental data because uh, I think uh, that's uh, should what should physics should be concerned about the correct interpretation of experiments. And uh, also in my work, I have co-author Giorgio Vassalo, who is also in this call today. Uh, so firstly, uh, let us uh, look at the uh, Compton scattering. Uh, here we have on the left a model of uh, uh, electron light scattering. If we have an incoming photon and then the scattered photon has a different angle and a different uh, wavelengths. And there are uh, two types of uh, regimes of this very basic process, uh, depending on the ratio of the uh, photon energy and electron mass. In the uh, low frequency limit is called the Thomson limit, and the uh, high frequency limit is the quantum scattering regime, uh, where the Klein-Nishina uh, equation describes this uh, scattering process. So now we can measure uh, this uh, uh, interaction parameters of the uh, scattering cross-section and applying the klein nishina formula, we can uh, exactly measure the electron spherical charge radius. And uh, this value comes out to be 2.82 femtometers. And this well-known number is referred to as the classical electron radius. So it means that uh, this uh, electron light interaction tells us exactly how large this uh, spherical electron charge is. Uh, now, once we know the size of the electric charge, we can calculate the total electric energy. So this is the well-known formula for uh, integrating the electric field energy from this R0 out to infinity. And when we do it with the classical electron radius, then amazing coincidence, we get exactly half of the electron mass as the electric field energy. Um, Okay, to get the other half uh, of the electron mass, the uh, relevant uh, experiment is quantum mechanics uh, itself. And here uh, I have at the top of the slides are the uh, Lorentz transformation formulas uh, for, for various uh, speeds. Uh, as it is well known, uh, Lorentz transformation is a, a kind of rotation of time and space coordinate uh, into each other according to this uh, transformation matrix. And uh, if uh, along the time axis, we have some kind of an oscillation frequency, then uh, part of that oscillation frequency uh, will be a frequency along the space axis. So uh, we start from De Broglie's guess. So this was De Broglie's guess about the relationship between the zeta bewegung frequency and the uh, electron mass. And uh, we apply 
uh, Lorentz uh, boost uh, formula to the uh, uh, to the zeta bewegung frequency, and we calculate the wave number that appears on the spatial axis. Uh, so, so here we I have think the calculation. Slide did not advance. Uh, uh, really? Uh, do you do you see? Uh, We're we see the Compton scattering. Ah, it says my screen sharing is paused. I, I okay, so maybe unshare and reshare again. Okay, okay, let's try again. Share screen. Share. Uh, so do you do you see now the quantum mechanics part? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So, so I was uh, talking about this um, uh, Lorentz boost matrix that rotates time and space coordinates into each other. And uh, when we apply this Lorentz boost to the uh, zeta bewegung frequency as guessed by De Broly on the time axis, then we get uh, this wave number on the uh, space axis. So this is a straightforward calculation. It's just the relativistic Lorentz boost. And what you get at the wave number is uh, uh, actually here, the H bar times K is the uh, gamma uh, times M0. This is the relativistic mass uh, times the uh, speed uh, of the boost. And uh, so this is M times V. This is the kinetic uh, momentum of the electron. So, so what we obtain by, by the simple Lorentz uh, transformation is actually the basic postulate of quantum mechanics. So the appearing quantum mechanical wave number is associated with the electron momentum. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't have to be a postulate because we can take this as a measurement that shows that uh, this um, uh, De Broglie frequency is a real frequency it is the actual zeta bewegung frequency of the electron. Uh, and uh, today uh, in quantum mechanics books, often why it's taken as a uh, postulate is because they don't want to talk about zeta bewegung frequency, but we can take it as an, uh, that we can take it such a way that quantum mechanics is the experimental confirmation of the reality of this uh, zeta bewegung frequency. Okay, so do you see now the slide transitioning? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so, so once we have this uh, frequency, uh, then we can calculate the actual zeta bewegung radius from the light speed circulation of the electron. And uh, uh, because the electron has a magnetic uh, uh, moment, uh, we associate the electron spin with this circular motion of the electric charge. Uh, this is the electron zeta bewegung. And uh, uh, so once we know this uh, De Broglie frequency, and uh, uh, we know it is light speed motion, then we can calculate the zeta bewegung radius and we get the 386 uh, femtometer as the zeta bewegung radius. This is also not a random number, it has a name in physics. This uh, is called the reduced uh, Compton radius that we calculated here. Uh, now, uh, with this number, we can calculate the uh, total magnetic energy and I calculate the magnetic energy uh, from this uh, uh, static loop formula. So we take one half times magnetic flux times the current. And uh, when you multiply it together uh, with this um, 386 uh, femtometer value, then again, amazing coincidence, you get uh, magnetic energy being exactly half of the electron mass. So, so we have this result that half of the electron mass is electric energy, other half of electric mass is uh, magnetic energy. And this is exactly what you expect in an electromagnetic induction. So you can see that in the electron, we have some kind of a wave where the electric and magnetic energies are inducing uh, each other. Uh, also, what is very important here is to notice that the magnetic energy is inversely proportional to the zeta bewegung radius. So we can say that the uh, zeta bewegung radius is inversely proportional to the particle mass and also inversely proportional to particle frequency. And this uh, inverse proportionality will be important uh, a bit later. Uh, now this, uh, 
reduce quantum radius that we have just calculated. It also matches experiments in the low frequency limit. So the low frequency light scattering experiments is the so-called Thomson limit. And uh, via the Thomson scattering experiments, uh, physicists can measure this 386 femtometer reduced quantum radius as the size from which the light is actually scattering. This is uh, coming from the Thomson formula. So it means that at the low frequency limit, uh, the light does not resolve anymore the actual charge of the electron, but it sees this whole Zeta-Bewegung structure and it scatters from the whole structure. So I think we have all the pieces of the puzzle coming uh, nicely together. Uh, between experiment and the Bewegung theory. Uh, now, next question, what happens when we look at this electron Zeta Bewegung from a moving reference frame? So, from a, so we apply a Lorentz uh, boost. Uh, well, if we look at the static electron in its rest frame, then in the rest frame, we have the electron wave being spread out according to Heisenberg uncertainty. So we can think of this um, uh, rest frame as being this kind of a, uh, cylindrical wave where we have a circulation but spread out on this uh, cylinder. So if you look at the same thing from a, a boosted reference frame, then uh, firstly we have to apply the uh, uh, transversal uh, Doppler effect. And the uh, transversal Doppler effect is uh, going to shrink the electron by uh, gamma L along the X and Y uh, axis. So this is just a, a Doppler effect based con contraction of the uh, electromagnetic wave. Other effect we have is the well-known Lorentz contraction that shrinks the electron by gamma L along the boost axis. So if we take these two effects together, then we see that the electron size is shrinking by uh, gamma L, this Lorentz boost vector, uh, uniformly in all direction. So if we look at the electron from a boosted reference frame, then this spherical uh, charge still remains spherical, but it is uh, shrinking by the gamma L factor. And uh, here you can see this um, graphic illustration of the uh, electron Zeta Bewegung from various boost frames. So it has the largest Zeta Bewegung radius, this 386 um, uh, femtometer in its rest frame. And the more you look at a fast electron, the more uh, its uh, spiraling motion becomes similar to a straight line. It is shrinks and the electron charge also shrinks. So, so this uh, explains why in accelerator experiments, when they boost electron to giga electron volt speeds, electron really appears like a tiny, tiny particle, almost like a point, of course, because uh, it's just um, uh, Lorentz contraction and Doppler effect, it shrinks the whole electron structure to more and more uh, tiny scale. And as it shrinks, its mass grows uh, accordingly by relativistic effect. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, remember that the uh, shrinkage of the Zeta Bewegung radius is by gamma L factor and mass is inversely proportional to the Zeta Bewegung radius. So we have this uh, formula by writing out the uh, gamma L factor that uh, is the relativistic mass increase. So we obtain uh, Einstein's uh, relativistic mass formula uh, simply from the Lorentz uh, boost uh, transformation. Uh, very straightforward uh, effect of why the relativistic mass of particles increase. All right, now let's talk about the uh, anomalous uh, magnetic moment. Uh, so this has been a, a big deal in uh, 20th century physics to uh, calculate and consider uh, the anomalous magnetic moment uh, as precisely as possible. And this we can also get from relativistic considerations. Uh, let's start from the uh, formula of the magnetic moment. Uh, here you can see that the magnetic moment is uh, electron charge times H bar divided by two times mass of electron. Uh, in this formula, the only non-constant factor is the electron mass. 
And since we already know from previous slides that electromass is derived from electromagnetic induction, then an excess value of electromagnetic uh, of magnetic moment indicates incomplete induction, right? So if this uh, mass comes from induction, if the uh, induction is incomplete, then the mass is incomplete and that increases this magnetic uh, moment. So, so now, uh, as Alvaro said, we have to take time retardation into account and the relativistic uh, limits. So as the electron uh, completes one Zitterbewegung loop, what is the uh, spatial volume uh, from which the uh, electric field information can propagate for the induction? Well, we have uh, the spatial volume, uh, which is a sphere with a radius where the radius is two pi uh, times the uh, Zitterbewegung radius. Right, so the circumference of the Zitterbewegung, when it is at light speed, defines this radius uh, from which the information can propagate during the time that electron takes one loop. Okay, so so once again, uh, when the electron does a light speed loop, uh, during that time the information can come from this uh, special uh, sphere uh, for the electromagnetic uh, induction. And, and that means that uh, for one magnetic loop, the corresponding electric energy that takes part in the induction is not integrated uh, from R0 to infinity, but actually in one loop, the induction is integrated only out to this two pi R uh, radius. So this is, um, uh, this is then the effective uh, electric energy that takes part in the induction during one loop. And uh, the ratio of this effective energy and the total electric energy uh, gives then this uh, mass defect that gives the anomalous uh, magnetic moment. And when you take the ratio of these two formulas, then, then you, uh, you get the result that is one minus uh, the uh, electron uh, charge radius over two pi the Zitterbewegung radius. Uh, so then we have uh, this uh, uh, formula as the result for a G factor just uh, by, uh, by taking the inverse of it for the magnetic uh, moment access. Uh, by the way, I should note that uh, in my G has a factor of two difference uh, with respect to the Yarex G, but this is just a matter of definition if we take the factor of half here or not. Uh, all right, but, but the key point is that uh, uh, we have a very simple relativistic consideration that uh, tells us what the anomalous magnetic moment is. And uh, to the uh, in the Taylor series, the first term uh, uh, is then alpha over two pi. So it's one plus alpha over two pi as the first approximation in the Taylor series. And uh, uh, this is uh, Schwinger's formula, uh, this well-known value. And uh, now we compare experimental data with this calculated data, and we see that uh, we got the six digits uh, accuracy. Uh, I would like to talk uh, a few words to contrast our results to the mainstream uh, quantum electrodynamics results. And I use a strong word here, uh, uh, but, but I think uh, this word that I use, the pseudoscience word is justified. So if you look at the history in uh, 1948, uh, Julian Schwinger gave a four hour lecture where he claimed to derive this uh, one plus alpha over two pi uh, parameter. Uh, now, uh, what did the audience say after two hours? Here we have a quote from uh, somebody in the audience saying, we were all very tired and none of us felt we had understood what Schwinger had done. Uh, so nevertheless, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for the calculation which nobody understood and which did not predict anything because it was already experimentally known. Uh, now, later, uh, Schwinger wanted to calculate the other uh, higher order terms because he suspected that this is just the first term on, in the Taylor series. And then he uh, devoted 60 pages of his Particle Sources and Fields book 
uh, to a detailed calculation to the next order. And this is his result for the second order term. Now I can say with certainty that uh, these 60 pages of calculation wrong uh, because um, uh, the alpha squared order term is zero. And uh, now I don't have time to explain why it is zero, but it comes out from this very simple relativistic consideration that I explained. So later, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, contact me uh, and I can I can explain you why the alpha square order term is zero. So, uh, so the reason why I bring up this issue is that when uh, in the past I have been consulting some experts, I wanted to double check, am I doing the right way? Uh, no, electromagnetics experts have been, the ones I talked to have been quite dismissive. They said that, oh, my one page calculation is just six digit accurate, but quantum electrodynamics is 10 digit accurate. Well, I think we have a good reason to be very skeptical about this 10 digit accuracy of the 60 pages. Now, but if we, uh, once we know that the alpha square term is zero, uh, a very interesting exercise is to consider the alpha cube term. And uh, here, if we compare you know, our calculation that I showed before to the experimental value, then uh, we can get uh, the estimation of the alpha cube difference. And we have this very interesting um, uh, phenomenological numbers that for the electron, the alpha cube uh, uh, term is minus eight pi over three, and for the muon, the alpha cube term is plus eight pi over three. And uh, it's, it's very obvious if you look at this uh, comparison of the experimental and theoretical number that the alpha cube term has some very uh, straightforward geometric meaning. It's related to the volume of a sphere. I don't know yet how to derive it, but, uh, but I think these, these numbers, they are, they are shouting that, okay, this is the, this is the way to go, this geometric uh, consideration. Now, uh, another point why I bring up the muon, uh, you remember that the magnetic, that the mass is proportional to the one over Zeta-Bewegung radius. So if the mass of the particle increases, the Zeta-Bewegung radius of the particle shrinks, and that means that the magnetic moment also shrinks. And uh, this difference between electron and muon is in the alpha cube term. So it means that as a first approximation, the muon is only a shrunken version of the electron. And that means that the muon's internal structure is the same as in the electron case. So this uh, magnetic uh, moment consideration is a very good uh, first test whether a heavy particle has same or different structure than electron. And uh, that leads us to consider the proton. So, so let's, uh, uh, let's uh, try to think uh, what we can see about the, the proton uh, structure. So we characterize the electron by two numbers, its spherical charge radius and its zeta bewegung radius. And the uh, question, what would be these numbers for the proton? And uh, again, we can look at the experiment as before. The quantum uh, scattering uh, tells us what is uh, the spherical charge radius of the proton. But uh, in the proton case, the quantum scattering has to be done at uh, giga electron volt uh, scale energy which is not a garage experiment, but it has been done. And here you can see the uh, experimental curve. And uh, it's not as uh, straight as in the electron case because um, in the proton case, uh, there are other processes that interfere such as this uh, pion production peak. Uh, but despite the interference of this particle production peaks, uh, we can match these uh, various edges of this curve. And from the uh, matching around 200 MeV and 1,200 MeV, we can get a good estimation for the uh, spherical charge reduced from quantum scattering. And the uh, fit with this experimental curve tells us that, that the proton's spherical charge reduced is 0 0.0015 uh, femtometer. And uh, you can, see that, for example, if you would multiply it by three, if you would assume uh, 0 0.005, uh, 
then it would be already uh, way higher than the experimental energy at this uh, around 200 mega electron volt. So, so this um, is actually very sensitive. The quantum scattering is very sensitive to the uh, uh, radius of the particle. And this nice integration, I think, tells us quite precisely what the radius of the proton sphere is. Uh, the other parameter is the so-called proton radius that has been measured both by spectroscopic methods and uh, particle scattering. So here you have a, a sc scattering curve that tells you something about the distribution of the uh, proton's positive charge with respect to its uh, center. So this is from JLab uh, scattering experiments. So the mean is at 0 0.84 femtometers. It's uh, yeah, it's somewhere somewhere here. Uh, so it means that the zeta bewegung of the proton is in some kind of structure. We don't quite see what it is yet, but the mean zeta bewegung radius of the proton is uh, something uh, uh, like 0 0.84 femtometers, and this is uh, generally in the literature referred to as the proton radius. So we already have quite good um, approximation for these proton parameters. And uh, well, the first uh, big question, can we think of the proton as a, a scaled positron? Meaning, uh, is it like a positively charged electron, but heavy and, and scaled down? And uh, these are the numbers that would be uh, given by uh, scaling the uh, uh, electron mass 1,836 times, which is the electron proton mass ratio. Uh, so we would get a good match for the spherical charge radius, but uh, for the uh, zeta bewegung radius, a scaled uh, positron model would give 0 0.21 femtometer, and the magnetic moment would be one uh, nuclear magneton. So the nuclear magneton means the scaled positron value of the magnetic moment. Now the experimental data uh, is quite different. Instead of 0 0.21 femtometer radius, we get 0 0.84, and the proton magnetic moment is about three times higher than the nuclear magneton. And this uh, major mismatch tells us that uh, the proton is not quite a scaled positron. However, as an order of magnitude, we get the right numbers, but, but not quite right. So, so we are along the right track, but we have to adjust um, the electrons zeta bewegung. And um, now again, we turn to experiment to, to get inspiration. And there is an article I reference here uh, where uh, the authors measure the electromagnetic anapole uh, moment in a uh, cesium. And uh, the anapole moment is another word for toroidal magnetic moment. So uh, given that experiments indicate some kind of a toroidal magnetic moment inside the nucleon, then let's consider a toroidal zeta bewegung structure. In other words, the difference that myself and Giorgio Vassalo propose, actually it was Giorgio Vassalo's idea, is to consider the electron and proton zeta bewegung difference as a difference in a topology. So in the electron, you have a circular zeta bewegung, and in the proton, you have a, a toroidal uh, zeta bewegung structure. And these are then the uh, zeta bewegung parameters that we can calculate. The spherical charge radius uh, calculation is very straightforward. It's exactly the same method uh, as in the electron case that uh, uh, we just uh, integrate the electric field energy from this experimental charge radius down to infinity. And when we do that, uh, we obtain exactly half of the proton mass as expected. So this uh, electric field energy down to 0, 0, 0,0015 femtometer is representing exactly half of the proton mass. The calculation of the uh, a toroidal and poloidal radii is a bit more complicated than I will address in the next slides. But uh, it is interesting that uh, we can calculate these parameters uh, also in a quite straightforward way. And you can see here that we get a good match with experimental data. You remember that 
the experiments gave a 0 0.84 uh, uh, femtometer proton radius, and we have a 99% match from the calculation that I will explain in the next uh, slides with the experimental data. And uh, here is the magnetic moment. In, in my book, I calculated, but uh, for, for this presentation, I take it as an input uh, parameter because uh, I don't have time to explain how to calculate it, but this can also be calculated from this toroidal uh, model. So, so let's uh, then try to take a deeper look at this toroidal moment model, how to calculate these parameters. Uh, the first question about the toroidal Zitterbewegung model is uh, what would be the ratio of the electron, sorry, of the proton charges, uh, poloidal and uh, toroidal speed. So we have a toroidal loop and a poloidal loop, and uh, each of them has a speed which is different than the speed of light because we know that the speed of light is the uh, net speed of the charge but uh, each component is then somehow uh, less than the speed of light. Uh, now, one consideration I had to estimate what it is, is to consider that uh, the, the Zitterbewegung is such a phenomenon that no matter how you change the reference frame, you always see uh, light speed motion and uh, you should also always see the same topology. So it means that uh, no matter how we rotate our uh, reference frame, we should not see the proton as a different particle, but if we see a proton as a certain topology in its rest frame, then even in a rotated rest frame, we should still see the same uh, topology. And when you consider a, a rotated reference frame, then a rotated reference frame introduces the Thomas precession effect. And here you can see the difference between a, a speed in the lab frame and the uh, rotating frame when you take Thomas precession into account. And when you consider this Thomas precession formula, if the uh, lab frame speed is uh, uh, c over square root two, then it means that the rotated uh, speed, uh, sorry, the, uh, the uh, inherent speed is the speed of the light. So, so it means that uh, uh, no matter how much you try to rotate to catch up with this toroid or rotation, you will still get exactly uh, the same speed in any rotated reference frame. So, so I take poloidal and toroidal speed to be C over uh, square root two, because the Thomas precession effect tells us that um, with uh, this choice, uh, you get the same topology, no matter from which uh, reference frame you look at the proton. It's also a nice choice because then the uh, poloidal and toroidal ref uh, rotations are kind of on the same footing. So it's some kind of a symmetry between the two types of uh, Zitterbewegung. So another point is that if you consider the proton not in isolation, but for example, in a hydrogen atom, then uh, we know that the electron and the proton are orbiting around each other in a hydrogen atom. And the reason why we know they are orbiting around each other is because the Rydberg constant, uh, it depends on the proton mass. So it means that the proton and electron are actually moving around their uh, relative center of mass. So if you uh, think of a hydrogen atom, then the actual uh, uh, trace of the proton charge is uh, quite fancy because you have three different loops. You have the poloidal Zitterbewegung loop, you have the toroidal Zitterbewegung loop, and you have the Bohr orbit uh, loop. Uh, so you have uh, three kind of interlocking loops. It's you can see it's some kind of a nested structure, almost like a, a fractal. But um, what this slide um, tells you uh, is that it's uh, important to keep in mind that for each of these uh, loops, uh, you have a the same magnetic flux value. Uh, and I think this is an amazing result that when you look into the details, you can derive 
quite uh, quickly that uh, in each case, the magnetic flux is always H over E. Uh, for the Bohr orbit loop, this comes from the uh, continuity of the uh, phase of the quantum mechanical phase. And for the Zitterbewegung loops, this comes out from the Zitterbewegung model. You can check the calculations or ask me later. Uh, but uh, this is a very fundamental uh, uh, law in nature that whenever you see a, a stable uh, charge circulation that doesn't collapse on itself, a stable charge circulation in every uh, dimension is associated with exactly H over E value of the magnetic flux. And I think this uh, magnetic flux quantization is another way to look at charge quantization. And this is related, I think, already to Yarek's presentation. You can either ask um, why does elementary charge uh, have the value uh, E, or you can ask why does magnetic flux have the value of H over E. These are two equivalent ways to ask the question. Okay, so now uh, I have to speed up because I think I'm running out of time, but I'm almost uh, at the end. Uh, so in the previous slide, I already explained that the uh, magnetic moment uh, uh, is related to this uh, uh, deficit of the electromagnetic induction. So the uh, larger a magnetic moment is, the smaller the associated uh, induction mass is. So this uh, large uh, proton uh, magnetic moment, we can associate uh, with a, a smaller ratio of its toroidal magnetic mass. So the uh, total uh, magnetic mass of the proton, 469 MeV is half of the proton mass. And we divide it by the proton magnetic moment and um, uh, we get this toroidal mass. And the remaining part is then the poloidal mass. So we know the toroidal and poloidal uh, magnetic masses of the proton. And then we uh, equate these magnetic masses again with the flux and current formula. And for these uh, 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 static uh, loop formulas, we already know the magnetic uh, fluxes. As I told, it's the same for each loop. And we also know the toroidal and poloidal speeds uh, that I explained before. So actually, uh, the uh, the only unknown parameters here is the uh, Zitterbewegung radii of the toroidal and poloidal Zitterbewegung loop. So if you calculate it from these equations, then you get the 0 0.83 femtometer uh, toroidal uh, radius and 0 0.46 femtometer poloidal radius. And this is a quite straightforward method, and uh, we get the uh, uh, resulting uh, picture of the uh, of the proton. So in our model, the proton is then uh, this um, uh, toroidal uh, charge zitterbewegung, where we can exactly calculate the uh, toroidal and poroidal radii. Uh, this uh, last slide, uh, under a magnetic field, uh, we have a Larmor precession, but I don't have time to go into this. So this was, a Larmor precession was already explained by, by Yarek. So actually, when we uh, put in an external magnetic field a proton, then the half, half spin that we get is only a component of the complete uh, magnetic moment vector because of this uh, Larmor precession. And if you're interested uh, in further details, this is the uh, book uh, which uh, I co-authored with others about the electron Zitterbewegung. And another book uh, that uh, is about to be published uh, is about the proton Zitterbewegung, where I analyze in very much detail the proton and neutron uh, structures. And uh, you can, uh, in this book, get all of the references and exact uh, experimental data. Uh, I will send a message later when it will be published. So don't buy it yet because it will be coming out soon. And uh, this last slide I leave for the discussion. Uh, this is about these uh, questions that Yarek was asking. Uh, and um, as you can see from, from my presentation, I think that the particle mass is electromagnetic field energy. 
and uh, uh, the zitter bewegung process is electromagnetic induction, and we can go to the other uh, questions in the in the discussion later on. So thank you for the attention, and sorry to be a few minutes uh, too long. Thank you, thank you for, for a great, great talk. Uh, so, so could you briefly tell about the difference between proton and neutron in your view? Uh, yeah, yeah, it follows. Uh, it follows basically from the uh, proton zitter bewegung model because. Um, as you can see in this uh, proton Zeta-Bewegel model, the proton is an elementary particle. So, so we treat the proton as an elementary particle and have a very good match with experimental data this way. So it means that if the proton is an elementary particle and the neutron is a particle that spits out an electron after some time, then the neutron is a composite particle. So it means that you can see it illustrated in our book that the neutron is basically a proton plus a negative uh, elementary charge. So the neutron is a, is a composite particle. And the big question is how to understand the presence of the negative elementary charge inside the neutron. That's, that's what my book is about. Thank you very much. Um, any short questions, comments? Um, yeah. so, let's take it. May, may I ask about uh, your contraction of uh, your particles? I understand that they are contracted, Lorentz contracted in forward direction, but not. I do not understand why they are contracted in transversal direction. Oh, oh that's because of the uh, relativistic uh, Doppler shift. So, uh, so you you consider the uh, particle structure being an electromagnetic wave. And uh, every uh, wave is subject to the uh, Doppler effect. And this uh, relativistic uh, transversal Doppler effect is well known. Uh, it shrinks the uh, wave number of the wave by, by gamma L. So, so it actually is exactly the same factor as the Lorentz contraction, but acts in different direction. Yes, thank you. Yes, welcome. Thank you. So uh, maybe let's let's shift the discussion to to, to the discussion part. Uh, so uh, could you stop sharing and and uh, I think now uh, Dave. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Thank you. That was uh, that was quite interesting. May uh, let me crack open my Adobe Acrobat. Here we go. Yes, it's okay. All right, can everyone see this? Yes. All right. All right, thank you all for coming. I am, so I'm David Darrow. I'm a grad student at MIT and uh, studying under John Bush, uh, mostly doing the hydrodynamic work, you know, hydrodynamic quantum analogs with the walking droplet system. Here, I'm taking a slightly different tack, and I'm looking at, uh, well, you know, the walking droplet system gives qualitative analogs to a lot of quantum behaviors. Could we, could we take a step back and develop more general classical field theories inspired by the system to get quantitative matches to at least certain quantum behaviors? That's what we're doing here. And at least in this system, we recovered a fairly convincing, uh, rigorous version of at least a lot of key ideas of de Broglie's early theory. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so we will be developing a Lagrangian framework uh, with which to, to investigate these kinds of classical analogs of quantum mechanics. But I want to clarify that this is not an attempt at a theory of quantum mechanics. It's not an attempt to recover the vast majority of quantum behaviors. We're looking at a certain subset, and we're really looking at this as a jumping off point for further investigation. But it will have suggestive answers for at least a lot of the questions we've raised about zitter -Pythagum. So for instance, what is it? 
uh, what makes it happen? Uh, why does the frequency not change? What What's the situation with radiation? Uh, is the frequency proportional to mass? Uh, does the pilot wave itself have any of this mass? And, um, and well, so we won't be able to answer the question about the electrons case, but, but at least here, uh, what's the relation between particle and field mass? And finally, how do we get this E equals HF or E equals H bar omega? And equivalently, P equals P equals H bar K. Okay. So let's start off with Bohmian mechanics. Bohmian mechanics uh, takes the traditional Schrodinger interpreter, Schrodinger formulation of quantum mechanics and adds to it these deterministic trajectories where uh, on top of the traditional wave function, we also have this deterministic uh, position QP, we'll be using that notation throughout the talk, uh, evolving uh, just as a function of the overall wave function. So the wave function is prescribed by fiat effectively, and the position evolves based on that. Now, it's not hard to see that this keeps, uh, this keeps Born's rule intact. Uh, this follows just from uh, just from the conservation of probability in quantum mechanics. Okay, but if we uh, if we have these deterministic trajectories, what what are we doing here? Why um, why do we want anything different? One question here is: Bohmian mechanics does not allow particle to feel feedback. So we don't have a clear source for the Schrodinger wave. The dynamics of imposing the wave by fiat uh, and only then figuring out where the particles are going is uh, aesthetically unattractive, I might say. Uh, and it complicates our notion of particle measurement. Second question is, these trajectories are fairly strange, fairly strange objects are they the only things that give rise to quantum statistics? Uh, for instance, these Bohmian trajectories, if we want to view Zitterbewegung as a dynamical process of the particle, the, this is not captured by Bohmian mechanics. Uh, we also don't obviously recover a, a classical limit, except in certain cases where the wave function is Gaussian. Okay, so we'll we'll attack this from a different approach. Okay, and the different approach that we're working from, although I imagine many of you are familiar with uh, with this system, is the bouncing droplet system, uh, first experimentally realized, I believe, by Kuderan four about twenty years ago now. Uh, this this is a system wherein we vibrate a bath of silicon oil very quickly, but below a critical cutoff known as the Faraday frequency. And we uh, and we put a droplet of silicon oil on the top. Now, if we vibrate it fast enough, the droplet can't sink into the bath. Instead, it just keeps bouncing. But not only that, it can start moving in a certain direction. And if you take this whole apparatus and you send it towards, let's say, a double slit apparatus, you can get very convincing statistics on the other side of single droplet interference. Now, this analog has been brought in a variety of fun directions. As I mentioned, diffraction patterns, but also quantized orbitals. Uh, the quantum corral is a, is a very illustrative example where we get quantum-like statistics, Anderson localization, uh, but a variety of other examples as well. Okay, uh, but most of these are purely qualitative analogs. Could we could we do better even in certain cases? I'm going to argue yes. That's why I'm giving this talk. So, uh, to summarize what I'm about to go through, I'll first talk about John and colleagues' previous attempt at this sort of classical pilot wave theory. Uh, known as the hydrodynamic or hydrodynamically inspired quantum field theory from several years ago. 
Uh, I'll talk about our new Lagrangian framework, what it does differently. And then I'll go over all of the dynamics of the free particle and focus heavily on Zitterbewegung in the, in the interest of this mini conference. But we'll recover a few other very interesting dynamics as well. Okay, so this uh, HQFT theory uh, couples a Klein Gordon wave with a uh, with a first order particle dynamics. Now there are two key features that it that it imports from the hydrodynamic system. You know, looking to move the success of the walking droplets over to our more abstract case now. First, and this is the first thing we'll get rid of, is forced oscillations at a fixed frequency. In the droplet case, this is the forced oscillations with the vibration at the bath. Here, you can see this sine of 2 omega ct term uh, specifically oscillating the forcing term on the Klein-Gordon wave. This is the, th this is the cause of Zitterbewegung in the HQFT system. Now, the next thing, and the next thing we'll get rid of, actually, is this first-order particle dynamics. Uh, and this is um, this is familiar both from the hydrodynamic system, where drag uh, where, where drag uh, plays in and creates a first-order contribution to the particle dynamics, but also from Bohm's system, where the particle just explicitly follows a first-order dynamics. Uh, and in fact, this system gets a few critical results from the, from the double solution theory to Broy's early attempt at a pilot wave theory for, for quantum mechanics. And in fact, the, the theory in which de Broglie was able to recover his, uh, his famous de Broglie relations of P equals h bar omega and P equals h bar k. So for one, we get these inline oscillations over a de Broglie wavelength. This is the sort of Zitterbewegung that's given rise to in this HQFT system. Uh, we get P equals H bar K, now with a mean momentum, you know, over this Zitterbewegung process. Uh, we get an analog of the harmony of phases, where the internal vibration of the particle, that inline oscillation I was talking about, occurs at the same frequency in the drop's frame of reference, or in the particle's frame of reference, rather, as the underlying oscillation of the field. We also get a nice monochromatic wavefront at the de Broglie wavelength, although here you see we also have a signature of the, of the Compton wavelength. Yes, the de Broglie wavelength, uh, roughly marked out by these uh, colored strips, particle is surfing over this uh, this monochromatic wave and all the while emitting these Compton wavelength uh, yeah this Compton wavelength wake as it goes now on the other hand there are a few things I'd like to correct about HQFT and in fact have already corrected about HQFT that's why I'm here uh, for one it's not Lorentz invariant I used gentle language with uh, it isn't quite where it's invariant, but um, but we see the the velocity is incompatible with this gradient that we've uh, th that we've equalized it with. The gradient really is a space like quantity where the velocity is not. Uh, we also force this oscillation at a laboratory time. This would be easy to fix, you know, if we just replace that T with the proper time along the particle's trajectory. But we'll see we get better results if we don't try to fix that directly. Also, the, that Dirac measure, the delta cubed in the wave equation, is not Lorentz invariant. Once again, we could fix that with just an appropriate factor of gamma. But by being a little more careful, we can get better results. We can brush away all of these problems if we just start with a Lagrangian formulation. Of course, this is this is the trick that we take all the time in physics and uh, and even in quantum theory. Second problem that I have with it is the particle trajectories don't scale to classical trajectories. They scale to a sort of random walk, 
as h bar goes to zero, or as the scale of the system gets larger. You can see these pictured at the bottom right, that you perturb the particle a little bit, and it likes this p equals h bar k mean momentum, but it goes back and forth, and it, uh, it, it really does behave a little like a random walk. Also, the momentum is fixed by a system parameter. This, uh, so far as we know, is not what happens with real particles. They're not fixed at a at a certain velocity. Well, I mean, except for uh, massless ones, but that's not what we're talking about. As I mentioned, they don't move in straight lines. Okay, we can fix both of these problems by reintroducing inertia to the system. Again, we'll see that inertia falls out of our Lagrangian description. Now, the last problem is a slightly more subtle one, and it relates to the radiation behavior of this system. That as the particle moves, as you saw in the figure on the last slide, it keeps emitting this Compton wavelength radiation. And so if you imagine the particle moving towards a double slit apparatus, you know, because it's a point particle and not a quantum superposition, it's going to go through one slit and not the other. But if it keeps radiating that whole time, then that one slit is going to see a different amplitude of wave than the other slit. And, and this breaks that equality of paths that we see in quantum mechanics. We can fix this with, a, again, with a more subtle fix. Uh, if the particle radiates only proportional to its acceleration rather than it uh, rather than constant or constantly along its trajectory then you can imagine the particle coming up to a slit but it's already it's already radiated everything it's going to radiate it's just walking along this monochromatic wave waveform so it hits one slit the same wave wave front hits the other slit and we have that equality of paths this is the sort of behavior we'll see shortly. Okay, so moving on to our new framework. And this is this was published in Symmetry just this January. I can send a link to the paper. Okay, we'll start with this action. Now we have to be a little careful with this action because we're describing two different dimensions of things. You know, one point particle and one field in all of space. So we have to we have to add these Lagrangians to the level of actions rather than the level of Lagrangians. Now the 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 choice of scaling here that m squared in front of the field Lagrangian is just to make sure the field itself is dimensionless. Now here the key aspect is that the field and the particle are coupled with this parameter sigma. Everything else just describes a free particle and a free field. But this parameterizes all of the possible couplings we could give to the particle and the field and tells us, um, or and, and will give rise to a very rich family of different systems with a very rich variety of different quantum-like behaviors. Now, to make this rigorous, we actually need to isolate the continuous component of the field when we uh, feed it into sigma. But this is doable, and we can do it without damaging the Euler Lagrange equations. So I won't go into more detail on this. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I did not catch that. Okay. Uh, no worries, no worries. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, gives rise to a very rich family of systems. We're going to be focusing on one of them in the interest of discussing Zitterbewegum. This limit that we're interested in has the field as just a real field, and the particle will be reacting to the gradient of this field. Okay, so... This is all parameterized by this positive coupling parameter B, this positive real coupling parameter B, and to a very good approximation, about uh, a one percent relative error in the uh, in in the whole parameter space we're looking at, 
we can view it as obeying these equations. So here we get uh, we get the symmetric coupling of B, both from particle to wave and from wave to particle. Uh, you see that we get a second order equation for uh, for the particle dynamics themselves, and we don't have any time dependent forcing on the wave. Okay, so what's what's the point of this new framework? What does it accomplish? And what will it help us study? So for one, it fixes all of the problems I just outlined with HQFT. It is Lorentz invariant, you know, within the approximation that I described last slide. It does scale to classical mechanics as H bar goes to zero, even if there's an external force, but that's not something I'm going to expand upon in this slide or in the slide deck. It does not involve time dependent forcing. Uh, but even still, it formalizes a lot of the ideas that de Broglie thought were necessary in his double solution theory. And we'll see that it gives us kind of a platform with which to study this kind of double solution theory. So for one, we will get an emergent Zitterbewegung, even though we don't force one. And this will be at the, the redshifted Compton frequency. We'll see where the redshift comes in shortly. Uh, we get a harmony of phases and a much more general one than we saw in HQFT. So regardless of the particle's speed, regardless of the particle's momentum, uh, the combined wave particle system always has the property that at the particle's position in its frame of reference, it is oscillating in, in lockstep with the wave below it, even after, uh, even after an arbitrary acceleration. And to go along with that, we get P equals H bar K and E equals H bar omega at the particle's position. Again, even after an acceleration. Now, the, the last bit of de Broglie's double solution theory, which he never really formalized, was the need for some kind of Compton scale wave packet that coupled the particle to the field below it. Here, we get exactly that behavior. We get a content scale wave packet, a very robust one that follows the particle regardless of how it's turning. Uh, and we'll see that it influences the particle's inertial mass. The, the particle behaves as if it has a much higher inertial mass than it's supposed to given the equations we just outlined. Uh, and the flip side of this is that if we view it just as a dynamical system and, uh, and strip the quantum mechanics away, it exhibits a lot of very interesting novel features that uh, that we have not seen in other pilot wave systems before. Okay. So starting actually with the last point I brought up, let's look at the local wave packet. We can recover that by solving the time independent Klein Gordon equation. It just reduces to a Helmholtz equation and uh, and we can get we get exactly this solution. If the particle was not moving, then in 3D, we get this kind of Yukawa potential proportional to B over M. In 2D, we get this Bessel function, uh, this Bessel function kind of solution. And we won't give more attention to 2D here, although all of my simulations will be done in 2D. We can recover constant velocity solutions at, at any mean velocity or, or any constant walking velocity just by Lorentz boosting these guys. So they all look the same up to space contraction. Now, instantaneously, this tells us quite a lot about the particle's behavior. Instantaneously, we always get this Yukawa wave packet surrounding the particle, along with whatever other field is below the particle. And that other field will be uh, will be given by radiative behavior and is not captured by our time independent solution above. We can see signatures of both of these things in the picture I am showing here. The content scale wave packet is exactly this bright yellow circle around the particle. And the radiation field is, and we'll see where the de Broglie wavelength comes in, but the radiation field is everything else. So there's a very nice breakdown. 
So how does radiation occur? Here, radiation only, only occurs when the particle accelerates. Now, this is something we can deduce again from our analysis on the previous page, that if the particle is moving at a constant speed, we only have the wave packet. All of the energy the particle is putting into the system gets eaten up by this Yukawa wave packet until it accelerates. And when it does accelerate, very interesting thing happens. We get a very fast momentum exchange between the particle, the wave packet, and the radiation field below it. Uh, and all of that occurs within a Compton time scale. So we get a, a near point source of radiation where a, a collection of wave numbers, a spherically symmetric collection of wave numbers, if starting from rest, is excited in the wave and starts moving outwards. Now, to a good approximation, those wave numbers are bounded above by the particle momentum. And we'll see, we'll see where that comes in very shortly. So the takeaway is if we accelerate from rest, the particle surfs on this near, nearly planar wave front. It only radiates when it accelerates. And after that point, we get this expanding spherical wave front, which becomes more and more planar as the particle moves. And this is the characteristic dynamic of this system. Okay, we can do the same experiments though to see how much energy is actually stored in that in that wave packet I mentioned a few slides ago. Pretend we start the particle from rest, we kick it with a total momentum, and then after a while we record how much momentum the particle still has. If we do that, we get these curves for different values of B, where, um, where the total momentum along the bottom axis is how much momentum we kick the particle with, and along the left axis is how much momentum the particle still has after a time. So there, there are two states of this momentum transfer. First, on the left side of this plot, we see that the particle loses a ton of momentum. And this is because of radiation behavior. If we kick it only a small amount, it radiates more. Or if the coupling is larger. Otherwise, if we kick it a large amount, the wave packet immediately surrounding the particle needs more and more, more and more momentum to uh, actually get going. And the particle is not able to radiate as much as it as much as it does with these small kicks. So looking at the low radiation or uh, high kick limit, we can recover the momentum fraction actually stored within the wave packet. So more or less when, when U increases as we go to the right of this plot, it reaches this plateau, which records the momentum fraction between the point particle and the wave packet around it. Now, the difference between those two is proportional to B squared, and that's something that we can recover from Nuther's theorem, which is expanded upon in, in our paper. In short, the local wave packet just increases the particle's inertial mass. It increases the particle's inertial response to exterior forces and it increases it specifically to this total effective mass. Uh, again, regardless of what the particle's velocity is, as we'll see shortly. Okay, so moving on to Zitterbewegung, because I know that's a key point of interest here. Zitterbewegung here uh, occurs after the acceleration and when the particle is surfing on that radiating wave field. As it surfs, the wave field keeps uh, keeps hitting the particle. It keeps splashing over the particle uh, with these uh, with these peaks moving at the phase speed of the wave. And so we can record the momentum exchange or the energy exchange equivalently. Although this plot here is momentum exchange between the point particle and the field below it. So as you can't clearly see, but the plot on the next slide will uh, will clear, clarify the situation for you. These momentum exchanges occur monochromatically 
at the red shifted Compton frequency, gamma inverse omega C. Now, this happens regardless of the dynamics, as we can see here. Regardless of the coupling constant and regardless of the amount we accelerate the particle, we get a very good match to gamma inverse omega. Now, gamma inverse, again, uh, corresponds to the steady state velocity the particle is moving at. Corresponds to the particle's current velocity, not anything about what the particle was doing before the acceleration. This is a version of de Broglie's harmony of phases, uh, where, uh, where the particle oscillates at gamma inverse omega, the field oscillates at gamma omega, and when you I look at the particle's <laughs> frame of reference, the two align <laughs> perfectly. Okay, so we can rationalize this Zerbevegon by looking at the field radiation behavior. Uh, Recall the Klein-Gordon dispersion relation in a uh, dimensionless context. It's omega squared equals m squared plus k squared. This uh, should look familiar as the relativistic energy formula, you know, e squared equals m squared plus p squared. We can recover the group velocity of this guy. And the group velocity is wave number over square root m squared plus k squared. If we now match that up with a particle steady state velocity u, you know, again, the steady state velocity is moving at after the acceleration we just imparted, we recover p equals h bar k and e equals h bar omega for the particle as compared to the field immediately below. This is very close to how de Broglie actually originally derived these expressions. So in short, the field at the particle's position is quasi-monochromatic at the de Broglie wave number and, uh, and the uh, blue shifted here, actually, Compton frequency, gamma omega. But getting back to Zitter Bewegung, the field isn't constant at the particle's position, even though it has a constant wave number. This is because the Klein-Gordon wave is a dispersive wave. The group velocity is distinct from its phase velocity. So even as a given wave number is moving along at a certain group velocity, you know, the group velocity corresponding to the particle's velocity, uh, it's still oscillating. And it's oscillating fast. Uh, specifically, it's oscillating at this phase speed, omega over k. This is distinct from d omega dk, which we used on the previous slide. And this is c squared over u, where u is the particle's steady state velocity. So this is far faster than the particle is actually moving. So we can, we can go further. We can calculate how quickly these wave crests keep hitting the particle by taking the relative speed of the particle and the wave crests and multiplying them by the local wave number. And we recover exactly this gamma inverse omega c. This is the Zitter Bewegung we saw. So we can rationalize the Zitter Bewegung. The Zitter Bewegung is caused by the de Broglie waves washing over the particle repeatedly. You know, because they're dispersive, they have this high phase speed such that they keep hitting the particle, even though the wave number at the particle's position remains constant. Okay, we can have a lot more fun with this, though, if we apply a Lorentz transformation. For one, if the particle is moving at a steady state u, a steady state velocity u, or u naught, and we kick it into a steady state velocity u1, then instead of that radially symmetric wave front that it was putting out before, we get a spreading elliptic wave front, traveling, still traveling, at a velocity close to u naught. Now, this velocity is, uh, or, or geometrically, I'll say, this wavefront is centered along the extrapolated original trajectory of the particle before we kicked it into u1. Now, the waves at the particle's position still satisfy p equals h bar k. This is with p1, the new momentum. 
and E1 equals h bar omega. And the particle still vibrates at the frequency gamma inverse omega c. So we still get this Zitterbewegung, we still get the de Broglie relations, and we still get this very interesting geometric kind of radiation. All the while, we still have that wave packet that I was talking about, which still increases the particle's mass to this effective mass, mf, regardless of the particle dynamics. Okay, so that's all for the free particle. What about if we put the particle in a bounded domain? Let's, uh, let's look a little bit at a periodic domain where the particle starts in the center and then just goes around in circles. When it travels around this periodic domain, we get two distinct effects. First, before, uh, before waves have time to go around the full extent of the domain, the particle just travels with the plane wave we were talking about. It, it thinks it's a free particle and it oscillates at the red shifted Compton frequency as expected for the free particle case. After a bit though, the particle reaches far enough that its waves are able to circulate all around the domain. Uh, or in, in other language, waves come in from the particle's periodic images. And all sorts of frequencies are excited between gamma inverse and gamma times omega c. This is exactly what we see in the uh, and the spectrogram above, we see for a short time before about 50 Compton periods, uh, we just get this very sharp peak at uh, gamma inverse times the Compton frequency. And then we excite all of these frequencies going forward. Now, as, as a point of note, this is why we're able to say that the particle approximately only excites wave numbers below its own, uh, below its own momentum. If the particle, or when the particle moves from velocity zero to velocity V, if it excited a lot of wave numbers outside of that, outside of that ball, we would get a lot of excitation outside of these two bounding lines. And we don't see that. Okay, so this is the general picture of Zitterbewegung because in this periodic domain or in any bounded domain, we don't have to have just inline oscillations. Here, uh, this is uh, this is a relatively short block of time that the particle is moving, and a uh, I suppose a high pass uh, a high pass filter of the particle's trajectory about this. Uh, this mean trajectory in black, the particle is very quickly circulating around it in all directions. These again are excited by the waves washing over the particle from different directions. Now, if we play out the analysis, we actually get a dynamical uncertainty principle that, uh, that guides these zitter effects. Now, the dynamical uncertainty principle says that in any direction, the uh, standard deviation of position times the standard deviation of momentum in the same direction is greater than uh, h bar over two times some function of b. Now for sufficiently large b, which looks to be unfortunately slightly out of the range of our approximation, but for b close to 130, 150, uh, this reduces to an exact Heisenberg uncertainty principle albeit a dynamical version corresponding to deterministic particle trajectories rather than properties of, of waves. Okay, so looking ahead at other things we'll do, uh, because we've got a few papers in the docket, all of this so far has been the amplitude modulated coupling is what, we've, what we're calling it where the particle responds to the gradient of the real wave value. Uh, we, uh, we've also shown separately that this system gives rise to very close approximations to the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern in a wide range of single and double slit experiments. 
and uh, not a best fit Fraunhofer, but a Fraunhofer corresponding to the true de Broglie wavelength, or a version of the de Broglie wavelength scaled by b squared over a uh, over a given constant, which again predicts exact exact Fraunhofer diffraction for a certain value of b. Again, between 130 and 150, it looks like. But moreover, we can look at what deterministic dynamics uh, can give rise to these kinds of diffraction behaviors because we have this entire deterministic system. You know, the particle enters the slit in a straight line. Something happens for a very short period of time, and then it leaves the slit moving in a straight line. So we can look at what kinds of very classical looking diffraction experiments can give rise to these quantum length statistics. In a different direction, we also study a frequency modulated version of the particle wave coupling, where instead of responding to a real wave value, it responds to a gradient of the wave's complex phase. In that case, if you take the non-relativistic limit, you can show that the wave and particle dynamics reduce exactly the Bohmian mechanics. And not only that, um, not only that, but you can get a very nice objective collapse model out of this. So to do that, we introduce this abstracted model of a, uh, of a position measurement where we take our full domain, we split it into these open regions and we couple a heat sink to each one. Okay. If coupled for a short time, then we get exactly the wave function collapse to its projection in the region containing the particle. Now, the amount of time is proportional to the Compton, uh, the top, sorry, the Compton time scale, and also proportional to a uh, strength parameter of this heat sink. If coupled for a longer time, corresponding to a De Broglie time scale the wave function just reduces to its ground state as expected by uh, quantum statistics. Okay, to recap, our model provides a rigorous formulation of at least a lot of de Broglie's early ideas as double solution theory and a very strong platform with which to investigate other classical quantum analogs. It also naturally answers a lot of the questions raised in this mini conference. For one, what is Zitterbewegung? In this model, it is a periodic vibration of the particle about a mean rectilinear trajectory where the particle and the field are oscillating energy between them and momentum. What propels it? Why is it energetically favorable? In this model, Zitterbewegung is caused by these de Broglie waves. Remember the quasi-monochromatic de Broglie waves washing over the particle uh, because the Klein-Gordon uh, Klein -Gordon system is dispersive. The phase velocity differs from the group velocity, and this causes this repeated washing over the particle with these de Broglie waves. It is not a ground state. It is a wave-induced transient process every time the particle accelerates. So the vibration amplitude does slowly decay to zero for a free particle. But again, if it accelerates again, it starts vibrating exactly the same way. Why constant, or why constant frequency? Constant frequency corresponds to the constant velocity of the particle. Uh, this is because the particle travels at the same speed as these de Broglie waves. It does radiate energy, but the energy only serves to kill the amplitude of the Zitterbewegung itself. Okay, does it have frequency proportional to mass? Yes, that's because the wave field and the particle have the same mass in our model. So the dispersion relation for the wave field is exactly the same as the energy relation for, for the particle. And the, and the two are aligned for the right waves. Does it have energy density? Yes, although this is something I did not get into a whole lot in this talk. 
uh, the pilot wave does carry an energy density, which can be deduced from the Lagrangian framework. We've uh, proven a version of Noether's theorem for pilot wave systems that uh, that we apply to um, to theoretically predict a lot of the dynamics that we see here. Uh, but not only that energy density, we can see that the local wave packet about the particle contains an energy that looks just like a particle mass. That's the effective mass minus the point mass times gamma c squared. And this wave energy just increases the particle's inertial mass. Now, finally, y e equals hf. This follows from the uh, from the dispersion relation of Klein Gordon waves. We get both E equals h bar omega and P equals h bar k. And this happens anytime a particle moves at the same velocity as the group velocity of a Klein Gordon wave. This holds in our system because of the point source like radiation that happens every time the particle accelerates. All right. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. You had a bit, a bit late, so I, I have just one uh, remark that, that you have shown an energy density which has positive energy contribution from 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 the from from your uh, uh, <clears throat> so 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 that was my my uh, problem that 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 still in your model the the cost energy usually the Lagrangian mechanics go to the lowest energy state, but while the Rotation costs you energy. If you go to two slides back, then, then you have the energy density. Uh, okay, this, so this energy density. So you can see that there is there is uh, derivative sign derivative square. So this positive energy contribution from the from the zero vagum. So so the naively the pendulum would like to stop minimizing the energy using this kind of energy. So that's the big problem. So so you need to explain yes. the one. Yeah. Yes. So in in this system. The zitter bewegung is a transient process. It happens while something else is pushing the particle. It's okay. it's really a, a if you will, a, a resonant mode of the particle that it really likes to get into, but um, but it only happens when something is exciting it. That said, it, the same thing happens regardless of what's exciting it. So it's uh, so it's not a ground state. Uh, certainly, in in this case the uh, the waves pushing the particle or the, or the waves washing over the particle do carry a non-zero energy. Um, but this is only because they're traveling waves and the particle is a traveling particle. So so we see it, at least in this model, as a natural resonance of the particle, but not a ground state. Thank you. So, 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 so that, that's my point. So, so you are using external uh, energy source. Uh, and the question is, so in real physics, is it external energy source or maybe inside electrons? So, so that's, I think there are two options, basic, and there's a big question to, to distinguish them. And yeah. Yes, yes. And, and this at least puts it as an internal response to an arbitrary external source. Okay, thank you. So there are, uh, oh, sure. Oh, uh, thank you so much for the for the inspiring talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I am wondering if um, what's the physical nature between this particle field coupling? Yes. Uh, so here, let me move to a. Uh... Okay. So, in terms of the physical nature. Uh, we can deduce some of that from our Lagrangian principle, that this sigma really, uh, really tells us how the inertial mass of the particle is supposed to respond to, uh, to a certain value of the field. And, and I would say that that's probably the, the best way to view that in this framework, that the coupling is, uh, the coupling is how does the particle's inertial mass respond to the field? So you don't have any physical motivation to uh, to give this form? The motivation for this particular form is 
largely, well, I would say part of it is an aesthetic one, that there is, uh, well, I would say uh, part of it is both aesthetic and out of mathematical convenience, that there are relatively relatively few forms you can give a scalar relativistic wave, and the Klein-Gordon captures a lot of those. Now, the sigma parameter uh, is about as general as we could possibly take this kind of coupling. And so, um, so I would say that the motivation on that front is uh, is really born out of wanting to explore as wide a variety of these possible systems as we can in one go. Okay, so thank for you. For example, could, could an electromagnetic field follow this, assuming a mass like we have seen in the other presentations? So we, we could certainly couple it to an electromagnetic field. Um, the trouble with an electromagnetic field is that it moves at the speed of light. Uh, and this kills a lot of the resonant dynamics that we see here between the particle and the wave. And a lot of the magic of this formalism is that the wave is able to move at the same velocity as the particle. And so the particle is able to surf over this P equals H bar K wave, where, uh, where with electromagnetism, the wave would escape the particle as soon as the particle tried to accelerate. For instance, this is why electrons do not give rise to all of the same dynamics we just described here at the level of classical electromagnetism. Now, oh. certainly a, a caveat to that is that we could look at classical electrodynamics mm -hmm. in a uh, in a non-trivial medium, and, and that could have, um, you know, if if we're able to toy with the wave properties in that fashion, we might be able to recover uh, other interesting analogs of quantum mechanics. I have one question. Hello. Oh, could friends. we move the questions to the general general questions afterwards so that I can present my presentation, please? All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you, and I'll uh, I'll be happy to I'll be happy to answer uh, any more questions afterwards. Sorry for taking up more time. Thank you. Okay. Um, share screen. Also, we can continue discussion in the, the chat. Uh, it's another option, and there, there will be discussion after after the unknown talk. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you, you're all seeing my title yes, screen. Yes, okay. um, good afternoon, and thank you, Jarek, for organizing this. Just as a quickly, I explore reality using principles of Brouwer's constructive mathematics. My philosophy and aim is to produce descriptions of reality that allow pictorial representations. Also, I believe that the universe is just a wave, or rather, the superposition of many waves. Um, wait, uh, um, let's start by con considering three fundamental questions at the heart of physics. What mathematical description underpin Newton's first law? How do we describe momentum other than by the product of mass and velocity? And what gives rise to Planck's energy frequency relationship E equals, F, e equals HF? Think about it. You have no answers. I believe the answers converge on a deeper understanding of waves through the wave equation, which I will demonstrate. And then to remain within the aims of this conference, I will present a novel mathematical representation of particle wave duality, the Broglie's matter wave, and introduce a new concept of Zitterfelder or jiggling fields. In doing so, the three questions will also be answered. We all know Maxwell equations in vacuum predict electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic waves, providing us with the wave equation uh, of the electric and magnetic fields. 
Traditionally, the electromagnetic plane wave, while powerful, leave us gaps in our quantum phenom phenomena explanations. Despite their elegance, electromagnetic plane waves fail to account for light's particle nature, quantum spin, energy quantization, among other issues. The de Allenberg wave equation is foundational to our standing, understanding wave phenomena. However, de Allenberg's ansatz to solve the equation dictate one-sided solutions. I propose a new ansatz. My approach is to solve the wave equation is to define a wave by the product of a position function and a time function g. And simultaneously, the wave is described by the square of these two functions. Uh, this is the how I get there. Let's skip that. Now, the new answer gives a novel solution to the, uh, the Allenberg wave equation, introducing rotary waves. We shed new light on waves and wave phenomena in a way never thought of before. Mapping this one-dimensional solution to three-dimensional space demonstrates a rotary, rotary wave akin to a one-bladed propeller rotating while traveling through space in a straight line. To fully grasp the novel solution to the wave equation within the context of Maxwell's electromagnetism, it is crucial to discover the purely mathematical foundations of Maxwell equations in vacuum, which lead to the model that Maxwell produced by unif unifying observations. Within this purely mathematical framework, we envision a three-dimensional space x, y, z, occupying the space of three discrete unitless vectors, phi, epsilon, and u, each distinguished by a scalar magnitude and a unit vector as a function of t. These vectors constitute the proposed wave structure sharing a common wave locality defined by the position vector p in reference to the origin of space x, y, z. The subsequent innovative step involves in interconnecting the vectors phi, epsilon, u by a set of three vector algebraic cross product equations. These equations create the linked relationship among phi epsilon u, which only become meaningful by defining p as the integral of u with respect to t. Next, I will show you that these equations serve as a purely mathematical foundation or a framework for Max Maxwell's work, and they are independent of observations by the likes of Faraday, Gauss, etc. The middle equation phi cross epsilon already reminds us of the pointing vector. And applying curl operations on the outer two equations lead us to the Maxwell equations after evaluating the triple products shown below. In this slide, I like to underscore how the dot product of the vector u and the gradient op operator nabla, when applied to the vector phi, simplifies to a partial derivative of phi with respect to t. This simplification occurs because defining p as an integral of u with respect to t inherently means that u is equivalent to the total, uh, derivative, uh, the total t derivative of p. Given that both p and u are functions solely of t, the partial derivative of p with respect to t naturally equates to u. Ultimately, we derive equations where the curl of epsilon is equal to the negative partial time, uh, t derivative of phi, and the curl of phi corresponds to the pos positive partial t derivative of epsilon. These relationships yield Maxwell-like equations. It is at this juncture that we can now proceed to assign units of our equations, grounding them into the physical realm, having illustrated the co competitive compatibility with Maxwell's framework. Um, I'd just like to pause here. Um, I have never seen, or basically the, uh, the equation set one is what I have developed, and it should be of enormous importance to the understanding of electromagnetism. But let's get to that. Uh, um, um, we can get to that later. You know, this, this soliton equation set also reveals the, 
this is the Soliton equation set, uh, the equation set one, uh, reveals a hierarchical structure culminating in, in the wave equation. But by the definition, any solution of one is a solution of three, but the solution satisfying three is not necessarily necessary a solution of one. Uh, it is important to highlight that Maxwell's model of electromagnetism derived from physical observation unknowingly rested on a purely mathematical framework, the Soliton equation set. This new framework offers a deeper understanding and opens door to new discoveries that extend beyond uh, the capabilities of Maxwell equations themselves. The solutions to the Soliton uh, equations are very simple to find, um, and they have one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional um, propagating path. The one-dimensional solution here uh, reminds of the earlier novel solution of the de Allenberg wave equation, slide 10, further giving support and validity to the direction of my research. Let's proceed with the one-dimensional solution. And regarding to the quantum mechanic uh, problems of the uh, plane of a plane wave, the rotary wave complements the plane wave uh, where one excels, the other fails. A rotary wave superposition, I'll start again, a rotary plane wave uh, super in superposition uh, with a, excuse me, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting lost with my script here. Uh, the rotary plane wave superposition seems to give explanation to quantum obs observations, including particle wave duality and explanation of co key coherent and incoherent sources. The key innovation for uh, defining particle wave duality is defining two components, an efficacy and a presence. Efficacy, the rotary wave, represents the locality of action, while the presence, the plane wave, embodies a potential field. I propose a new wave-based model uh, of matter, marrying efficacy and presence for a mathematical representation of particle wave duality. Visualizing this duality, or the, this dual, in context of a photon, we observe a model with a rotary wave, the central part here, um, and the plane wave exists in superposition, the plane wave now being the orange part here, perfectly encapsulating the essence of particle accompanied by pilot wave. Uh, this graphic illustrates the rotating wave structure and clarifies the nature of the origin of Zitterfelder. Moreover, it elucidates the distinction between, between macroscopic and quantum interactions. While macroscopic interactions are governed by averages, microscopic or quantum interactions are determined by specific states at precise instances in time, giving rise to the Zitter-Wechselwirkung, but much easier in English Jitter interactions, uh, for which we can only provide probabilistic estimates between a lower and an upper bound value. We now continue with a three-dimensional uh, wave structure. By integrating the path, um, uh, by integrating the velocity vector, we obtain the expression for a three-dimensional path P. When we plot it, it looks like this. So basically, we now got a Maxwellian wave of phi and epsilon tra uh, traveling along uh, this path. U is always uh, at the constant velocity C, and these equations show a curved path. We, uh, answering many of your problems or your um, statements where previously you just assumed something is circling, but you had no, uh, no uh, foundation to say why it should be circling or why it should take on a, a helixal, um, a 
toroidal um, helix. Um, further, uh, further um, um, here, the, uh, further, uh, a further pass uh, in here, the uh, periods, period, period, periodicity is one. Now, if I look at this equation, it reminds me very much of um, electron packing. You know, uh, th this would be the S orbit. Um, the next orbit, I think it's the D orbit, which is three. Okay, this one I drew here is actually seven, but, but it's five and that can all be scaled. Uh, I basically, I this at this point, we can have collisions. Therefore, by reducing the period, periodicity to a half, I get these orbits. There is no chance if I have two um, um, uh, waves on there that they will ever collide. They will always be on opposite ends. Here, I tend to illustrate the particle wave duality of a stationary three-dimensional soliton, incorporating the Zitterfelder as defined in slide uh, 20 earlier on, uh, which is uh, within the three-dimensional um, uh, wave structure. Basically, the, way, uh, the double line here represents the space X, Y, Z. In other words, R phi can represent a point, a circle, or a sphere. And the as this particle travels or, uh, or traverses the spheroidal curve, its field that it projects would uh, change, uh, jitter to and fro, as indicated here. With, when it's here, we'll have a field over here. If it's blue, we'll have that blue field over there. Next, I can combine or put into superposition uh, a one-dimensional and a three-dimensional solution, but that requires a three-dimensional complex space that is a six-dimensional space X, Y, Z, plus imaginary X, imaginary Y, and imaginary Z. The one-dimensional wave traverses real space, while the three-dimensional wave traverses imaginary space space, but the Pythagorean sum of the two velocities remains C, and uh, this structure provides an explanation for mass, which I actually um, show in this, in this paper here, uh, which you can download uh, simply w uh, or HMP on online dash uh, 1882. Um, this graphic represents an illustration, illustrating the union of a 1D and a 3D solution, providing a clear visualization. It provides a mathematical description of momentum, the 1D rotor, and simul simultaneously underpins the De Broglie pilot wave theory, the 1D plane wave that is attached to the moving particle here, the 3D wave is represented only by its path. In contemplating the observation of Gonoré, I propose considering the potential ex ex explanation provided by Zitterfelder that I propose here, rather by the traditional uh, cited Zitterbewegung. Zitterbewegung is a concept rooted more in theoretical assumption than in fundamental mathematics that I have presented here. Uh, also, in uh, 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 in, in Gonoré's paper, um, 80, he basically is not uh, measuring the uh, zeta bewegung of the electron, he's measuring the de Broglie wave, which is a separate part of the electron which would be indicated here. And finally, I would like to leave you with uh, citing Henry Poincaré, either everything in the universe would be of electromagnetic or origin, or this aspect, shared as it were by all physical phenomena, would be mere epiphenomenon, something due to our methods of measurement. 
In conclusion, ref reflecting on Poincaré's insight, we are reminded of the transformative potential in re-examining foundational principles. Thank you for your attention. I will try to answer your questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we have a lot of time. So, so please uh, co comment, uh, um, comment uh, or ask questions to this talk uh, or, or, or pre previous talks, if. So anybody is, uh, is so now, now the, 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 the talks are, are over. So now, now we are going to the discussion part. So yes, yeah, please uh, just unmute them. Uh, okay, can I just ask a, a question? If I go back to... Uh, uh, the speaker would like to ask a question about the talk. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can ask, I, I would like to ask a question um, to the academics listening to this talk. If I have um, the, the Maxwell equations here, why are the, the, my equations one not of interest to you? As I can now give you new solutions in the fields of electromagnetism that can um, uh, describe circular and spheroidal path. So, uh, this is what I, you know, it's, I know it's completely out, um, outside what you, uh, uh, what it is. But anyway, I see Andras Kovacs is asking a question. And Andres, you've got your hand raised. Uh, yes, yes, but I actually I have a question to to Yarek because now. Sure. Okay. Oh, okay, fine. Sure. Then we'll. Uh... Sure. So, um, if there are any questions to Anton, please please quick quick ask. If not, then we are going to the open discussion. Oh. So, um, is there any question to 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 Anton? I don't see. So, so please so let us go to the open discussion. So now we can we can let's start with try to discussion about about the talks and after after that open discussion maybe focus on the on the questions again so I think we can we should we should discuss the, the questions okay. answers okay so Anders, please 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 uh, okay yes yeah, so firstly uh, thank you Yarek for organizing the conference it has been very interesting all the presentations thank you for coming and uh, I yeah I I think that. Uh, this uh, program of uh, unifying uh, gravity and electromagnetism is very you know central to theoretical physics and i suspect that in a hundred or 200 years theoretical physicists may not talk anymore about electric and magnetic and field and gravity but it will be they will be talking about space-time curvature so i i have this suspicion that in the future the central object in physics will be maybe space-time curvature and uh, and so it's important to get this right. Now you presented one approach, and uh, I am aware of uh, uh, two other interesting approaches for uh, uh, this kind of uh, unification of electromagnetism and gravity. One is David Hestenes, whose name was mentioned in this conference. He is recently working on that topic. And the other is uh, Paul O'Hara, uh, who is a co-author in our book. And uh, these are three different approaches, and all three have you know, very interesting aspects. So the question uh, to you is that um, uh, what is your plan or method, uh, how to uh, you know, reconcile uh, also other people's work who work on this field to have some kind of a unified view on, on this? Uh, um Okay, okay, so so maybe it's a bit uh, out of the scope, but yes. maybe very very briefly uh, response also. So generally, I I use this uh, gravity electromagnetic uh, approach, so which which is just second set, set of Maxwell equations you probably know. So the, it was proposed a bit earlier than Einstein, it was in eighteen ninety four something like that. Uh, so so this is so so to, to get to, to, we, we introduce magnetism to to make. Uh, 
Coulomb Lorentz, Lorentz invariant, and you can do the same for gravity. So the, the main difference is that the, this minus and, and the constants, but but you, you and and the gravity probe beam, the, the best confirmation is in fact was confirming the, the, this gravity uh, magnetism, this first order correction required for the Lorentz, Lorentz invariant. So this is what, what I'm targeting. So this is a bit slightly different. There is no uh, curvature of the space time. You have flat space time, only curvature of the space. As the as the subspaces of the of the uh, of the constant constant time, so so I only uh, so so uh, my vacuum uh, the what what's what is dynamic is 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 so I accept is s s two just rotations lead to elect yeah. electromagnetism as 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 my also model then and then to s s two I got s s three that means I recognize the twist and it adds adds the lo low energy quantum phase so we need we need that's another question. So this is crucial to the question. So is the clock of the electromagnetism as a few of you have, are claiming, or maybe there's additional low energy degree of freedom for this quantum phase. I, I believe there is needed for additional degree of low energy degree of freedom. Also in QED Lagrangian, there is also the phase, not only electromagnetism. So, uh, so and, and then going to SO13, or starting boost, and then for boost, I get the second set of Maxwell equations exactly for for exactly as for uh, as for for gravity electromagnetism, and so the question is how to get the general relativity effect. So so one is um, bending of the light near the near the gravity. So so there is there is this Robert Dicke uh, varying varying speed of light approach. That this, this is mathematically equivalent to the, to the general relativity. It says that in strong gravitational field, the propagation speed is, is slowed down. The, so so there is interaction between electromagnetism and gravity electromagnetism. Uh, so if if you have this slowdown of of electromagnetic propagation in, in strong gravitational field, then through Fermat principle you get the bending. Of the trajectory, also slowing down of in propagation makes that because this, all all the clocks, uh, biology, chemistry is based on the electromagnetic propagation. So also you get slow down gravitational time, time dilation. Yes, yeah, so, so 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 this way uh, I, I I believe in this approach that, that I don't have intrinsic curvature of space time only of space. And 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 why I believe that we need we need this low energy degree of freedom for for for. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for uh, okay, so 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 if you look, you look at Q QED Lagrangian, there is there is F mini F mini, there is electromagnetics, but we have also this low energy phase phase evolution. So I believe we need more than electromagnetics in, in without gravity, with both both electromagnetics and also some additional quantum phase literally, uh, low low degree low energy degree of freedom. For 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 the for this contribution to low energy contribution to to Lagrangian. Okay, uh, Jared, can you go back okay. to your uh, gem equations that you had, where you compared it to the electromagnetic and the gem next to each other? That would mean yes, okay. that a particle would need to have both of those uh, in superposition at the same time. Uh, how so do this you classical that? this classical theory in this moment? So for quantum theory, I assume I'm so I believe it should be solved with the least action principle for classical and for quantum I should go to the Feynman, Feynman uh, ensemble of the of the trajectories. So so in other words, I'm asking what is the field configuration be, be, be behind a given uh, Feynman diagram. So this is classical in this moment. So 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 for me, uh, so here is here is the, the configure field configuration for electron in 3D. In 4D, there is additional tiny boosts uh, leading to second set of Maxwell equation for gravity. But this is, this is my Lagrangian, which is electromagnetism, a bit a bit extended to, to include also Klein-Gordon equation for, for phase and, uh, and uh, second set of Maxwell equation for gravity. Know some similar approaches. I'm glad you take a look. But I so it is very natural to try to unify two, two sets of Maxwell equations, yes, for gravity and for electromagnetism. But I haven't seen somebody literally trying to do, do it mathematically. But it's slightly out of the focus of this today to conference. So, okay. Okay, can I have a, a question to one of the speaker uh, about this pilot wave uh, dynamics? So 
in uh, superconductors, uh, there is it's well known that there are vortices. So you have a superconductor plane and vortices are like mimicking the particles. So the places where magnetic flange is magnetic field is punching are quantized multiplicity of, of magnetic flux. And moving vortex actually does radiate energy. But vortex is example of of you know of of in a sense movement in a superfluid system in a sense. So 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 I just wanted to address that there is also a mission of so so the, the last talk before the last one has has addressed this emission of 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 uh, waves and energy by moving objects in in hydro hydrodynamics. Yeah, so just just this this type of comment. Yes, yeah. So so I think this is in response to my talk, um, and yeah. certainly that's uh, that's an interesting point. Um, now the the energetics of both the hydrodynamic system and of the pilot wave system I'm investigating are um, are two things that we're still uh, currently investigating pretty deeply. Uh, but at least in my case, we get um, we, we do get a sort of radiation, uh, somewhat like the uh, somewhat like the the movement of solitons you were describing. Uh, but here, the radiation only kills out the Zitterbewegung. so it does not um, it it does not damage the otherwise rectilinear trajectory of the particle. Now, as the particle goes around in circles, for instance, if we couple it to a central potential, uh, then we start running into slightly more interesting problems. And there I'm investigating techniques, for instance, coupling, uh, coupling stochastic background fields to the particle itself to see if we can, um, to, to see if we can turn it into a driven dip dissipative system and, and balance out the energy appropriately. I see. I have one question to you, uh, because uh, basically you you are showing certain level of equivalence between classical hydrodynamics and quantum dynamics in, in a way. This is what you do imply somehow, right? I would say to to some extent, um, but I want to emphasize that the connections to quantum mechanics that we showed here are. Um, are largely connections to waves that we associate with quantum mechanics. So uh, for instance, the P equals H bar K and E equals H bar omega relations are things common to, to any Klein-Gordon wave. And uh, and maybe getting back to uh, getting back to someone else's question, the Klein-Gordon wave is really our one wave we can work with if we're interested in a scalar theory that abides by relativity. Okay, so question is, can you exploit this equivalence in terms of real applications? And I have certain ideas. So let's say you want to model the, the, the movement of air around the plane, classical plane, mm -hmm. by uh, by mapping this problem to the problem of, 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 of you know, quantum computation and qubits. Do you see such possibility that you can use you can, your analogies can shift paradigm in terms of computation, so you can model classical hydrodynamics problems by quantum computation. So, what's your what's your view on that? I think the I think the key problem with this kind of program would be the scale. That uh, that realistically, we're talking about very small scale hydrodynamics experiments and and fairly particular ones with the pilot wave hydrodynamics that the group has been investigating. Um, now, I think, so So realistically, trying to model hydrodynamical experiments in terms of quantum computation would probably just require an even greater amount of quantum computation than, um, than our existing algorithms for just attacking the problem head on classically. But I think there there might be a possibility of going the other direction of trying to model quantum computation using these classical tools. 
I see, I see, I see, I see the point. So it's like approximation of a certain big quantum systems by kind of quasi classical methodology or something like that. That's what you yes. imply, right? I see. Okay, thank you so much for your yeah. answer. No worries at all. Thanks for your question. Okay, so if there are questions between between the talks, so please please ask. If 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 there are not, we can we can try try going to the <clears throat> to the, the questions. Uh, not only I have written, but we have we have uh, together chosen. So so are there any questions to to, to some talks? Uh, as long as the speakers are are, are present. If there are not, so maybe let's let's think about it. So, so, so one, one, the first question is: see the bewegung as as periodic process of what? So I have heard a few persons said that it, that electromagnetic is sufficient for this degree of freedom, uh, but I I think it's we need some additional degree of freedom. Just this quantum phase, literally, yeah. So it has some tiny energy related with the Planck's Planck's constant, but I think it separates. So for example, the 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 uh, Magnetic interferometer that 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 it's more than electromagnetic that you get interference, but but some some interaction to some additional degree of freedom. I think the quantum phase, yeah. So so so, so do you think electromagnetic is sufficient, or or do we need some additional degree of freedom of vacuum, some quantum phase, low energy? Uh, well, maybe I I answer because. This uh, is quite related to my presentation. So, so in my presentation, uh, I describe Zitterbewegung as an electromagnetic phenomenon. So this suggests that the particle mass is uh, electromagnetic field energy. So that's a central component. Uh, the, the one question uh, that, well, actually a few questions that we still uh, don't know is how to calculate the fine structure constant um elementary charge quantization or magnetic flux quantization and um these these open questions they you know they indicate okay that there is there is something more as you say um and uh and uh you know that's the big question what is that something more that allows us to uh, determine um, what is the uh, fine structure constant for example Yes, but 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 so, so you say that electromagnetic is sufficient. Yes, so the, the charge quantization is an extremely important question. So uh, we start with with Mantis Faber, like in liquid crystals that, that they get it. Is that 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 you you need to make that Gauss law counts topological uh, some quantized charge? Yes. Yeah? So mm -hmm. so the natural approach is is saying that it's quantized charge. Yes, and so I don't know. So so do you do you like this approach or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, why it's interesting to look at uh, uh, all the different approaches Absolutely. to to understand, you know, what is in the end that um, addition to just uh, Maxwell's equations that that gives the quantization. Yeah, so I don't know any other approach. Do, do you know some other approach? Is that so? We need to make that why the Gauss law counts integer number of, of something mm -hmm. of, of what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have the answer. What uh, what I think is very um, important, uh, uh, what I had in my presentation, it was mainly uh, the recognition of Giorgio Vassallo that that the magnetic flux is always uh, quantized, and then yes. and then you can think of charge quantization in terms of this magnetic flux uh, loop uh, quantization. And that's maybe a, another way to approach it. Why is that loop always uh, quantized? So yeah, so magnetic field is is quantized in in superconductor uh, angular momentum in superfluid because of this two two dimensional uh, topological charge. Uh, why in contrast, but but we also have three dim three dimensions, so it's different to topological charge. So here is two dimensional and this is three dimensional. So I, I believe that we have both. This this is. The spin mm -hmm. magnetic field flux quantization, but we need also for charge quantization, we need also this point like topological defects. Mm -hmm. I will gladly discuss them. Okay, so uh, John, I think, uh, yes. uh, could you? Uh, uh, yes. John? Yeah, coming, coming, coming in on this point, I, I, think think Andres is, I think Andres is quite right, and we're talking about 
a system here which we're, we're, what we really need to know is what is what is the th what is the fluid what is the quantum fluid that is zitterbewegung what is the quantum fluid itself that constitutes the electron what is electronium what's the electron made of and um i think that um that what you need to think about is and it's absolutely opposite that one thinks about the uh, flux quantization and the charge quantization as being two sides of the same of the, of the same coin now, Martin van der Mark and myself um, looked at this problem back in 1991 and published eventually in 97, and managed to get a relationship between the uh, between Planck's constant and the uh, and the fine structure constant at that point, based on a topological model of the flow of electromagnetic energy within the electron, based on a conjecture that the electron was a purely electromagnetic particle. And we've developed um, we've developed since then along those along those lines. So I think if one looks at things in terms of 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 the the entire particle being electromagnetic, then yes, there is a possibility of finding a relationship that derives Planck's constant in terms of the electron charge or the electron charge in terms of Planck's constant. Yes, yes. So, so, so we need, we need both magnetic field quantization and electric charge quantization. There are different types of charge quantization. So, so I'm as I've shown that the magnetic we know well the magnetic field quantization through this windy windy number. So this is two dimensional topological charge, but it also three dimensional topological charge like the Hedgehog of the and, and they observe it in uh, liquid crystals that get long range interaction for for them. So, so, so I think we should we need both both for spin spin quantization. Magnetic field and electric charge separate. I think you're right. I think what we were talking about is we're talking about a relationship between uh, magnetism and spin as well. And what we're having, uh, the, the fundamental thing about a particle is that, about a, about a particle which is not interacting with the rest of the universe, it has to be that sort of object which recreates itself, which comes around in a loop and comes back to its starting point. And that coming around in the loop and coming back to its starting point is pretty much where Dirac started in 1930, in, in, in the 30s, when he was looking at the, at the integration of the solutions of uh, his equations. What he, what he found was he had, an exponential, he had an exponential which contained one of his Dirac matrices, and that, and that gave the solution of the thing vibrating backwards and forwards in all dimensions at the speed of light at the same time. So that's the first point that happened. Um, uh, but yes, I think that, the, but it's the two-dimensional nature, the fact that you come around in a loop. Now that loop, of course, doesn't necessarily need to be two-dimensional. It can be something that com comes up and around and goes around a torus or goes around some other shape. But the essential thing is the circulation. And that circulation is a constant thing. Why is it a constant thing? Because you have, um, as, as things get larger, they also get slower at the speed of light. So one has something which gets bigger, goes up as R, but also gets slower, goes down as R because of the speed of light. So there should be some action which is associated with that, which is h bar, and that action is is a fundamental action, h bar for anything which is bosonic, half h bar for anything which is non bosonic, and such things as Carver Mead's book as well on 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 um, classical uh, on, on a classical approach based on E's h nu in the beginning to electromagnetism is also a very interesting thing to follow. follow. I don't know if that's something that a lot of people have looked at. It's a it's a it's it's a very it's a very short book. It's only about a hundred pages long, but a great read. So um, that's that's an interesting point to come in where he comes in at the beginning as something which uh, which uh, which um, is is based on this, this this idea that there's a there's a fundamental circulation that's a fundamental coming back to the beginning on something, and uh, and also in, in in that sense, what the Zitterbewegung is is it's electromagnetic energy just going around and around in circles. There you go. It just goes around twice. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spinner in a spinner object bang bang half yes, h John, and that is exactly what my equations show you you know oh, i can make it go around in a circle or i can make it go around in a uh, spheroidal path and it encapsulates the sphere yes but this is for magnetic magnetic flux quantization and ground quantization known in super super fluid superconductor however we need also charge quantization that the gauss law that integration over over an area gives total charge inside, which has to be integer. This is a different type of quantization. And we have also this generalization in Gauss-Bonnet, so let, let me show it one, one time. 
Um, You're quite right. There's more than one kind of quantization. That's that's correct. And and one could one could say that the the, the, the fundamental quantization of all the Bohr orbits and so forth. They're, they're all these round and round quantizations. These these periodic boundary condition uh, quantizations. Yes. Charge quantization is different. Two. Charge quantization. Is two. Yeah. yeah. Charge quantization. But I think if you're looking for a route for charge quantization, where I would look is an interaction, because because what you have is you have charges and charges are interactors, and um, uh, Martin and I wrote a paper. Martin van der Mark and I wrote a paper. That eventually came out uh, last year. It's on it's on my website at quesicle.com, looking at looking at charge quantization as a result of interactions. So what you have is you have the, the you have a charge you have a distinction between something which is local the charge and something uh, and that set of things that that charge interacts with the rest of the universe so so if you look at it like that you have an interacting system in fact half of that interaction is always elsewhere it's always not at the electron it's in transit between the thing that is and the rest of the universe that it's interacting with so one, one could be consider so so one should be considering things not not in pairs but as as an object and as the rest of the universe. Now that then leads to that then leads to a consideration of thinking about um, what is the probability that a given electron here on my fingertip interacts with the rest of the universe. And that depends on a couple of things. It depends on pretty much what if you imagine the rest of the universe being some some uniform gas. Then, then, then the bigger the universe is, the more of that, um, depending on the size of each of those interactors, the cross section of each of those interactors, if they're sufficiently big, they'll cover the whole universe, and you get a probability of one of it interacting with something. If the, you bring down that density, then that probability comes down below one, and as it comes down, the effective interactionness that one 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 gets. Is also reduced, so that would then mean that the quantization of charge could be due to the rate of available interactors in terms of the cross section integrated over the over the volume of the universe. Uh, integrated over the volume of the universe. Now, if you do the sums for that, it's quite interesting because it comes to something which is about one over. We don't know exactly what the size of the universe is or what the density of that is, but it comes to something like. One. Which in, is pra not in practice, uh, we, we, we divide, divide this interaction into Coulomb interaction and, and others between the pairs. So, so what right. we need to understand is the pair. So uh, we need to recreate Coulomb. And this, this is what we do. We take two, yeah. two topological charges in various distances and integrate, integrate the, the energy density over this configuration and get effectively Coulomb interaction. If you want more particles, then you need to uh, you usually sum over pairs. Uh, the Coulomb interaction integrate. You're right. So, so, right. so, so you look at it. Yes. That's and, right. And so you look at it. Right. Also for the equal three. Yeah, you're right. You need to look at it. But not not just the Coulomb interaction, but also in terms of quantum electrodynamics, because you're looking at photon exchange over over these over these large distances. What is the what is the possibility of getting a mutual exchange of photons? You have to have both a, an emitter and an absorber. Yeah, this is so you have. To, yeah. Uh, the photon, so, photon, optical, photon is, we don't understand. So, so the more difficult, why it not disperse? Usually, electromagnetic wave disperse, uh, and the photon, photon is is emitted by one atom, and usually is, is absorbed by by another one atom. So this, this is very difficult to understand. We, 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 we don't understand. I don't think. So yeah, Margaret that, would like to, to see it as as hop, hop films, but I, I I don't I disagree here. Well, 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 what you have for the Coulomb interactions, you have of course. In individual interactions are one on one, but if you look at it quantum electrodynamically, you just have a very large number of those interactions. Mm -hmm. So then it looks spherical. Uh, so, but finally, I want, to, I, I want to come back to the ma magnetic quantization of magnetic field from the Aronov, Aronov bomb effect. I don't conclude that the magnetic field is quantized. You can have arbitrary quantum flux going through the solenoid. Only what you see is that the electron gets periodic into pi. Uh, so, of course, I like the idea that this may be uh, may play a role in the hydrogen atom for the uh, for the quantization. But the magnetic flux can be arbitrary; it's not quantized. That's 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 correct. So, if you take an Aronoff bomb interferometer, you get any number, any any number at all. But if you have a system which is which is which is a 
which is a, a quasi-particle system where, it ha where, where that quantum flux is associated with a set of electrons, then it is quantized in units of H over E. Yeah. But I see that the magnetic flux is quantized in the super uh, in the superfluid yes. uh, in this in the yes. superconductor. But this is of course um, due to the Cooper pairs which surround the flux, which which restrict the flux to a certain radius, and to a yes, certain and which have a quantum condition, which is a circulation. Condition. Yes, another yes. one of the quantum circulation conditions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the, the the excuse me. The definition of. Uh, so a magnetic field and an electric field are, uh, have a relationship of C. So um, basically, if you've got a quantized uh, electric field, you immediately have a quantized uh, a magnetic field. And now the... Uh, no. Yes. No, 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 Anton. No, no. You, no. You have yes. a quantized... Uh, you have uh, situation... Oh, E equals CB. Look yeah, the this unit. is for the photon. This is for electromagnetic field. This is for waves, for electromagnetic waves. But it's yeah, and, and the photon is electric moving charges. Yeah, and from my equations that I have, if we, I actually work in flux, uh, the same applies. Yes, if you uh, if you have electromagnetic waves, then it applies. Yes, but not for electric charges which are moving at which produce a magnetic. Well, it depends what you <laughs> de uh, define the electric charge. Electric charge is nothing more than a, uh, a uh, uh, an interaction and uh, field like a gravity field, and that the, the electric charge in an electric current is not the electric charge of an electron. I can uh, prove that to you. Let me just get up a diagram. Uh, okay, so, so here are some some gathered um, uh, arguments that, that maybe uh, the magnetic field is quantized uh, in some cases, not not necessarily always. So, so very nice argument, I think, is, is the sun's corona. They, they see these shining one-dimensional uh, lines, uh, magnetic lines. So, so the question is why, why they are so stable, and I, they, they don't, don't, don't understand. So uh, um, there is some suspicion that they might be topological to make, it, to make them stable. But Another arg argument, uh, cosmic strings, they hypothesize that one-dimensional structures in, in vacuum again. So. Another argument um, I, I like is that, that there are these halonuclei, like, like lithium-11, that, that you have neutrons, a few neutrons, uh, two, two neutrons, for example, in very large distance, uh, larger than, than of uh, strong force. And they are, they are stable for milliseconds, so, so extremely long time. So what binds them? So I, I believe there is some, 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 some magnetic, magnetic flux, flux um, uh, vortex to, to, this, to bind them. This could also be some particles which surround the flux. Like in this in the superconductor. Uh, so, uh, so that does be question. We know that there is there are flux on the superconductor. The question is, could we have flux in vacuum? And I think there are many arguments that that, that there, they could be appearing. Not, not not, vacuum, I'm not saying that all all magnetic fields are are quantized. Not, no, you don't have vacuum. You have particles there, which can move, and they are charged. There may be charged particles which are around these fluxes. But the difference is that the electric, uh, the electric charge is always quantized. The magnetic flux ca can be quantized, but the electric is always. This is the difference. And this is why I think that it's topological. Electric is topological and magnetic yes. is, of course, connected to topology, but it's not topologically quantized. Yes, I, I think that magnetic, in some cases, can be can be quantized, but, but not, not, not always. Yes. So, so, so some evidence is that either the flux drops in, in corona, another is the cosmic strings, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. So they, they usually say that there is this quantum phase, make this, make this, this rotation, this, this meaning number. Uh, so, so points where uh, lines where quantum phase makes, makes, makes full, full rotation, for example. Um, the, the halonuclei, I don't know how to, under, I, strong force cannot, cannot bind stably. In, in a few femtometer distance, the neutrons and they are they are experimentally seen to be stable for milliseconds. By the way, if we just talk about quantization of charge, so there is a quantum fold uh, hall effect and uh, actually fractional quantum hall effect where charge one third of elementary charge was reported and uh, two third of elementary charge was reported, and in such circumstances there was flux uh, that was 
somehow attached to this charge, a magnetic flux, a quantized magnetic flux. So anyway, uh, there was a, a chain of seminars on that issue, on that topic, and from certain perspectives, it gives insight to, to, to this problem. There was some seminars by Stanford, Stanford University. I yes, just, that's, just what, what, what did that's, you mention? That's kind of right, but it's kind of not the whole story. Um, what, 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 you're, what you're talking about there is you're talking about, I um, mean, Manfred's right here, electric charge is always quantized, the magnetic field not always, but the thing is you can stick one more, more than one flux quantum through through, through, through an electron system. And, and then the thing appears at a number which is like a fractional charge, but it's not a fractional charge. It's more like a multiple magnetic field. So, 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 so what you're doing is you're adding to, so, so instead of going around once, you're going around more, more than once. It, it, it's perhaps a better way of looking at it. We're talking about the, we're talking about quasi particle fluids there when you're looking at the fractional quantum Hall effect, which are, which are multiple systems, which are bound states of, electrons and fluxons so so you could say you, you could say the, the fractionality is occurring in the charge or in the magnetic field but i'd put it in the magnetic field uh, in a multiplicity in the magnetic field not in the fractionality in the charge i think manfred's right i mean it's a different kind of quantization that we're talking about here but while we're talking about electric charge and electrons i must point out that in my opinion, and I'm damn sure I'm right, is that the electric current, as we know, is not described by Drude's model of an electron drift. And this is basic. Uh, Never electric... has been. Never has Pardon? been. Never has been. It's well known that current has three forms. And it's not just electron drift, and it never was, and it was never thought to be. And in fact, Feynman lectures in physics say that, uh, say that current is carried outside the conductor. It's not carried by a drift. Speed of light proves. Never mind how it's carried. If the current understanding in physics, and please give me any paper that tells me otherwise, is that the electric current is defined by Drude's model and the Somerset uh, a modification to bring it into a quantum theory. Maxwell, 1876. That is the EDT, that's something else. The, the displacement well, current. I'm talking about the current in current. a conductor. Current in a conductor is carried by the electromagnetic field speed at nearly the speed of light. Not but properly. I mean, truth right, does every go and look at Wiki or whatever. The electric current oh. is defined in physics as a um, uh, uh, an electron drift. Shall I get it up? Wikipedia is not an authority. It's about second year undergraduate. I'll give you the papers, and you show me any other papers. Anton, I don't want to get involved in this discussion. Yeah, because you're not going to win it. That's why. Already won it. No, you haven't. Anyway, carry on. Uh, let's let's agree to disagree here. But as long if you cannot, um, you need to div um, separate the electric current or the charge in an electric current from the electric field in the electron. We have two different forces there. We, we have the, you know, uh, the, a, what I call the electrostatic field, which is governs the uh, atomic interactions. And we've got the electromotive field uh, that governs the uh, electricity that we use uh, uh, in, in our industry. And, though, and physics does not separate those two. And then that is a fundamental problem. So, sorry, I didn't really understand what you mean. The, basically, you we say an electron carries a charge of one coulomb. You the, don't believe that the electrons are hopping from one atomic uh, nucleus to the next? from yeah the, um, and produce uh, current uh, and then the basically the uh, the drude model uh, paul drude in 1900 states that the electric current is an electron drift of the basically that the electrons in the uh, can move in the fermi level so they can basically they are free to move uh, in the fermi level uh, yeah. on the level 
Sure. And uh, we say the electron has a, carries a charge of one uh, coulomb. The and the electric band, current then... is um, coulombs per second, which means an electron drift, you know, the, the, or implied electron drift, which is the accepted model in um, uh, of physics. So you believe that the uh, electric current in the uh, bio is completely different than the, 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 the charges are that completely different than the charges? Yes, of... yes, completely different things. Um, you know, they... What are they? What are they then? It, it's, um, I, I call it, uh, personally, I call it a Voltron. You know, that, um, because basically, how do you... Uh, um, account for uh, the potential of uh, the, the number of volts. Yes, sure, but uh, that, this is clear, but this is an effective description. There's no problem to describe it like this, but uh, that's like uh, if you do nuclear physics, you have to completely different degrees of freedom than you have in, in particle physics. And uh, so this is another effect. This is an effective description. So I don't see any problem. But it's if you go to a fundamental level, you have to explain it by by charges which are moving. Yeah, but they are carried in something else, and are not in the uh, electron. I agree with you. There are moving charges, but it is not the electron that that moves. So we need something else to describe electric current. And we we cannot describe the electric the current as uh, is moving. Pardon? It is not quantized what is moving, or it's just some it's, it's a quantized unit. It's it's like some fluid which is moving, consisting of what? Um, uh, basically, it's another form of a uh, uh, variation of a magnetic wave. Um, okay, so know, maybe let's go back to the, the, um, the topic. I don't want to hijack this. Uh, um, yeah, so maybe let's go back to the, the topic that that's yes, sorry. About this. Okay, so so um, so so uh, the first question was periodic process of what? So so do you, do you think electromagnetic? So there is one 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 approach, but I, I I don't think there is enough information. So we also it needs some additional degree of freedom. This is quantum phase. In, in quantum mechanics, we you separate electromagnetism. And and wave function and, and in wave function there is this phase which 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 is outside which is some additional degree of freedom of freedom of vacuum so its amplitude describes the probability distribution of finding particle but the the the, the argument I, I, this is something something additional to to electromagnetism uh, which is literally rotated by the the clock so so do you think do you think we can live without this additional degree of freedom or? Um. Uh, Jarek, in the work that I'm doing, I'm basically, uh, I, I, I can explain all of quantum mechanics. Uh, I, I can, from the equation, from that soliton equation that I presented, I can um, derive um, epsilon zero and mu zero. Yeah, I can derive this completely mathematically. But please, please, please don't, 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 please try to answer, answer to two questions instead of referring to some articles. So, so, yeah. so do, do you think, do you think electromagnetism is sufficient? Or do we need some additional quantum degree of freedom, which is rotated by Zita Pevegung? So maybe, maybe some other person could, could, could try to elaborate on. Um, when you say rotate by an angle, what do you want to rotate? Yes, yeah, so that, that, that the big question of the Bewegung, what is it rotating? That's the center, the first question <laughs> and the central question for the Bewegung. Rota it is a rotation of what? So also for spin, this is not just spinning as rotation of particle, but rotation of some degree of freedom, I think. Yeah, but I presented that, I presented from the max, uh, for, for, uh, so both please, please don't, the... don't refer, but try try to answer answer the question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to answer it. I, I presented what I call a, a rotary wave or a propeller that that I'm I'm proposing a new a brand new electromagnetic wave that you can imagine as a propeller turning. 
So, so are you going outside of standard electromagnetism or, or inside? Uh, I'm not going outside standard uh, uh, electromagnetics. I'm just applying mathematics that I have um, uh, de uh, deducted. So it's okay, I, I don't know if you use standard or electromagnetics. But okay, so uh, could anybody else uh, try to answer? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the, the next question is what properties this periodic process? I think this is the most the most difficult question. Yeah, so 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 there were in in walking droplets, uh, there were there, there was assumed the external external shaker. Do we have some external shaker for for the universe, or maybe uh, maybe particles themselves are, are are the source of the of this of this clock? So in this case, we need we need to make them and field configuration which which prefer some this this periodic process yes yeah? so that, that's a big question can we do it so i can do it by getting this negative energy contribution in, in hamiltonian literally what is required for for the for the clock um yeah sure it's... yeah what do you think Yarek, about electromagnetic vacuum noise so does uh does it impact the type of wavelength? So so yes, that, that's another question. So 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 is this is this noise some additional? Maybe maybe electron is kind of a resonance with this noise. This is another approach, or maybe this noise if there is 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 made by by all these clocks uh, of all the particles. Yes. Yeah? So and this noise is required, for example, for the the Casimir effect. There is classical hydrodynamic Casimir, Casimir effect, but the question is, it needs some external shaker. The question is, what is shaker in in, in particular physics? So, so I, I suspect that that the, the clocks are inside the particles, like electrons. So we need to make them energy configuration preferring this kind of periodic process. The periodic process of what and what to, what prepares this periodic, periodic process? Yeah, so. So, uh, Derek, are you saying that the, or implying rather, that there is a master clock in the universe that everything thinks no. to? So, so, so that's the view of the of the walking droplet, the droplet people. There is a master clock, but but there is no no source. I think in this case it would be it would be it would be Lorentz invariant. So, 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 so a moving object would be a different clock than, than, than a standing object with this hypothesis of some master clock yes so so i think it's it's not not not, not possible so we need clock maybe noise uh, and and some count some count resonancing with with particle electrons to to get to get the, the clock or maybe they indeed have some tendency some energetic tendency to 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 to, to rotate so so yes i think I personally think that uh, we need some external influence, something in the universe what disturbs the particles when they are moving, and this may be periodically moving. Um, um, yeah, maybe some. So, 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 some but I don't know what it is. External master clock, but 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 but, but, but for a, a clock, because in but, my model it it doesn't fit to have an internal clock. It fits. Yes, it does. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In my extension it is but so 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 we'd like to some external external master clock yes like like, like in Kudel. yeah 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 i need something yes some external waves probably yeah. but but if you have external master clock then i think it would be it would be it couldn't be Lorentz invariant no depends if it's if it's electromagnetic waves then there's no problem with with Lorentz invariance and if it's gravitational waves, it's also not no problem with Lorentz invariance. They are moving with the speed of light. Uh, but 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 you can go to but you have still a redshift. You you going toward toward it or or, or outside so on. It will change 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 frequency, no? Depending on the of the, the velocity of the of the observer. Yes, but this is this is just Lorentz. In, if you have a Lorentz invariant description, this doesn't make problems. I think. So no, for, for field theory, in Klein Gordon, for example, as Dave has shown, it has positive energy contribution. So 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 minimizing energy, this pendulum pendulum would like to stop, but it doesn't want to for electrons. So that's a big question. Yeah, it transfer some energy. These external waves transfer some energy, and then they take it away again. So they 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 give for some time some 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 energy. That's what we see in in the delta S, which is size of h bar. 
So for a short time, they give some energy and then they take it back. But of course, uh, I believe we need we need some to, to show why why electron produce produce this, this clock. And I think that that's the only option. And 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 so if if not electron is the source, so so, so we need another source. I, I think the reason is the electron. I think I can answer the question. Uh, uh, the, the reason the electron produces the clock is the electron has energy, is H nu. That, that, that energy is recirculating. It's going round and round in circles. That's, so how is that energy recirculating? Well, if in terms of Maxwell's equations, it shouldn't recirculate. You need an equation in which there is a possibility that recirculation happens. The earliest equation in which that happened was the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation gave a solution in terms of things oscillating in different directions, but not in terms of circulation. There are other recent, more recent uh, theoretical uh, frameworks which extend the Dirac equation, which do have recirculating solutions. Those recirculating solutions are three components. One component is a scalar, is, is a scalar and pseudo-scalar component, like um, like um, uh, quantum mechanical wave function. Um, e to the i kx minus omega t, real and imaginary. It has elements which are vector solutions and tri-vector solutions. Those solutions act like a like a like a fluid, like a like a speed of light, uh, like a, a an ordinary motion in relativistic spacetime. And they have field elements. Those field elements are a light speed element. Now. The, the oscillation is a fixed oscillation, but the light speed part of that um, is going round and round in circles. Tick, 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 sitter, 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 as described in reverse direction by Hess Nieser's 1980 paper, where he started with that idea that that was there and then looked at zitter bewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics. So I think that what's happening for the zitter bewegung is that you simply have a flow in there's an element of the flow which is massive, which is invariant, which is the center, the core of the thing. There's an element which is which is a vector element, which is a which is a circulation in in directions around that. And there's an element which is light speed, which is light, which is field. The, electro, the electron has field. It has magnetic field. It has electric field. As you said, it has spin. It has um, lots more going on than just a point particle. But it is that stuff which the electron, which is made of partly is electromagnetic, that electromagnetic part is rotating at the speed of light, and that rotation at the speed of light is your zitter bewegung at twice the Compton frequency. And that's, in, 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 in my view, that's what's happening. Um, yes, but, but for example, in Klein-Gordon, yeah. it, it has positive energy contribution, this rotation. So, so like Pendulum would like to stop. Klein-Gordon is too simple. You're looking at a second order equation that you need a first order equation you need something which is describing what's happening at the elementary level to describe what's happening at the elementary level so klein gordon okay i mean it's a second order equation and you can derive it quite simply from um, first order equations like like uh, like the dirac equation um but but no you need to look at the first order at the first order stuff you need to look something like the maxwell's equations which is looking at uh, looking at first order stuff is beginning to get there but in order to get Instead of waiting out of Maxwell's equations, you have to postulate that light can go round and round in circles, which or electromagnetic radiation can go round and round in circles, which it certainly doesn't in the Maxwell equations. They don't have an element to make the thing go round and round in circles. You need to go to something which has that confinement mechanism. So a theory which contains something which um, forces the pointing vector not to be just D cross B, but have a component perpendicular to that is what you need. Now, such a theory is the one that I came up with in 2014 and have several papers up on my website. So um, if the theory is correct, which of course it may well not be, then th that would be what the zitter bewegung was. It would be the flow of electromagnetic momentum round and round in a double loop uh, in, in elementary particles, such as the electron and the proton. So the electron in this model has a clear boundary. Huh? It has a, a, a rotation, it's a rotation rather because it's rotating. But has the a frequency. Rotation has somewhere to end because it's the speed of light. Otherwise, if you if the, it's the speed of light, it's, it's a multiple it, the radius it, is it, getting arbitrarily large, then you get uh, over the velocity of light. So what is the, which <laughs> so you have yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean the, the, the charge is independent of size, 
So when, when you said before the quantization of charge was different to the quantization of, of, of magnetic field, you're absolutely right. The quantization of charge is coming about, in my view, because all of the electrons in the universe are interacting with one another in thermal equilibrium. So if, if one gets bigger, it gets, it gets hit with more stuff, gets more energy, it gets shrunk. It's continuously in a, in a dynamical situation where it is forced down to a particular, to a particular size, but the charge is calculable. Charge is calculable from Planck's constant, given E is H nu, given given uh, an input of, uh, of of the quantum. Before you thought that the electric field is uh, reaching to infinity, so an electron has an electric yeah. field and this has no end if it's in the universe. Uh, of well, course, in principle, in principle, correct. Right. Because to positive charges, the protons or something, but if that's right, is alone in the universe, and, and then the field is going to infinity. So, well, that's right. I mean, for, for a free electron, the field goes to infinity. But for practical electrons, they're normally in a hydrogen atom, for example. And then the field goes pretty much to 10 to the minus 10 meters. And, and you have a perfect cancellation between the proton and electron field. So, so, yes, you're right. I mean, the field can, in principle, extend to infinity. But in practice, um, what extends to infinity is the interaction of the electron, which is, which is a, a quantum electronic interaction. This then depends on the surrounding. It does, absolutely. It is star, you are somewhere in there between between galaxies. Then, of course, uh, the size is different of the field. No, 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 not at all. Do the sums. If you you have to integrate over the whole universe, and at the scale of integrating over the whole universe, the uh, the matter density is pretty much uniform. So yes, there may be small variations in areas which are which are which are which are very light, but they're actually very small if you if you just do the integration over ten to the thirteen. Uh, uh, over ten, uh, over thirteen billion light years. Mm. So it's pretty uniform when you look at the whole universe. Mm. Yeah, sure. Then, then, then the average energy, yeah. energy density is 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 yeah, approximately it's... uniform. Yeah. So, but 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 what it does mean? It does mean that if the universe was less massive, then the charge would be smaller, and if the universe adds mass, then the charge or becomes more dense. Then the charge will vary. The charge would not be a, a universal constant in the sense that it was forever and for all time the same, if that conjecture was correct. Of course, that the that the charge quantization is coming from interaction with the rest of the universe, which of course is merely a conjecture. So I'm not claiming that that it's in any way proven. To prove it, what one would need to do is to is to produce electrons which were uh, below mass threshold, for example, and we have. A program with NASA actually at the moment to try and uh, to try and uh, to set up an experiment to see if we can produce electrons below mass th threshold based on this theory. So, so, so the experiment is a difficult one, but it's not impossible. Just take a few tens of millions. So. Anyway, that's, that, that, that would be my view of what the city of was, that it's just stuff going round and round in a circle. But the, the electron stuff rotating. But, but rotating... The thing is, it's quite a complex rotation. You've got at least three rotations. You've got a rotation like the photon rotation, like light carries angular momentum. Something is rotating. That's going round and round in circles itself. And then that whole thing tumbles. So you have three axes of rotation. So integrated over that the thing's spherically symmetric so but there's an internal vibration which is uh, which is just the transport of internal momentum in the quantum particle round and round in circles so i would have given it, of, uh, yeah sorry kind of wave wave on a, a sphere or, or, or on a circle yes but usually a wave on a sphere would like to decide to, to, to release this energy now it would, Jarek, and and but, but but the thing is, if you're looking at the proper mathematics of this, one's in a four-dimensional mathematics. You're looking at stuff which is which is um, which is derivatives of space by time and time by space. So the objects, when you're looking at um, the electric field, for example, it you get it from the four-vector potential um, the, the derivative with respect to time of the of the three-vector potential is is the electric field in terms of conventional development of electromagnetism. So you're looking at something which is in a different space. It's in a, 
it's in a it's in a bivector space, not a vector space. And the thing has elements of all of those, and they're all rotating about different axes as well. So it's not merely a three-dimensional system one has to be thinking about. You're not thinking about a sphere rotating. You're thinking about hyperspherical. Well, you're thinking about the things are spherical in momentum space. But momentum uh, space is isn't space. It still has some some uh, energy related with this this this, this motion. So the question is, well, why is energy could it be uh, changed, released? Why why it has to be fixed energy, fixed frequency? That's the big question. Uh, okay, the the reason for the fixed mass of the electron, in my view, is the thing I just said to Manfred, that that, that, that you have an interaction with the rest of the universe. So so why does it have to be fixed? I don't think it does, and I don't think it is. I think that if we were in a different universe, it would be different. It may be possible to produce elementary particles below threshold. But that is an experiment which needs to be done to show whether or not there's any credibility at all in what the hell I'm talking about. So, so, so yes, you're right. It doesn't have, it wouldn't have to be fixed within the mere bounds of my theory, but clearly experimentally it is fixed. But yes, that doesn't... Yes, it's, yeah. So, 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 yeah, so ideally, from from Hamiltonian uh, mechanics perspective, you'd like to, to make that that this field configuration gets minimum energy if rotating with this De Broglie clock frequency. Yes. I, yes. I it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it needs to rotate both with double the De Broglie clock frequency and with the De Broglie clock frequency. There are three rotations in the ratio of two to one to one. So, 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 so there's a harmony between these rotations to minimize the energy. What you need to do is cancel as much field as you can, because you cancel field, you bring the energy down. So, for example, if you just look at something uh, at a charge going around and around in circles, you have a magnetic field, you have a dipole field. Yes. That's not good because that's producing lots of, of magnetic energy. How do you cancel that? You make it go round and round like this, and then you make the round and roundness itself rotate. And if it rotates at the same rate, then um, the field going up is precisely cancelled by the field going down in the next half cycle. And then you, in that way, you reduce the magnetic field of the electron to zero, which it is. The intrinsic magnetic field, you have to induce a magnetic moment of electron by sticking it in a magnetic field. That's zero moment in zero electric and zero magnetic field. So yes, it has to have these multiple rotations in order to fold around in such a way so, to bring so, so, the total energy down to the minimum. Why, why they cannot go to get down to zero rotation to, to radiate this energy of the, all these rotations? That's a big question. You can. you can. It's all around you. Nothing not, nothing is everywhere. So if it can, if electron can radiate this additional energy, then it, it's, it doesn't work. It, well, it's not no, that, no, they could. Okay. Uh, the radiation argument is that they can't radiate something if they have nothing, no state to go to. You, you can't fall down to a state which doesn't exist. And if yes, you have something- that, That's the question. How to make that, that the lowest energy state already rotates? That, that's the big question, yes. It's a single wavelength. And if you go down to zero wavelength, then you lose, you lose such things as rotation. You, 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 you can't conserve angular momentum like that. You know, there are conservation laws that stop that happening. And, and, and these, these, these conservation laws are hierarchical. I mean, conservation energy is one of them. Something going to nothing. Yes, right, okay. So, but also a fermion going to a boson, going to photons going out. That's violating, that's violating a topological consideration. That's why it doesn't radiate. That's why it's stable. It's a single wavelength. There's nothing shorter. The quantization is a wavelength quantization. And all of the quantizations we're talking about in the atomic system are wavelength quantizations. The S shell, one wavelength. The P shell, it's got an extra wavelength in one dimension. And so, and, and, and so on and so forth. That, that these are periodic. And the, the condition on this is that at the boundary, both the first and second derivatives, sorry, both the, yeah, both, both the object and its derivative match not only does it hit itself, but it's also got the right phase. So it has to be two pi or four pi, or has to be one wavelength or two wavelengths or three wavelengths in order to exist, in order to in order to recreate itself, in order to be a yes. So, so usually, if you have um, if you have um, a circle or a sphere, then you have this indeed the, the harmonics. 
the each harmonic can ha contain have some energy, but the lowest energy usually is when you radiate all energy from all, all the harmonics. Why yes, electrons about, cannot radiate this energy? But think about what you're talking about. If you take an electron and radiate all its energy away, what have you got? Uh, just, just don't have nice electrons. You don't have charge. Charge. There's no charge. You get only Coulomb interaction, yes. yes. How you, do you, you get look. charge conservation? How do you get yeah. it? You could. That it cannot radiate. How do you formulate it? This charge conservation. The charge, it's, it's not. The charge is coming from the topology. It's radiated, the then it's uh, energy, and energy is gone. That's, that's right. I mean, uh, what, what you're saying, uh, what I'm saying is that charge conservation is a conservation of topology. It's a conservation of, it's it's essentially but an angular it, conservation. It's, it's, if it's moving, so what is the topology? It's, uh, it's permanently changing. Uh, the topology is a double loop topology. It's a spinner. What is double loop in this, ca in this case? What is, what is the double loop? In, in, which okay. space, in which space it's double loop? The, the, the double loop is in momentum space. So, 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 if you imagine you have light, something is moving in in, uh, in 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 something in space is moving with velocity with some momentum. So uh, yes. So, so let's take light moving in space with some velocity and some momentum, going from finger to finger, point A to point B. In reality, it's not moving. Light isn't moving from point A to point B. Why? Because light's traveling at light speed. And at light speed, all points are at the same point in space-time. So emission absorption for the light occurs at the same point in space-time. But, uh, but so, not, I don't agree, because if a, if, a, if a photon is moving, if light is moving, it has some wavelengths, even if it's it moving with velocity of light. So it's not zero distance. I'm, I'm so talking, it's, no, it's not zero distance in the frame of, in your frame or in the absorber's frame, but it is zero distance in its frame. Faster you go, shorter space gets. But uh, Einstein was thinking uh, to sit on a wave of a, uh, on an electromagnetic wave, so he didn't think that it's zero distance. He he thought of some um, extended wave. Uh, the, 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 the distance... Einstein was surfing a wave, in which case he be, uh, it looks like if you're sitting on a piece of corrugated iron. Yes. But if he's sitting on the wing of a propeller, or on the wing of an aeroplane and watching that propeller, the propeller will always rotate at exactly the same speed that they're, um, irrespective of the speed of the aeroplane. So there's this, there is that difference. Yeah. That's a rotation. But, but, but charge conservation isn't the only thing. There's also spin conservation. You have a spin a half electron. No, how can not, you emit? How can you emit photons? It's not and, conserved. If you add up to spin one half, you can get zero or one. So it's not conserved. That's right. So, mm -hmm. so spin the half electron is not conserved. Spanish. The angular yes. momentum, of course, is conserved. The total angular momentum. You have the Gauss law for charge quantization and um, um, upper law kind of for for the magnetic. Yeah. yeah. So we need two, two different types of topological charges, one for uh, for, for charge, uh, like this Hedgehog, this three-dimensional, and, and one for, for magnetic magnetic fields. So, so these are different types of topological charges. Yes. You need both. And you have both of them. And you've got to, you, yes. you've got to conserve. OK, I mean, if you have a conventional physics, you've got to conserve charge, you've got to conserve spin, you've got to conserve lepton number, all of which are absolutely conserved. So, uh, so, so lepton electron like, number, I don't know, so it does charge. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so I, well, do we need more? So that's a big question. Do we not more, well, more, more than spin and charge quantization? Well, yes, so yes, yes number. Lepton, lepton number comes in three flavors. You have electron number conservation, muon number con conservation, and tau number conservation. You have two, two neutrinos emitted. So, so, so the, the muon. So, um, yeah, you do. The big question is barbarian number conservation. I think that, that that's open question. Broken. Broken, yeah. Broken, yeah. do you think? Yes, yeah, so I, I also hope in my model it also can, can be broken in very high, yeah. high energy. And, and that's a big question. Could you could use it? Yes, so if being able to yeah, use it. Then... Yeah, be maybe, fun. Maybe, Yes, that that would be, that would be ultimate energy source. Yes, being able to 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 use it. To, and 
stimulate the, the proton, proton decay. Uh, sorry, uh, this one. Um, mm, uh, sorry, uh, on this one, yes. So, 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 so the bar, 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 baryon, proton, proton decay is is hypothesized for baryogenesis that after Big Bang was created more baryons than, than antibaryons. And in Hawking radiation, that you can take baryons, build black hole, and to wait for as as it evaporates as mass radiation. So, in theory, we could use Hawking radiation to to squeeze matter and wait for its evaporation to get MC square energy, the ultimate energy source. Um, so, so but they search for it in 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 room temperature water. So maybe we should search for in extreme 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 conditions like the like the centers of neutron stars. So there are some neutron stars much, much brighter, millions times brighter than explained in current models. So, so maybe, maybe- I agree, I think that's the way to look. Yeah. I believe that, that, that might, might happen pro, 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 uh, burning, uh, let's say, inside. Yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think you're right. You need to look in extreme conditions there and see what can yes, be yes. done, but yeah. So, so I, I, would, I would love to, to, to test it in, in in, in, in collider, so I, I'm trying to, to talk with people from from LHC, but it's very difficult to, to, to test there. Uh, could, do you think it could be tested in in in, in, the, in, in the collider in CERN? No, I don't think you need those energies. I think, well, yes, it could, but I don't think you need to go to such big energies. I think you know a few hundred uh, k kb is enough. I, I think uh, that's pretty extreme already in terms of temperature. So if KV is enough, then we can get stimulated proton decay. Just just optimize yeah, the parameters okay. and so uh, certainly certainly yes, and then optimize the parameters and, and then have a proper theory of what's happening in the baryon case yes, anyway. Uh, exactly. Yes. 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 I, I'm and, searching and, for it. Yes. And then, then finesse it. Don't mess around. Just get get the things in the right state. Stick them together in the right shape. We're working on it. Yes. Yeah, most, oh, mostly yes, my, also. My, also, mostly I'm, I'm trying to for what? It's a good one. No, it's it, yes. Yeah. So, 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 if for, for, no, for it, my it, model, it's gonna happen. The universe is made of matter. Something's made the universe. It has to work somehow. So, um, so the question is how? We've got to find out. That's what we're doing. So, in my model, this is the baryons are the simplest knot. So, what we need to, to take take this 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 outer loop outside. So, 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 for example, to to, to swing swing to a to an 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 knot knot. For example, with electromagnetic wave to to, to swing swing the, the central charge to to untangle it, or or maybe to to to, to uh, rotate the magnetic field to to use the dipole to 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 try to untangle it. Yes, I, I, so, I think different stages to this. And yeah, in my model too, the baryons are, are different kinds of knots. So, um, so uh, yeah, nice. it does. It, it depends. But in your model, it's uh, rotating. Huh? Everything is rotating. So, what is the difference yeah. between the baryon? If what is rotating there? Um, what um, is, well, what is with the speed what, of light what, there. What, what, what's happening in an electron is that you have something which rotates and bites its own tail. It's a simple thing. It's just a. It's just a loop. It's it's an it's an unknot. It's a single single loop. For the baryons, what happens is to, to have a particle, you need to have something which just comes back and recreates itself. But you can do that in many different ways. And the electron's the simplest way to do that, the simplest stable way to do that. Apparently, it's the lowest mass object. But you can imagine having something which is not quite an electron, which goes round three quarters. So it goes in on x and it comes out on y. So now that's clearly not a particle because it's just destroyed itself. It's just come in on X and gone out on Y. But if you have a fellow particle sitting next to it, which goes from Y to Z, and then a fellow particle that goes from Z to X, and you need three of them to do this, work it out. Or you can have going from X to Y and then going from Y to minus X. That's going around the other way. They move in so such a way that they don't meet each other. Or... Yes, they need, collide, you need to have something. You, you, you need to have something which forms a continuous loop. And if you make that rule, then there's two ways to form continuous loops. One is to go round one way and then go round the other way in a figure of eight. I think you cannot uh, you cannot have a continuous loop in um, other than a circle. Everything else is looks. No, I think you're wrong. No, I think you're wrong there. No, yeah. So, you, have so complete, for, you have a model on this. You yeah. have to formulate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. 
So, uh, anyway, but I tell you, there, there are lots of continuous loops that aren't going round and round. Trefoil knot. Trefoil knot. Look at it. Yes. It's so a there's something loop. like like a quarks for the for the proton. You have also quarks for the electron. If it's three four. You, let, let, it's just geometry. Quarks are, quarks don't exist independently, in my view. It's just geometry. But the geometry is I, the geometry. I can of, agree with you. Uh, yes, that quarks uh, is also geometry. But uh, yes, yeah. so, so just, just the geometry. We have touched quantization geometry. in the Gauss law, no? but the question is how to how to get then this this locally fractional charges. Yes, local fractional charges. Uh, yeah, one third. Yes. So 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 here is here is so 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 I, I think. The, what we can look at in experiments are, are the charge distributions, and, we, and there are many articles claiming that yeah. neutron has positive core and negative shell. Yes, yeah. so, so, so we need we need the, the Gauss law. So, so taking an um, area far, far far away, then we have integer charges. So, so for proton, for neutron zero, for proton plus one, but but locally. If if charge is a Hedgehog, for example, or to particular charge, then we can locally part of this Hedgehog, like here, that 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 this outside loop literally enforces Hedgehog in the center. So so it enforces, let's say, to two third two third charge. So, so a proton can enclose it into full charge, full 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 Hedgehog, while neutron has, has to compensate this this positive charge. So we have plus two third and minus one third, minus one third. So there is this yes. confinement. So asymptotically, we have Gauss law, we have inter charge quantization, but locally, this this Hedgehog can be distributed into different different fractional charges, literally as quarks. I don't, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Um, I, I, I think because I think you're thinking that quarks are something, and I know that's the standard model, but I, I, I think look, what you have is you have the data on the graphs you have in front of you. That doesn't what we show have is the charge distribution of neutron, for example. Exactly. This is what we should shoot for. Exactly. Now that's what you should look at. Forget about sticking any extra stuff on top of that. Let's look at what you've actually got. And then have a look at Viv Robinson's book on, on my website, where he shows how the charge distribution in a neutron, which is both positive and negative, leads to the structure of nucleons. And he calculates the relative abundance of nucleons that should appear in the in the universe based on that and then compares it with what's actually observed and finds a perfect agreement. So what? And so the reason that nucleons stick together is that neutrons, in his view, that neutrons have a distribution which is both positive and negative. And what they do is they overlap, so the negative bit goes onto the positive bit of the proton and, and hence minimizes the energy for, um, for deuterium. Yes, so, yes so, exactly. So, well, so, yes, so, 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 then he also, doesn't just so, so, experimentally for deuteron. We need the uh, uh, electric quadruple moment that that yeah. deuteron has plus minus plus. Yes, and and yes. and here, so here he takes, takes that much further and then says, okay, well, if that's happening, what's the structure of nucleons? How do they fit together? How do you go from uh, how do you go to tritium to uh, to helium nuclei yeah. and so on and so forth to carbon to uranium? And he has some beautiful. Um, uh drawings in the book of how all of those things fit together in terms of the things like the Haddad Salema plot that you've got up on the screen at the moment. So uh, yes, so, yes, so, so, yes, so, so, so here, here the, the barium itself requires some church this 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 part of the hedgehog due to this interaction yes. of this vortex around and, and the central vortex. So so for a neutron it has to compensate so proton can enclose it it's lighter Neutron has to compensate. It was cost energy. It's heavier than proton because of that. And and for the the the, the, the both variants require charge. And then here they can just share this one. They can share charge. and hence reduce the energy. And hence yes. the neutron in in deuterium exactly. is not not unstable. Plus plus and minus in the center. Yes. So plus exactly, and, and plus more, plus. And, plus, yes. and which so, is so why. We can and hence why. Within. And hence why chemistry. So yeah, yeah. hey, cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, we have binding an energy from natural from this this model. Mounted Faber, we've added single single degree of freedom. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. And, and, and but, but but one always has to distinguish between experiment, good, yeah. to stuff you really know, 
and the stuff we guys we're, we're good at this stuff all for all of us right we make stuff up all the time but we have to realize we're making stuff up and 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 and, check, and, and really really keep putting it down to experiment and binding it with experiment and challenging it with experiment and that's that's proper science yeah, but it's very difficult. Yes, I'm, I'm, I have oh, last been energy on for, for a few months, uh, so it's very slow. <laughs> for single, yeah, but, single but, one. But, but the point has been made today. Hamiltonian Lagrangian stuff has been great for the last hundred years or so, sure. but it isn't enough. It's not enough. Not, it's not. not dealing with. It's not dealing with stuff which is which is out of time. It's not dealing with stuff which puts stuff forward in time or emits or absorbs something. It's it, it's it's too. It's oh. horribly complicated. And Lagrangian field theory is utterly wonderful, and I love it, but it isn't sufficient. You have to go back to proper equations of motion, where you're actually looking at the proper retarded potentials and doing the whole thing. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. But we're pretty good at doing not easy stuff. So, hey, let's do our uh, thing. Pro pro proper equation of motion, for example, in the Coulomb potential, and, and so, but this is only effect. Uh, this effective approximation, uh, what you are saying, but but finally we should go down down to the fields, which which are evolving <laughs> beca 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 behind these Feynman diagrams and, and scenarios. I think you're doing beautiful stuff, Yarek, but I think it's that Hamiltonian, that Lagrangian you've written down there is far too complicated. It's so got no, you've got it. You've got to my, get down. My Lagrangian to is electromagnetic Lagrangian. I, I, I'm using uh, electromagnetic Lagrangian, but as Manfield interpret the F, F tensor as curvature to make the Gauss law topological charge for the charge quantization. Uh, so, so in Manfield Faber, Manfield, this is this is two, two index curvature, and but full curvature has four indexes. And using four yeah. four, 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 four four indexes, uh, then it gets unified with. Can go the equation for for the for the quantum phase uh, low energy. Uh, You're uh, right. I, the... I do apologize. I thought you. I thought you'd shown a, 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 a. I do apologize. I thought you had shown a Lagrangian, which was. This maybe is super simple like... Lagrangian. This is just oh, electromagnetic good, Lagrangian. Good, good, good. With yeah, no, I know it well. I know. It. With built in charge yeah, quantization, can... with unified with quantum mechanics and gravity also. So 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 well, it, it unifies all. And super direct, simple yeah. Lagrangian unifies all. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so just, 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 uh, so this is the curvature, oh, and this curvature oh. of this, of this field recognizing four different axes. Uh, so, so yeah. this is the I've Lano de, de, de Jean, de Jean model. I've got to and, do, uh, I've got to And, 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 and there are, it has two, two, two weights for the shape. One weight is the, the Planck's constant to, to get, get a smaller energy for, for the, the twists, quantum phase, and, and the G for gravity, for, for large energy for the boost. Energy. So, so, so it just just two, uh, two, two parameters inside to unify as magnetics, quantum mechanics, and gravity. In this Lagrangian. You're right, but the the base problem with both Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian approach is that it just does energy, and energy is just the scalar part of the whole thing. So while you get the scalar part right, and that's certainly a necessary condition for any solution, there are other things happening at different levels. Well, okay, Lagrangian. No, it also looks at the phase and 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 gets gets things right with a single phase. But we know from some of the presentations today that you really need a dual phase. So, yes. um, and, so the, the, and then the rotates, what rotates in the, the break clock. In my model, it rotates these twists, twists of this of this of this field. So, so this is the rotation of the of the field itself, not of electron, but but of its field building the electron. Yes. And, and maybe the, maybe the approach will work, and maybe it'll be the best approach. But I, but I think that we're better off trying to get to the equations of motion themselves. So yes, uh, I, I can get uh, Euler Lagrange. I, I can create Euler Lagrange from this Lagrange, sure, but, but it's really difficult. So and then I need to, to put put some some uh, hedge code ansatz, find Euler Lagrange. So it's very complicated. I, mathematical. I, I have some slow progress, but but also I get this this uh, proportion mechanics. So the proportion mechanics is that having this full Lagrangian and going to Hamiltonian, I get I have I, I have some negative terms also in Hamiltonian, I have both positive and negative. So the full F F this F tensor, this four index F tensor, so has has a, a matrix. So so here 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 having only electromagnetics, I will have only this this term. So so having only this this term, I have electromagnetics, but also have this term with the delta with plus constant. 
for the, 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 the quantum mechanics and also these terms for gravity. So, 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 so the, these are positive terms and have also negative terms. And the negative terms, the most crucial is this one. But gamma one is literally this, this twisting, this rotation of quantum phase. So, so this, this is, so gamma two and gamma three are, are, the, are the tilts of this long axis and gamma one is this twist, the quantum phase I, I, I interpret. And gamma tilde is for boost. So, so in gravity, so, so in gravitational field, this term, this twisting can be energetically preferred. So, so this way I get the proportion for the clock. It can, can, can have, have, have preferred frequency for respect to that. I, I think the problem is that you're looking at terms as being energy terms, and it, it isn't only energy that's required. You also have, in four-dimensional space-time, you also have to think about the geometry of the way things fit together in order to bring about that energy reduction. It's not just an amount of energy, it's a configuration. It's a yes, phase. Yes, yes. And there, are, there are more, and there's more than one phase involved. So you need yes. to think about what the wave functions look like and how they snap together in three and four dimensions. That's missing from the Lagrangian approach, which is beautiful, so, but doesn't have that element to it. I have, I have. So, so here are the configuration of the fields for electron and the phase is the, the, the twisting of the field you can see between between these, these, these snapshots. So I have, yes. it has both. So, so if you use the proper field, and the field is Lano de Gen model that you have this field of three, three axes, so one long axis is tilt, tilt are high energy for electromagnetics, it twists are, are low energy for Kang Gordon equation, and boosts finally for fourth axis are for gravity. Okay, well, it, as you're going beyond me now, my friend, and, uh, and I, I wish you. That, if, if, if you show me is that there's something missing, I'm glad you worked on that, but I think it, it has all, all in this moment. As a Lagrangian, I'm sure that it's a wonderful Lagrangian. What I'm saying is that Lagrangian's field theory by itself, because it looks only at the energy and not at the current and not at the spin and not at the uh, electromagnetic configuration, it's too simple. It looks. It looks. So it hangs. So, so it has this, this field configuration. This is field theory, classical field theory. This is the field configuration. And to get electromagnetism, I, I take curvature of this field and get get uh, get F tensor electromagnetism. So it, it contains everything. So this is not, not a counter argument in this moment. Okay, well, it's too clever for me. Just, just this simple Lagrangian extending electromagnetism to full full curvature. Uh, this way, unifying with, uh, with other interactions. Working interactions. Yeah, I, we do it in a different way by making sure that every element already contains those four dimensional elements. So, yeah. and the things are not allowed to be written down without being properly four dimensional. So, it's the way that I, I do it, which isn't a Lagrangian approach. So, um, all successful physics we use from quantum field theory to general relativity and Lagrangian theory, the theories. So I, I don't think we, we need something different. We, we need to find the Lagrangian. What is the I field mean, approach which you are using if you don't use Lagrangian approach? You don't use field theory, field model. It, it's, what's, what's the um, approach you are using? I have, I think, I believe, a possible set of equations for the dynamics of the electromagnetic so this, field. This is algebraic equations. Algebraic equations like Newton's laws. No, but uh, th these models, which uh, Yarek describes, they are based on geometry. These are geometric fields. So it's it's uh, so to say. My my feeling is that particles are objects in space. Physics is geometry. And I agree with you. Not algebra. Um, no, I agree. I agree with you. I agree. Uh, this is the problem of all our present description of physics. That we have only algebraic description and, uh, and the, the, the geometrical basis of it is uh, got lost. This is well, why, why we don't. What, 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 I've, what I've done is I've found an algebraic decomposition which allows me to look at four three dimensional spaces. And the four three dimensional spaces have to fit together with each other. Internal spaces are these internal spaces. Or some, some of them are. I, I can say exactly what the spaces are. What the space R is the space of space of space, X, Y, Z. 
yes the space of space yes. the space of space of electric field ex ey ez so this is Note, a, an additional field so you introduce it's a field. Additional three dimensional space there are 16 dimensions in all yes so three dimensional space, three dimensional space of space which yes there is the three dimensional space of electric field and remember that the electric field has always been three dimensional never four dimensional Sure. We have four-dimensional space-time, but yes. we have... The magnetic a... field is also three-dimensional, but they are, yeah, related, exactly. they are related to two dimensions, so they are b-vectors. Um, exactly. exactly. So then... They are b-vectors. So, so you have the three of space, the three of electric field space, the three, as you say, of magnetic field space, yes. and the three of spin space. However, that's not all the spaces, because some of the spaces, for example, space-space also has time. It's space time. It has a fourth. It has a scalar, not a scalar, but a four, but a, plus, a, four plus nine, so it's thirteen degrees. No, it's um, it's sixteen. And it's what's it's what's the it's, remaining three. Um, you have scalar, which is which is mass, rest mass. Oh. You have um, space time. That's four. You have the two three fields. That's six. Two yeah. four six. Recognize the shape. Yeah. You have. A tri-vector field, which has four components, yes. that's another four, and you have a pseudoscalar, 16. Yeah. Uh -huh. 16. And what do you describe with this, with these 16 fields? Sorry? So, yes. What uh, can you describe with these 16 fields? Well, um, the 16 fields are also there in the Dirac equation, although hidden. Uh, what do you describe? Dirac... Electrons, electromagnetism, strong interaction, uh, protons, neutrons. What are you describing with the 16 fields? You take a four differential of the 16 field. Yes. And, and if, you, if you take just the four differential of the electromagnetic field, if, then you find that's identical to Maxwell's equations. But you also have the four, 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 the four differential of the vector potential is the fields. So there's a relationship in the linear equations that relate orders to the order up and down. So, so, so what you have is if you take the four differential of the four vector potential, you have the six fields, but you also have a gauge field because one of the differentials is a gauge field. So you have a gauge field arising from that. And of course, the simplest gauge is the Lorentz gauge with just setting that to zero. Or you could set that to the charge, in which case you have the Coulomb gauge. But but it's just standard electromagnetism there. With with so 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 the first the first um, yeah. the one four and six just exactly with the mathematics that um, with Dirac mathematics with proper Dirac mathematics but, uh, uh, reproduce electromagnetism as it stands and physics as it stands, including the gauge stuff. But you have an extra set of constraints. And those constraints are on the spin. You have the spin field, the intrinsic spin field, which is the trivector field. Yeah. So that, that gives you, and, and you have an extra gauge on the differential of the quadrivector. So you have a pair of gauges, not just a single gauge field. You have a perfect match with electromagnetism as it stands if you ignore the spin, which you know that electromagnetism as it stands doesn't talk about spin. But now the spin is in there as a force spin. So... And the equation can be written very simply. It's just D. If you take the general field as G, it's just DG equals zero. So you've got a, but, uh, those are the equations of motion of the electromagnetic fluid, of it, the electromagnetic fluid. It is generally believed that gauge uh, degrees of freedom are not physical degrees of freedom. So uh, yeah, but that follows. Uh, description just, that some of the, uh, you told we have two deg gauge degrees of freedom. Yes, so, and you don't it's, 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 just, it's just nonsense. I mean, people say this, and but actually, you know, they don't do it. People say they have gauge invariance, but in fact, if you choose a different gauge, you get different solutions, and everybody knows it, and it really pisses me off. No, 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 no. This is not right. No, it is. Right. You can only right. say have gauge invariant. Uh, uh, um, people misinterpret what gauge invariant means. Everything but you calculate is gauge invariant. Only in the in intermediate calculations you fix the gauge. This is like uh, you have uh, you, you calculate a sphere. You take spheric uh, spheric coordinates. So it's uh, it's always uh, you have best coordinates. No, you, you've, got, you've, got, you've got the part before so the hops. This you've got the part before a, a certain gauge in order to calculate something. 
So it's... the thing the thing is that what you do is if you if you impose the radiation gauge, so if you impose um, yeah. d a equals zero, where a is the four vector potential, a equals zero and, and the divergence of a equals zero, yes. Coulomb gauge and yes. radiation gauge, yes. Coulomb gauge, if you impose Oh, yeah. Yes. Phi equals zero you, and the emergence of phi is zero. Yes. Yes. If if I impose the Lorentz gauge, I get traveling wave plane wave solutions. Yes, sure. I get solutions. If I impose the Coulomb gauge, I get spherical solutions. They're different. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but, it's what I just said, isn't it? But everything is no, but you can describe you can everything describe with a different gauge. But it's getting more complicated. Of course, I can take yeah. these and coordinates to describe a sphere, and uh, you realize that it's very easy. This is the point. And the thing is that the thing is that uh, what what you're dealing with is people sometimes invoke this in papers. They'll say, but then we invoke gauge invariance, which means that, and they change the gauge, and that has serious consequences for actual solutions. So so. So pe people are misunderstanding what gauge invariance means. What gauge invariance means, it means the equations that govern electromagnetism are invariant of the gauge, up to the gauge. Yes, sure. But they, they don't mean that the actual solutions that you get are completely independent of the gauge. And this is one of the things that people have real trouble with in terms of thinking that you have a point source that emits three-dimensional radiation that's in, absorbed somewhere, somehow, click, as a straight line thing. Why? Because the absorber has, a, has imposed a gauge on the thing as well. So the proper gauge here is neither Coulomb nor radiation gauge. It's closer to radiation gauge, of course, if the two things are far apart. The, the proper gauge here is one that has an envelope, like a cigar shape, which is quite complicated, or to, at least not, not, not ridiculously complicated, but that's where the quantization comes from. So, and the quantization has to come from somewhere. And the quantization comes from the five components which are not present in Maxwell's equations. And those are the spin and the quadrivector. And the quadrivector is the thing eventually that gives rise to um, the um, um, SU2 of spin. So, so in, in my theory, I mean, this theory is something I made up, right? So, um, so but I think we need something that, that goes beyond, I think we need something that goes beyond Hamiltonian and Lagrangian field theory. But you, but you, only, yeah. you yeah. described up to now only electromagnetism, isn't it? Yes. You, with your degrees of freedom, you describe electromagnetism. Yes. Yes. I have a model where I can describe electromagnetism with three degrees of freedom, just with SO2 matrices. It's much simpler, yes. with a very simple Lagrangian. Yes, you're right. I mean, you can describe electromagnetism up to up to an extent with other means as well. It's well known. What I'm saying is you need to go beyond that because we need to describe not just Maxwell's electromagnetism for we need to describe quantization. We need to describe um Yes, again uh, quantization by topological quantization. Yes. Not just yes. topologically quantized. In this model, because rotations okay. you can you can have rotations in three dimensional space without problems. You can map S three on R three and you get a, a, a charge. I think I think what you need to do is to map the two dimensional stuff has to work, the three dimensional stuff has to work, and the four dimensional stuff has to work. All of it. So, um, sure, but and, a, and, a, 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 a charge which is not moving. You don't need four dimensions. You need only space. You only need potential. Pardon? If it's not, you just need potential. You don't. You don't even need charge. You have two. You can have two two static charges. You you fix them, and then you can calculate the energy between them. You get you get the force. Yeah. Everything. Let's use let's you use potential. Static. You just you need field. The center of these particles, and you can calculate it. You get yeah, you're right. Flow. Yeah, I can calculate it too. Just use potentials. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, you can calculate a lot at different levels. Um, question is, if you want to take things further, what do you need to do? Yeah. yeah. But we should, yeah. It depends. Yeah. Oh, but my rule is to keep everything as simple as possible. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, yeah.
That's the point. But not too simple. <laughs> it's got to be just, it's, the, thing, the thing is, there is only one proper theory solution to Hilbert's sixth problem. Uh, and the proof is very simple. Uh, imagine there are two solutions to exactly how the universe works in every respect. Yeah. Then all you, if these things differ in no respect whatsoever, then they are anyway the same theory, so you have only one. If, on the other hand, they differ in any respect whatsoever, one merely needs to do an experiment to see which one is the correct one, and then you again have only one. The trouble is, we're not quite at that theory yet. Yes. <laughs> Okay. The problem is that there are maybe many, many which are equivalent. Yes, yeah, so that, that I think that's the, the big problem. Yes, that that, that, so that we have this standard model Lagrangian, which which is kind of epicyclic, didn't work. So they added new new, new terms. Uh, and, and, and so maybe this is some some the Taylor series series of some deeper models. So the question is where to find for this deeper model, which is effectively described with this standard model Lagrangian. Yes, so. So I think this is what, what, what we should look for. So that, that there may be different models. So that there is some, some model like Ranjan, but also some some deeper model for which this this is some kind of Taylor Taylor series. Yeah. It could be. Okay. Yeah, like uh, apologize slowly. I go. Uh, sure, sure. Goodbye, John, for discussion. Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, nice, nice. It's great, great fun talking to you guys. Nice, thanks. You take care. Thanks for organizing everything, Eric. I don't know if it was just you, thanks. but anybody else. Yeah, so it was, it was a pleasure, yes. Right, thanks. Take care. Thank you, Jarek. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. And uh, John, uh, I'm putting an email into the particle um, group list regarding the electric current. Please answer it, okay? Thank you. I, I, look. I'm not going to because there are lots. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.